This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Into the Light by Anna Carvin. Narrated by Todd McLaren and Gillian Macy. Chapter 1 Tarak I am selfish. I've left my command and stolen time to be with my mate. My warship circles Earth, and I'm here on the surface of this light-drenched planet amongst the humans. There was a time when I never would have conceived of such a thing. How quickly things change. I watch Abby as she emerges from the ocean. The water sluices off her body, her smooth brown skin glistening in the sunlight. Since returning to Earth, she's been enjoying the sunshine. Unlike Cordolians, humans thrive in light and warmth. I prefer the cold and darkness, but I tolerate the sun because it makes her happy. She smiles at me as she walks across the sand. She's wearing a garment called a bikini, which I rather like. Humans are quite inventive with their fashions. I have no complaints about that. This so-called garment consists of three tiny triangular strips of fabric, which cover her breasts and her sex. Not much is left to the imagination, which suits me just fine. As she approaches... She places a hand on the rounded swell of her belly, beaming at me. Day by day, the life inside her is growing. Her smile becomes a frown as she reaches me. I feel like a whale, she complains, glancing down at her body. I watch her through my dark-tinted lenses. A whale? There are many things I am yet to understand about this planet. A giant sea creature, she shrugs. It's a figure of speech. That's how I feel right now. Giant, cumbersome, ungainly, blimp-like. I stare at her, not entirely understanding what she's babbling on about. She's beautiful, and she tempts me. Come here. I growl, taking her hand and pulling her towards me. I'm sitting in a chair in the shade, out of the harsh sunlight. She falls backward into my lap with a laugh, and I caress her belly as she curls up against me. Tiny movements transmit to the tips of my fingers, and for a while I am quiet, stunned into silence. That's my child. Our child. Part of me is still in disbelief at how this has happened. I slide my hands down over her thighs, which are slick with moisture from the sea. Her skin is smooth and warm, her thighs fuller now than they were before she became pregnant. She smells of salt and sunshine, and her long hair clings to her neck and back. You should come in the water, she murmurs, slipping her hand underneath my shirt. She traces the bare skin of my stomach, looking up at me with a sly expression on her face. Your cursed sun is too bright, I grumble. My skin will burn. <laughs> Sometimes I forget how delicate you Cordolians are, she laughs, her voice laced with irony. Poor baby. I snort to the ridiculousness of her statement. Delicate? I raise an eyebrow, keeping a straight face, even though I'm amused. Only you would dare call me delicate, my love. With their soft skin and limited strength, humans are amongst the most fragile creatures in the universe— how they have managed to cling to life in this remote corner of the nine galaxies is beyond me. But although my female is fragile, she survives with such tenacity. She has proven herself to be stronger than I'd ever imagined. What she lacks in physical strength, 
she makes up for in spirit. It rests on me to be her shield. And that is something I can do very well. Someone has to keep you grounded, she says, as I curve my hands around her ass, enjoying her warmth. Otherwise, who will keep you from terrorizing the universe? I haven't terrorized anyone, I protest mildly. At least, not for some time. I move my hands so that my fingers are wedged between her warm thighs. She's barely clothed, and I'm fully dressed, wearing the garments she has bought for me. They're made of a soft, light fabric, suited to the climate of Earth. The shirt is blue, and the trousers are a pale color, similar to the sand on the beach. I still do not understand how she convinced me to wear these unsuitable colors. Apparently, I should try and blend in with the natives. She seems to think I scare them. Humans. They overreact to everything. As my erection presses against her, she makes a low, throaty sound. We have time, I say running my hand along the inside of her thighs, tracing my fingers over her pussy, feeling her through the damp fabric of her tiny garment. A soft gasp escapes her. Not here, she protests, her voice laced with sweet tension. She's as aroused as I am. We might have an audience. What makes you think that, my love? I thought I saw something flash up on the seawall. What? My irritation rises. Humans have a serious problem with minding their own business. I will go and check, I say darkly, looking up towards the fortified wall that surrounds the island. Even with my dark glasses, the glare of the sun is impossibly bright, blurring my vision. If those infernal paparazzi are sneaking around trying to get a glimpse of me and my mate, I will deal with them. They are worse than a pack of rabid Borchek. Abby puts a placating hand on my chest. Don't, Tarak. Just relax. She shifts so that she's straddling me, her pregnant belly pressed gently against me. I rest my hands on her waist as she leans in to kiss me, her tongue darting between my lips. She tastes of the sea with a hint of sweetness. You're on holidays now, so just enjoy yourself. I don't want you to go hurting anybody without reason, even if they're a pain in the ass. I do not understand these holidays you speak of, I reply. They are another strange human custom. Before meeting Abby and arriving on Earth, the concept of extended periods of leisure time hadn't occurred to me. The military was my life. I existed for no other purpose. But now that I am able to step away from my responsibilities, I find I'd rather spend time with her. My five commanders are experienced enough to handle business without me. I should know. I trained them. For the remainder of her pregnancy, I'm not going anywhere. Even an intergalactic war would not drag me from her side. As I mentioned before, I'm selfish. But I don't consider this a holiday at all. I'm here to protect what is mine, even if it's only from pathetic humans who want to know every single little detail about our lives. I don't understand their obsession with us. Humans have to be one of the most interfering, invasive species I've ever encountered. I was under the impression that this part of Nova Terra was supposed to be private, I mutter, glancing back up at the seawall. The thought of another laying eyes on my barely-clothed mate incenses me. 
It's about as private as you can get on Earth these days, Abby replies, a wry look crossing her face. We humans have a cultural obsession with gossip, and Cordolians are supposed to be the new celebrities. I can only tolerate so much of this nonsense, Amina. I know. But your way of dealing with things might be a bit too extreme. We have laws for dealing with this kind of thing if it gets out of hand. Hmm. I don't bother to argue, but I'm skeptical. I won't be going out of my way to abide by human laws. Abby eyes me warily. She knows me well enough by now. I study her face. There's a faint smattering of tiny brown spots across her nose and cheeks. Her eyes appear more green than brown in the shade, and her pink lips are invitingly moist. My hard-on has become almost painful. She lets out a shuddering sigh as a flush spreads across her cheeks. Woman, you can't tempt me like this and then deny me in the same breath, I grate. She moves her hips, rocking backwards. I curve my hands over her belly, feeling the tiny movements of the precious life inside her. Then we should get out of here, she whispers. Sorry, I didn't mean to. It's just that I get turned on so damn easily these days. It must be the effect of all these pregnancy hormones. A slow smile curves my lips. I have no complaints about that. When she's like this, my irritation and aggression evaporate in an instant. You would apologize for such a thing? Don't be ridiculous. The thought of her being in a constant state of near arousal pleases me immensely. Of course you would say that. She rolls her eyes. Are you trying to take advantage of my vulnerable state, General? Yes. You're terrible, she says. But she's smiling. It's the truth. If you have needs, I will respond as I see fit. It's not considered taking advantage if the outcome is mutually beneficial, is it? I caress her belly, tracing over her warm, silken flesh. Not now, though. We're in public, she chides half-heartedly. Her taut nipples are clearly visible through her wet bikini top, another sign of her arousal. Pregnancy has made her breasts rounder and fuller, her nipples becoming enlarged and prominent. I want to take them in my mouth. I want to untie the strings that hold her flimsy garment together and appreciate her naked body in all its glory. This is becoming unbearable. If you do not like it here, then we shall go. Yes. Let's do that, she gasps. She reluctantly untangles herself from me, and I stare at her as she steps across the sand, bending to pick up a light green garment that she wraps around herself, belting it at the waist. She runs her fingers through her hair, shaking it out. The damp strands glisten in the bright sunlight. She is glorious. She doesn't seem to understand that when she's like this, I have very little self-control. The thought of a creature like her wanting me fills me with a deep satisfaction. For all her smart talk and sass, she's still innocent and pure. And now that we've arrived on Earth, I will do everything in my power to ensure the chaos of the universe does not intrude on our lives. I will fight battles. I will kill, and I will start a war if that is what it takes. Leaving the Cordolian Empire has not changed one simple fact. I protect what is mine. 
as she picks up her things, I bend and retrieve a smooth white stone from the sand. It fits nicely in my palm. I look up at the seawall and wait. The gentle rush of the waves is all I hear. The seawall appears deserted. Abby calls my name. I ignore her just for a moment. There. I spot a flash of light, followed by a whisper of movement. I throw the stone. It hurtles toward the spot where I caught the flicker of movement. It probably won't hit whoever is up there, but they can consider themselves warned. Irritating pests. They are fortunate my mate is more tolerant than I. Tarak! Abby shakes her head, gently chastising me. But there's a glimmer of amusement in her eyes. You just can't help yourself, can you? I hold out my hand, and she takes it, her tiny fingers entwining with mine. When it comes to you, there are many things I can't help, my Amina. The look she gives me is both indulgent and filled with desire. For a Cordolian, you say some surprisingly sweet things sometimes. I hide my hunger for her behind a smile, the one I reserve only for her. Let's go home. I lead her up the narrow steps that jut out from the stone wall the hot sun burning through the thin material of my shirt as we ascend. Luckily for me, this island is small, and we do not have far to travel. A driverless vehicle waits for us at the top, courtesy of the so-called Earth Federation. It's basic in design, because human technology is simple and unrefined. I long to bring our Cordolian machines to Earth. But for now, it will have to suffice. Adapting to life on Earth and suppressing my natural instincts is proving to be difficult. But for her sake, I must try. Abby I open my eyes, momentarily confused as a faint chiming sound reaches my ears. I yawn and stretch out, the bedsheets tangled around my legs. My link band is going off. With a groan, I sit up. Tarak's side of the bed is empty. Delicious memories come back to me. Oh, yeah. After the beach, we came home and had sex. Who knew pregnant sex could be so fucking good? Afterwards, we had a long, cool shower together, along with more sex. Big Bad's definitely taking advantage of my currently constantly horny state. I don't know if it's his presence or my raging hormones, but as each day passes, my body becomes increasingly sensitive. I slip out of the bed and rush around the bedroom in my underwear, looking for something to wear. Damn, Tarak, making me late for my appointment. Quiet time on the beach quickly became sexy time in the bedroom. Can't I walk around in a bikini without him trying to get into it? And with all these pregnancy hormones raging about, I'm no better. Aside from the rushing because I'm late thing, I'm all tingly and glowing and generally feeling good about myself. It's such a contrast to this morning when I was feeling grumpy and bloated and unsexy. Not anymore. I toss aside a simple black stretchy dress because it doesn't fit me anymore. Pants are out of the question. Most of my tops have become uncomfortably tight. My hair is wet from the shower, and the bra I'm wearing is a soft, frumpy maternity bra. I haven't had the chance to wear any of my sexy underwear since returning to Earth. That will have to wait until after my little monster is born. 
I can't wait to meet her. I know, sweetie, I say, softly rubbing my belly as she kicks. All this lumbering about is annoying, huh? Especially when we're running late. I have a habit of talking to her. She responds with little fluttering movements, as if she knows what I'm thinking. She doesn't yet have a name, but she definitely has a personality. As I rummage around in the closet, a pair of large, warm hands drops onto my shoulders. A surprised yelp escapes me. Tarak pulls me against him, bringing his arms around me, dropping his nose into my hair. Damn, Cordolian. Despite his size, he's silent on his feet, like a big stalking cat. He inhales deeply, before bringing his lips to my ear. What is troubling you, female? You are flustered again. I'll be late for my doctor's appointment, I grumble, tossing aside a rumpled green set of biologist's scrubs. I don't even know why those are here. But I can't find anything to wear. Wait, he murmurs, before disappearing. I'm too preoccupied to be bothered about whatever he's up to. I pick up a rumpled pair of stretchy gray house pants, eyeing them with distaste. I can't go out in those. My link band chimes softly. I grab it from the bedside table and slip it on my wrist. Time to destination, fifteen minutes and twenty-nine seconds. Leave now to ensure punctual arrival, it blurts, in an eerily lifelike female voice. Shit, I growl. I can't believe I'm seriously considering wearing those disgraceful house pants. The only good thing about them is that they're super comfortable, because they're made from real cotton, which is a rarity in this day and age of synthetic everything. Somehow, the clothes made from replicant fibers never feel quite as good. There's nothing quite like the original. As I bend awkwardly, trying to tug the pants on, Tarak reappears. His dark Cordolian robes are draped loosely across his shoulders. They're open at the front, and of course, he's completely naked underneath. He's looking mightily pleased with himself, too. He always gets like this after we have sex. Damn smug, cocky alien, walking around as if he owns the entire universe. Wait, he does that anyway. It comes with the territory, I guess. You can't turn a lion into a pussycat. You're not wearing those, he states, holding out a dark blue garment. I won't have my mate going out looking like a disheveled card at gutter sweeper. Uh, thanks, I guess? I don't know whether to be flattered or offended. So you think I look like a gutter sweeper now? Tarek stares at me with a deadpan expression. Of course not. It is a figure of speech, as you humans say. How could I ever consider you to be anything but beautiful? He motions to me to turn around. Put this on. He unfolds the garment. I hold out my arms, and he pulls it over my outstretched arms. The material is impossibly soft and luxurious. It smells nice, too. The scent is something I can't put a finger on. It's exotic and mysterious, hinting at far-off worlds. The closest thing I can compare it to is sandalwood, mixed with a hint of vanilla. Where did you get this? I ask suspiciously. I haven't seen it before. Baronian pirate traders, he shrugs. News of our break from the Empire has traveled fast throughout the Nine Galaxies. They have opened an underground trade route to Earth. Oh. I still have no idea when he found the time to do some off-planet shopping. Tarak moves in front of me, reverently arranging the folds of this robe-like garment over my swollen belly. 
It's similar to the typical Cordolian robes I'm used to, but a bit more fitted, with a sash that ties around the waist, a bit like a wrap dress. The fabric is a deep blue color, and it's embroidered with thousands of tiny stars. The pattern is impossibly intricate, and it makes the garment shimmer. The waist sash is wide and stretchy, a contrasting deep purple. Tarak fastens it above my waist, caressing my stomach. This is a kashkan, usually worn by Cordolian nobles. I love it, I murmur. The kashkan falls to about mid-calf. It's light and breezy and perfectly comfortable. Now this is a kashkan befitting of my mate, he says proudly reminding me that he is a Cordolian general, after all. He's haughty and arrogant most of the time, but he can be unpredictably sweet. He keeps me on my toes, in a good way. My link band beeps insistently, dragging me out of this surreal moment. I'm going to be late, I gasp, a sense of panic rippling through me. You know, Ziara is happy to care for you during this pregnancy, Tarek reminds me. There's a disapproving edge to his voice. I shake my head. We've already talked about this, Tarak. I'm grateful she's been able to come down to give me checkups, but she's needed on silence more than I need her here. Besides, I've been getting good antenatal care at the hospital, so don't worry. Everything's fine. I'm perfectly healthy, the baby's perfectly healthy, and I don't need someone watching over me 24-7. Tarak frowns. As soon as Ziara's replacement arrives from the fleet station, I'm bringing her to Earth. Before she joined the military, she was a medic who dealt with... female concerns. She will know how to manage a Cordolian birth. I appreciate that, but might I remind you that it's also a human birth? I rest a hand on my belly as the little monster kicks again, as if protesting against our disagreement. If we're genetically compatible enough that we can have offspring together, then I don't see how things could be so different when it comes to giving birth. Tarek gives me an appraising look. You seem quite certain of that. I point a mocking finger at myself. Biologist, remember? Even if my major was plants, I have a general idea of how this stuff works. The specialist told me Little Monster has the same number of chromosomes as us, 46. That means the human Cordolian thing is totally legit from a biological perspective. Seeing his expression, I relent. Although, it would be good to have Ziara around so we can compare notes. Hmm. Tarek's eyes narrow as he scrutinizes me, digesting my words. Finally, he speaks. Little monster? His ears twitch. I shrug. You're the big bad, so for now, she's little monster. We obviously haven't had a chance to have the name talk yet. Obviously not. He's been getting dressed as I've been talking, slipping on a pair of black trousers beneath his dark robes and fastening the sash at his waist. His outfit is so typically Cordolian. It's dark and austere and totally suited to him. He rarely wears anything but black and with his gray-silver complexion and almost white hair, the color suits him just fine. You're coming? I ask, a little surprised. The last few times I've gone to the hospital, I've gone on my own, or been accompanied by Sira, Zal's mate. Tarak has been in high Earth orbit on the warship Silence, sorting out various problems of the Cordolian kind. It's been a busy past few months for him. First, there was an attack by a large Imperial Cordolian warship, accompanied by threats to completely annihilate Earth. 
Then there was some trouble with incursions by Ifkin slavers, followed by an accident involving a very large fleet station and an asteroid storm. All that has happened, on top of Tarak having to deal with his new number one pet hate, human politics. For now, things seem to be peaceful. But Tarak remains ever wary, and he's been beefing up security around our planet in a big way, expecting another attack. Of course I'm coming, Tarak rumbles, his tone leaving no room for argument. I wish to know every detail about your health and the health of our child. Besides, I do not entirely trust these human medics. I give him a long, hard stare. Fine, but let me do the talking. He raises an eyebrow. They're my people, I insist. My link band chimes again. Come on, we have to go. He scowls, but follows me downstairs. We pass through the house in silence. Downstairs, the blinds are closed, and it's dark and quiet. The house is a standard diplomatic residence, approved for our use by the Federation, the governing body that represents all independent states on Earth. At present, it's occupied by myself, Tarak, Zal, and a bunch of Cordolian soldiers. Annoyingly, they have this habit of never turning the lights on, because they can all see in the dark. I turn a corner, not bothering to activate the lights as I hurry down the corridor. There's no point, because we'll be out the door in a second. Tarak puts his hands on my waist, halting me. Careful, he says softly. Something whirs past at my feet. The familiar hum of a cleaning bot reaches my ears. One more step, and I would have tripped on the damn thing. I glance back at him appreciatively as we exit out the front door and enter a parked car. The driverless vehicle starts up, recognizing my bioprint. Thankfully, there aren't any journalists lurking around right now. Welcome, Abigail Kendricks, an unidentified non-human. Please state your destination. The car's disembodied voice fills the cabin as we slide into the back seat. Ishihara Hospital, I say, as the car pulls away from the curb. We glide down mostly empty streets, passing the occasional car or pedestrian. The diplomatic zone consists of rows and rows of standard houses, set amongst impossibly clean and lifeless streets. It's where diplomats from all over the universe reside when they come to Earth. Of course, the Federation had to provide the Cordolians with a residence on Earth. What were they going to do? Book them into a hotel while negotiations took place? I suppress a smile as an image of Tarak and his first division taking over the presidential suite at Aquinas Towers pops into my head. That probably wouldn't go down too well, with them or the well-heeled human guests. These Cordolians aren't exactly looking for lavish breakfast buffets, spa baths, and champagne. But despite all my trepidation about the pitfalls of a Cordolian trying to adapt to Earth life, Tarak has shown incredible restraint since arriving on Nova Terra. He surprised me. He's scared off a few reporters, but he hasn't seriously hurt anyone yet. I think the Cordolians have surprised the general public as well. That's thanks to Zal, who has made an effort to appear pleasant, witty, and charming, at least most of the time. In a short period of time, he's turned into a media darling. The prince is no pushover, but he's a little more tactful than Tarak. I can understand now why Tarak wanted him to be the Cordolian's representative on Earth. As we pull up to the hospital, Tarak is staring out the window, his expression inscrutable behind his dark glasses. What is it? I ask quietly as we get out of the car. I dislike these driverless vehicles, he grumbles. 
there's too much potential for error and sabotage. Relax, General, I reassure him. Bot cars have a near-perfect safety record. What's the worst that could happen? All machines can be dangerous in the wrong hands. Systems can be manipulated, he says darkly. Trust me, I know. Tarak motions for me to walk in front of him as we cross the plaza, heading for the non-human specialties wing. Oh, stop being such a military geek and pessimist. Just because it isn't Cordolian tech doesn't mean it's not trustworthy. I glance around as we pass through a wide-open space with a fountain in the middle, noticing people staring at us. They can't help it. The diplomatic zone of Novaterra is full of aliens, but it's not every day that you see a Cordolian walking around. Tarek stands out here as much as I did on Kithia. There's no toning down his striking appearance. His hard stare diverts a few strange looks as we head down a long-covered walkway. The passage is lined with clumps of green bamboo that sway gently in the balmy afternoon breeze. The walkway transitions to a sleek, glass-enclosed area, leading to a suite of consulting rooms. An assist bot rolls towards us. It's an upright black machine with an interactive face, a flat screen displaying some useless data. As we approach it, it scans us with its digital eye, a camera-like device with motion and face sensors. Welcome, patient Kendricks. You are late by five minutes and thirty-three seconds. Its disembodied voice echoes through the sterile space. However, Dr. Asher has indicated that she will still see you. Follow this way, please. The bot swivels around, but halts as it scans Tarak. Unidentified non-human, state your name and purpose. Tarak looks at the bot disdainfully. I am expected to respond to this... thing? He's with me, I tell the bot. He's accompanying me to my appointment. The individual's bioprint is unregistered. Please present to admissions for registration of genetic data. Tarek's jaw is clenched tight, and one of his pointed ears twitches ever so slightly. We're already late, I growl at the bot in annoyance. The problem with these mass-produced, standard processing bots is that they're simple in their programming, and that makes them extremely rigid. I don't really know how to explain to it that this big Cordolian at my side is my mate and the father of my child. I don't think my answer would compute. Ignoring the bot, I grab Tarek's hand. Come on, let's go. I start off down the corridor, walking quickly. The bot zooms after us, blurting out instructions. Please present to admissions for registration. It drones on repetitively, trying to navigate past Tarak. This is an example of human-made artificial intelligence? His voice is full of scorn. He walks in front of it, intentionally blocking it from passing. Is this thing really necessary? I sigh. We humans like our structure and routine. And somehow, that includes silly robots. Just ignore it. It isn't going to do anything to us. Hmm. Tarak glares at the thing with a face like thunder. But to my relief, he resists the temptation to put it out of its misery. We cross over into a light-filled waiting room, where relaxing instrumental music plays in the background, and patients sit on ergonomic sofas. The high windows offer a view of the ocean beyond the seawall. It's a serene, relaxing space, but for some reason, it gives me the creeps. Everything to do with the Federation is like this, clean, efficient, and soulless. 
the assist bot parks itself beside us as we sit down, continuing to blurt out its repetitive message. A few heads turn in our direction. Despite the uniformity of it all, this isn't an ordinary clinic. It's the part of the hospital that deals with aliens, or non-humans, as is the supposedly politically correct way to refer to them on Earth. Because I'm apparently the first human to ever have a hybrid pregnancy, the obstetrics doctor wanted some specialized input. That's why I've been referred here, where they have experts in all kinds of non-human medicine. Various aliens are seated in the waiting room. Alongside us is a blue guy with wide-set eyes and dappled skin. He keeps glancing nervously at Tarak, as if he's worried the Cordolian might do something. Beside him are a couple with glistening yellow scales and ridged foreheads. They have what appears to be gills in their cheeks. They're also stealing glances at Tarak. Is everyone in this room freaked out by the presence of my Cordolian? Tarak is sitting with his arms crossed, seemingly oblivious to all the attention. The assist bot has parked itself beside us, settling into a rhythm of monotonous, repetitive requests. It's almost as if it's become tired, resigned to blurting out a request every five minutes or so. Abruptly, its message changes. The doctor will see you now, patient Kendricks. Please follow. Unidentified non-human, present to admissions for registration of genetic data. Silence, machine. I am not sharing my genetic material. Tarak gives me a sidelong glance. Anyhow, humans would not be able to process my data. Don't I know it, I say dryly. We head off towards the consulting rooms as the bot circles us, struggling to process Tarak's presence. For the uninitiated, we must be an odd sight. Me, an ordinary-looking pregnant human, dressed in a lavish cash can, and Tarak, the severe Cordolian general who towers over me. But with him by my side... I feel content. I feel as if there's nothing in the universe that can hurt us. The bot brings us to a plain white door that slides open, revealing a brightly lit clinical room. It starts with its infuriating repetition again, but then gets cut off mid-sentence. Oh, shut up, T1, a voice snaps. My attention is drawn to a woman sitting at a shiny white desk. She puts down a device that looks like a remote control, and the bot rolls into the corner, going silent. She stands to greet us. You must be Abby, and, uh... General Acadian, Tarak finishes before I can interrupt. She holds out her hand, but Tarak ignores it as he takes his seat, not bothering to remove his sunglasses. I glare at him, but he ignores me. He's back to his usual gruff, prickly, Cordolian self. Keeping her cool, she gestures towards me. Please, have a seat. My name is Dr. Asher, but you can call me Lorelei. I specialize in non-human medicine, which is why you've been referred to me. As I settle into the chair, Tarek places a possessive hand on my thigh, sending a clear signal to the doctor. Ever since we set foot in the outpatient department, he's been acting super growly. Erg, males. Lorelei's consulting room feels more like a sleek corporate office than a doctor's room. Abstract artwork and tasteful muted colors graces the walls, and her desk is decorated with small sculptural statues made from shiny chrome. There's a hollow screen unit and a small calm device, but no medical equipment. The window behind her looks out onto a grove of verdant bamboo. Beside me, Tarak is silent. Lorelei brings up my file on her hollow screen. The data blurs past, some of it too quick for me to catch, 
but I see the word hybrid flash up in bold red lettering. This is the first time we've met, but I've discussed your case with my colleagues. I must say, your condition is rather unique. She speaks in universal rather than English. Everyone on Novaterra speaks universal. As one of the New World settlements, Novaterra has adopted universal as its official language. Unlike many other regions on Earth, they're used to aliens here. I did not realize pregnancy was supposed to be such a unique condition, Tarak says softly, but there's no mistaking the dangerous edge to his voice. What exactly would your role in my mate's care be, medic? Sweet Tarak, getting straight and to the point. Even though he agreed to let me do all the talking, he can't help himself. That's the thing about Cordolian generals. They have an obsessive need to be in control all the time. At least that's been my experience. I'm a non-human specialist, but I also have a background in obstetrics, Lorelei replies smoothly. If she's shaken, she sure as hell doesn't show it. Her perfect features, with her perfect makeup, remain perfectly composed. Because the baby is a hybrid, we will need to monitor Abby closely throughout the remainder of her pregnancy. We have limited data on human-non-human -human reproduction, so I will be looking closely for anything that might harm the mother or the unborn fetus. We need to continue to screen for a range of complications, such as fetal macrosomia, maternal anemia, placenta previa, and autoimmune reactions. So far, initial tests have been fine, but as we get closer to the delivery date, we need to ensure nothing unexpected is going to happen. Yet, you say you have limited data on such things. The data is limited, but we have scientific theory to draw on. And what scientific data could you possibly have collected on my race, medic? There's a dark undercurrent to Tarak's voice. Are you saying you are an expert on Cordolians, human? To her credit, the doctor remains unmoved. I'll admit that what we know about your species is limited, but I would see this as an opportunity to expand our knowledge. If our people are going to have a long-lasting alliance, wouldn't this be a good place to start? You would presume to try and become an expert on my kind? Tarak turns to me, his voice scornful. You trust this medic, Abby? What she's saying sounds reasonable, I say tersely. Tarak is being super abrupt. I sense he doesn't trust Lorelai one bit. We could set up a link with Ciara. If she consults on the Cordolian side of things, I'm sure we'll have all bases covered. And anyway, I add, looking at both Tarak and Lorelai in turn, it's not as if I have some rare incurable disease. I'm pregnant, that's all. That can't happen unless our genes are entirely compatible. So, the biology is okay. I think we just need to sit back and let nature do its thing. That's a sensible way of looking at it, Abby. For the first time, Lorelai smiles, her carefully painted red lips contrasting with pearl-white teeth. But the smile doesn't reach her eyes. A niggling feeling of unease creeps into my mind. It's probably just my imagination, but there is something a bit too perfect about her. Lorelai keys something on her data pad and turns her hollow screen so it's facing me. Now, I just need to record your consent before we go over your medical history. Here are the forms. She gestures towards the screen. They're just standard medical forms. If you could verbalize your consent and submit a retinal scan, we'll carry on. Hang on. That niggling feeling grows, and my inner sense of suspicion flares to life. 
What forms are these? Oh, they're just generic treatment and admission forms, Lorelai says. All of our patients sign them. It's nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about? My ass. My Aunt Kenna's voice echoes in the back of my mind. Always read the small print, Abby girl. Don't ever trust the bastards. My dear aunt is old school. She's not a big fan of technology. Tarak leans in, scanning the information presented to us. He moves his chair closer to me, ignoring the doctor. What is the meaning of this, Amina? More human bureaucratic nonsense? Hang on. I scan through the legalese, trying to interpret it. Even though he speaks perfect universal, this will all probably go over Tarak's head. He's the blunt and straightforward type. And Earth legal speak is another language unto itself. We humans have a talent for making things unnecessarily complicated. Tarak thinks it's ridiculous that humans place so much importance in legal documents. One line in particular stands out. I scroll down and freeze the text. What does this mean exactly? It reads, For research and training purposes, all medical data and retrieved genetic material will be de-identified and become the property of Syncorp Universal. For the first time, Lorelei looks uncomfortable. Uh, that's just a standard clause. All consent forms have it. Syncorp? I raise an eyebrow, trying to appear composed. But deep down, the name Syncorp fills me with dread. The huge biotech conglomerate is the company my father used to work for. They all said my father's death was an accident. But to this day, Aunt Kenna and I have our suspicions. He was killed shortly after blowing the whistle on some unethical practices, concerned that they'd gone too far with their experiments on humans. There is no way in hell I'm trusting anything owned by Syncorp. I had no idea this place was run by them. An uncomfortable feeling courses through me. I don't like the fact that they've already gotten a hold of some of my medical information. This is a Syncorp-owned hospital. Lorelei glances at her link band impatiently. We really need to get a move on. Because you were late, we're running out of time. Tarak is scrutinizing the text. I do not like this. I'm starting to think his paranoia isn't so misplaced. Damn, just when I was extolling the virtues of human medicine and telling him how reasonable we humans are, they had to go and screw it up with a fine print. Silently, I curse myself for being naive. I'm not too sure about this, I say, glancing at Tarak. That clause is quite open to interpretation, and there's only so much you can de-identify in hybrid pregnancy. Everyone who comes across that data is going to know who it belongs to. It's a standard clause. Lorelai taps a painted finger on the desk impatiently. Unfortunately, if you don't sign the consent, we can't proceed with your medical care. And as far as I know, we are the only non-human specialist center equipped to deal with a human-non-human hybrid pregnancy. Her tone has changed completely, becoming hard. I stare at her in disbelief. Is she trying to blackmail me right now? You can't be freaking serious, lady. What's so important about my genetic material that they're so desperate to hold on to that information? Alarm bells are going off in my head. Something doesn't feel right. Beside me, Tarak has gone still. I can almost feel the menace radiating from him. You presume too much, human. I will not deal with a service that is not transparent. 
Abby needs antenatal care, Lorelai argues. You're not going to get that anywhere else. Sensing Tarak's mood, I shake my head slowly. Mr. Grumpy Pants has been disgruntled ever since we set foot in the hospital complex. The good doctor is not going to win an argument with my Cordolian general. She just isn't. Not in a million years. I know him too well. With my eyes, I try to implore her to shut the fuck up. As much as I hate to admit I was wrong, I'm with Tarak on this one. And as much as I want to do the right thing, as much as I want my pregnancy to feel like a normal human pregnancy, I don't like hidden clauses, and I don't like shady corporations. Especially when it's Syncorp that's behind all this. When I was up in space, trying to survive the clutches of psychopathic Cordolians, Earth seemed like a freaking paradise. Now that I'm back down here... I'm starting to remember that my own people can be just as bad, minus the fangs and freaky technology. Humans can be awesome, but they can also be assholes. Just like every other damn species in the universe. The doctor tries a different angle. Look, she says, sounding apologetic as she spreads her hands wide. I'm trying to help you here, but if you want to be treated at this hospital, you need to follow protocol. Enough. Tarek stands, holding out a hand to me. I see no value in continuing with this nonsense. Come, Amina. We are leaving. I will order Ziara to Earth, and she will monitor your condition. I'd advise you to reconsider, General Acadian— Lorelai stands, offering a cold attempt at a placating smile. It's a mirthless grin, stretching her flawless face into a perfect mask. Tarak looks at her threateningly, but doesn't bother with a reply. Come, Abby, let us go. I remain in my seat for a moment, allowing the uncomfortable silence to stretch between us. I study the doctor taking in her structured white dress, which looks like something out of a high fashion show, and her perfectly made-up face. She's an ice queen, cold and unrelenting, and not at all what I would have expected a doctor to be like. Tarak stands across from her, his crimson eyes hidden behind those rather fashionable frameless sunglasses. He appears just as cold, his jaw set in a hard line, his lips curved into a slight frown. Despite his scary exterior, I get a warm, fuzzy feeling inside when I look at him, especially when he glowers threateningly on my behalf. All I wanted when I got back to Earth was a little bit of human familiarity. I wanted to be in control and do things the Earth way. But suddenly, it feels as if everyone wants a piece of me. And now, I'm faced with a choice. Tarek's hand is extended expectantly. There's only one outcome he'll accept. The answer is pretty obvious. I look back and forth between them, pouting a little bit. Little monster wriggles inside me, as if trying to comfort me. It's my body, I say quietly, after a drawn-out silence. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be a source of data for anyone, and neither is my baby. I stand, placing my hand in Tarak's palm. His silver-gray hand dwarfs mine, but his fingers are warm as he curls them around my hand. Lorelai manages to look offended. We're not bad people, Abby. Any data we collect is for the advancement of science. Did I mention I've had an irrational fear of science experiments ever since some evil Cordolians tried to turn me into a human guinea pig? I shudder. I'm not going through that again. 
I think I'll take my chances without signing my soul away. Thank you very much. I'm pregnant, and I'm going to have a baby. The only difference is that my little monster is half Cordolian. Nature's taken us this far already. I just have to trust my body, trust the Cordolians, and let nature do the rest. Really, how hard can it be? Chapter 2 Tarak She is not happy. I sit beside her, observing her. The corners of her mouth are turned down, and she stares out of the window, watching the empty streets as we travel back to the diplomatic house. She looks tired. The visit to the hospital has upset her. Inwardly, I curse the human doctor called Asher and her deceptive promises. She reminded me a little of that spineless Cordolian medic called Merkel. She had the same haughty, self-righteous demeanor. I will not entrust the care of my precious mate to such humans. I know ulterior motives when I see them. I will send for Zayara. My soldiers on board Silence can survive without her until the fleet station medics arrive. They are no longer engaged in active combat, and there are several submedics who can attend to non-urgent complaints. I curse myself for not being more vigilant. I should have made arrangements much sooner. But Abby had told me she was fine. She had reassured me she was in good health and would handle things on earth. I curse the Imperial Cordolians and the Infernal Humans for drawing my attention away from my mate, forcing me to spend time attending to my duties on board Silence when I should have been by her side. I feel as if I should say something, but I don't know what to say. Comforting others isn't one of my strengths. So instead, I rest my hand on her thigh. Her shoulders are slumped. A sigh escapes her. The awkward vehicle the humans refer to as a Botkar turns a corner and returns us to our residence. The sun's position in the sky has moved, and the trees surrounding the house throw shadows across the ground. A light breeze carries a hint of salt, tugging at her hair as we walk across the carefully manicured gardens. Compared to what I'm used to, this planet is mild and temperate. Humans have been living in a paradise for millennia without realizing their good fortune. It is why they are soft and complacent. It is why their planet can be so easily threatened. Earth is ripe for the picking. If they truly knew of war and oppression, and had encountered disasters that threatened to drag their civilization to the brink of extinction, they would have defended their home a little better. Now it is my home. My planet. I have found my mate, and I have discovered a reality I never would have thought possible. In this lifetime, I have the opportunity to extend my line. I put an arm around her shoulders and guide her down a linear path that leads to the back. There is a small garden there, surrounded on all sides by green vegetation. Flat paving stones are arranged in the center, and to one side there is some sort of basic seating. I guide her to the seat and sit down, bringing her onto my lap. At first she's reluctant, but eventually she yields to my gentle pressure. She's uncharacteristically silent. I do not understand her. She is human, and humans think differently to us. Small things I consider insignificant end up being of great importance to her. Emotions play a central role in her decision-making. I'm not sure I will ever understand her completely, but I can at least try. I put my hand against her cheek, 
turning her face to make her look at me. Why are you so insistent on having a human medic, my love? I can't see how involving humans would be of particular value. Their medical technology, like everything else human, isn't exactly cutting edge. She leans back into me, staring up at the sky. White fragments of condensed vapor called clouds float by, drifting across the blue background. I've never been one to appreciate aesthetics, but Earth is slowly revealing itself to be a place of rare beauty. Abby turns to look at me. You know, I always thought I'd work on that shitty space station for a few years before coming back to Earth. Never in a million light years could I have imagined you would come crashing into my life. I wait, not sure where she is going with this. Becoming pregnant was something I'd never even had time to consider. But look at me now. It's happened so fast. I open my mouth to speak, but she presses her finger against my lips, silencing me. She's the only being in the entire universe who would dare to do such a thing. Look at you with that scary expression. I haven't finished yet. It's not that I'm unhappy. Quite the opposite. I'm overjoyed, and I can't wait to meet our little one. I guess I'm just a little freaked out, that's all. Maybe going to the hospital for my antenatal care was just me trying to do something normal. Something grounded. Because on Earth, that's what normal human women do when they get pregnant. They visit the obstetrician, and they talk about this stuff with other women. I guess that's what I'd always envisioned for my first pregnancy. She stares at me with her green and brown-flecked eyes, which are wide and clear. She is entirely without guile. There's a part of me that's overwhelmed. There's a little voice in the back of my head that asks me if I'm really ready for all this. It is uncharacteristic of her to be uncertain like this. Her honesty completely disarms me. Admitting to one's weakness is so very un-Cordolian. You are afraid... I bring my arms around her, feeling her warmth through the luxurious fabric of her kashkan. It suits her so well. I am pleased with my choice. Not afraid. I'm excited as hell, but at the same time, the enormity of the situation sometimes gets to me. You shouldn't ever feel afraid when you're with me. As I inhale her unique fragrance... I catch a flicker of movement in the corner of my vision. There's something in the trees. Abby frowns. I know. It's stupid for me to feel this way. I'm just having a moment of self-doubt. It happens to all of us from time to time. She gives me a strange look. At least with humans it does. I'll get over it. She studies me with undisguised fascination, her eyes slightly narrowed. Why, General, are you consoling me right now? She sounds amused. That is her armor, sliding back into place. I do not console, I grumble, and for some reason she laughs. I don't know why she finds my reactions amusing, but at least she is smiling. At the edge of my vision, there's a flash of light, and again I catch a flicker of movement. I take Abby's hands and gently pull her to the side as I stand, peering at the trees. Even when I'm wearing these dark glasses, my daylight vision isn't so good. The sharpness and detail I see at night just isn't there. The light of the infernal sun turns everything hazy. But my hearing is still sharp, 
much sharper than a human's. What is it, Tarek? Abby's soft voice reaches me. I hold up a hand, demanding silence. There is a soft breeze. Leaves flutter. In the distance, some earth creature vocalizes, emitting a strange, high-pitched twittering sound. Then I hear it. A mechanical click. Localizing the sound, I stalk towards it. I jump and pluck something from the air. I open my palm to reveal something small and metallic. A human surveillance machine. Fucking humans. They keep trying to spy on us with these tiny pest-like devices. When we first arrived on Earth, the humans would gather at the front of the house, trying to capture footage of us. More than once I confronted them, but they weren't easy to deter. I still don't understand the reason for their obsession with us. Why can't they just mind their own Cain-cursed business? The device has a tiny blinking red light. There is a dark, flat lens that zooms back and forth, trying to focus. It has small propellers attached to the sides, allowing it to fly. Humans have an insatiable need to know everything. Even useless, insignificant details can be turned into objects of fascination in their easily influenced minds. They have this strange thing called a free press. Apparently, any citizen can collect information and share it with the masses. Abby stands, coming to my side. She looks at the machine in my hand. A drone can, she sighs. It's still recording. How did I allow this insidious device to slip past my guard? I stare at the lens, wishing I could lay a hand on the ones behind it. Cease your monitoring of us, I say softly. This is your first and final warning. Otherwise, I will look for you. And trust me, you do not want me to find you. There is a small metal switch on the side of the device. I flick it off, and the red light disappears. I drop the drone cam into my pocket. My tech engineers will be able to take it apart and analyze it. Perhaps they will be able to localize its source. If they find whoever is responsible, I will be paying them a rather unpleasant visit. Abby looks at me with a resigned expression on her face. I do not like that expression. They'll try to follow us wherever we go, she murmurs whether it's Federation intelligence or the media. We'll always have someone trying to monitor us. It's just the way Earth is. They won't, I assure her. Leave it to me. I will do my utmost to shield her from any threat. It doesn't matter whether the threat is from the vindictive Cordolian Empire and that cursed bitch, Empress Vion, or the idiotic deceptive humans with their spy technology and confounding bureaucratic legal nonsense. A thought occurs to me. My Amina, you seem to be quite alone. Do you not have a clan on Earth? Do you not have a house of your own? By house, I'm referring not to a dwelling, but to a family, a bloodline. She shrugs. I'm an only child, and my parents are gone. She is trying to appear unaffected, but there is sadness in her voice. I curse myself for not thinking of such things earlier. Your parents? Mother died of an illness. Dad was killed in a land flyer accident. Not knowing what to say, I place a hand on her cheek. 
and we share a moment of silence as I look into her complicated eyes. You are isolated amongst your own people, I say eventually. I have friends here and there. I have an aunt I get along with. But I guess you're right. I've become a stranger on my own planet. A slightly pained look crosses her face. Earth is different to how I remember it. Maybe it's just because we're on Nova Terra. But everything feels detached. It doesn't feel like home. Then we shall find a place that feels like home to you. She is busy nurturing our child. She needs to feel secure and comfortable. This strange, sterile island is not where she should give birth. It has simply been a place of convenience while we determine the terms of our alliance with the humans. Do not worry. Soon you will be surrounded by family. We will make our own clan. House Circadian will be a fearsome and reputable family, and you, as the mother of our children, will be at its heart. Don't ever forget how important you are to me. She bites her lower lip, looking up at me, her eyes shimmering. They are brimming with moisture. Have I upset her somehow? I do not understand. You are such a stubborn, infuriating, precious, sweet man, she says quietly. Thank you for tolerating my hormonal moodiness. She wipes something from the corner of one eye. If it's possible, I would like to get off this island. I feel trapped in this place. But I understand if you have political reasons for staying here. You have an alliance to build, after all. Nonsense, I snort. I don't care to appease any human except you. If there is somewhere else you'd rather be, we will go there. Zalikian can handle the human bullshit on our behalf. He has proven himself quite adept at navigating the human political sphere, with assistance from his mate, Sarah. As you said before, I am taking a so-called holiday. From now on, there will be no more interference. I am yours. So tell me, where do you wish to go? I will take you anywhere you desire. The only place I can think of is my Aunt Kenna's house. She lives in the middle of nowhere. She does not have a fixed abode? Again, she laughs softly, a sound I find pleasing. It's a figure of speech. She lives in the middle of the desert. She's a bit eccentric. She hates technology. She doesn't get along so well with ordinary people. And I love her to bits. She sounds like a sensible human. Oh, she's quite switched on. And she'll love you. Abby says that last bit with a slight twist of her nose, telling me she's not entirely being serious. Then let's visit this relation of yours. Now? There's no reason to delay. Don't you have commitments? Military stuff to do? Meetings to attend? I have been known to delegate tasks from time to time. I've set up a comm link with silence, which is circling the Earth in high orbit. My commanders and soldiers are well trained. There is no longer any need for me to be physically present on the warship. It is good timing, because I am also growing tired of existing inside this controlled human enclave. For now, I've accepted their terms, only because that is what has been expected and required for negotiations to advance smoothly. When we arrived on Earth, the humans were understandably suspicious. But since then, a lot has happened, and we have presented them with an offer too good to refuse. In exchange for allowing us to inhabit their planet, we will protect them from external threats. The agreement has been drawn, 
the specifics have been discussed and altered to my satisfaction, and negotiations have all but concluded. Earth is no longer vulnerable. The humans have chosen wisely. I am also tired of living in this ridiculous place, I tell her. And you promised me you would show me your planet. Am I to expect that all of Earth is similar to this? Of course not, Abby replies. The place we're going is very, very different to Nova Terra. We have to fly to the Oceanic Republic. My aunt lives outside a place called Telluria, which is famous for its skyport. Trust me, that place is nothing like Nova Terra. You might actually like it. And they're used to aliens in Telluria. So if we have to go into town, you won't have a problem fitting in. They don't stare as much over there. Hmm. I am still getting used to this planet and its eccentric inhabitants. Humans are complicated creatures. Show me where you wish to go, and I will make arrangements. We will travel the Cordolian Way, in a stealth flyer. I will bring Zyara to Earth to monitor her pregnancy, and I will ensure my mate has everything she needs. Yes, sir. She brightens at my request, her expression turning mischievous. Her green-brown eyes rake over me, making me feel desired in a way no other can. I'll show you another side of Earth, and all the perks that come with it. Her tone is suggestive. I raise an eyebrow, indicating my sudden interest. Will you now? Underneath my dark robes, my erection strains. This is how it is when I'm with her. We can be having a regular conversation, but then the smallest tendril of her scent or a certain look will be all it takes to stir my arousal. She does not realize the effect she has on me. It is always this way. Not that I am bothered in the least, but before I met her, I had never been one to easily lose control. She smiles sweetly, innocently. There are many benefits to living on Earth, Cordolian, especially if you stick with me. Would you like me to explain them to you in more detail? That would be preferable, I growl, as she turns and leads me into the house. Remarkably, her mood is improved. I have learned something today. When she is unhappy, I must ask questions, and I must listen. There is much to be gained by using this approach. She is not an enemy or an imperial subject I can dominate and control through force and intimidation. She is my mate, and I must approach her concerns with care. Of course, I would not admit this to her, but there is much I am yet to learn. Abby a ripple of excitement flutters through me as I throw some random clothes into my travel bag. Finally, three days after we talked about it, we're getting out of this boring, sterile compound where I have spent the last six months of my life being pregnant and slowly going out of my mind. Tarek spent most of that time traveling back and forth between silence and earth, attending to certain responsibilities. It turns out that when you're the commander of an army that has deserted its empire, you're left with a lot of loose ends to tie up. Especially when said empire chases you across the nine galaxies. Despite my protests, he wouldn't let me accompany him. He refuses to let me go into space these days. He's terrified something will happen to me. Ever since we found out I was pregnant, He's been overly protective when he's with me, hovering over me at every opportunity. Silence, he says, is a floating target. 
Whenever he had to leave me, he would pull two of his most elite soldiers away from the sands of North Africa, where they are exterminating those horrible Zargak, and send them to watch over me. Just in case something happened, he always told me. You never know when your enemies will strike next, he said. It's best to be prepared, he declared. So, I spent weeks and weeks being watched by two stoic, muscular Cordolians, who expertly shadowed me as I went about my business. I recognized them as being from the group we had left back on the asteroid mining station, Fortuna Tau. They were super respectful, never once intruding or getting in the way as they watched over me. But they were always there, a silent, intimidating presence, reminding me that life as I know it has irreversibly changed. I'm in bed with the Cordolians now. Correction, I'm in bed with the Cordolian, the one who calls all the shots. And he tells me he wants to settle down and start a family. For a guy who has probably seen and done terrible things in his life, he's being remarkably considerate in his own way. And now he wants to take me to a place where I'll be comfortable for the rest of my pregnancy. For me, that's not sterile, lifeless Nova Terra. The closest thing to home is a remote property on the outskirts of Earth's biggest skyport. Tarax coming with me to stay at the Kendricks' family home. What more could a girl ask for? The general keeps surprising me in weird and wonderful ways. He even refrained from hitting me with an I told you so after our run-in with that creepy doctor at the Ishihara hospital. I should have been a little more suspicious when my obstetrician canceled our appointment and told me I had to see an alien specialist. The whole process has disappointed me a little, but at least the preliminary tests and scans have all been normal. So far, so good. By seeking out human doctors, I was probably just trying to get a little bit of normalcy in my crazy life. But I need to accept that carrying a half-Cordolian little monster and hooking up with a silver-skinned badass called Tarak al Akkadian means our lives together will be anything but normal. When I signed up with the Federation for my stint on Fortuna Tau, all I wanted was to do my time and get back to Earth as soon as possible. My plan was to get a job with one of the big three biotech companies, just like my father before me. Not in my wildest dreams could I have imagined I'd be carted off to some dark, distant planet by a fearsome alien warrior. But here I am, back on Earth in one piece and deliciously knocked up. Screw normal. I'll take this over normal any day of the week. I'll keep my formidable Cordolian warrior, thank you very much. Inside me, my baby moves, fluttering about as if to tell me she approves. Your daddy's going to be such a papa wolf around you, I murmur in my native English, snickering softly. She's not even born yet, and already I'm feeling sorry for her future first date. I gather the rest of my belongings, which consist of nothing more than some basic clothes and toiletries, and a small data pad. I'm traveling light. Most of my material possessions were left on Fortuna Tau, and that place has long since been turned into space dust. Everything has been stuffed into an expandable Ziptech bag, and I'm pretty much ready to go. All I need now are some snacks for the hour-long flight. The cater bot in the kitchen should be able to help me. Perhaps there will be time for it to make some blueberry white chalk chip muffins before we leave. I suddenly have a craving for those. One of the best things about returning to Earth has been the food on demand. Since becoming pregnant, I've been catching up on all the delicious snacks I missed when I was stuck in space. As I drop my travel bag onto the bed and head downstairs, Tarak intercepts me in the doorway, appearing out of nowhere. 
I don't even blink. I'm over that. I'm used to his silent, stalking manner by now. He's a familiar shadow, and I take comfort in the fact that he's by my side. I suspect I don't know even half of what he's capable of, but I do know that he's lethal. I also know that he would never hurt me. He doesn't mean to sneak up on me. That's just the way he moves, with fluid, soundless grace. Talking to yourself again, female? His tone is serious, but his crimson eyes are full of mirth. You've been doing a lot of that lately. I was just telling our little one what kind of father I think you'll be, I reply. Oh, and what kind of parent do you assume I will be, woman? An overprotective one, naturally. Would you expect anything less? No. Good. He gives me a slow, burning, up-and-down look. A warm sensation threads its way through me, coiling in my belly. My heart pounds. Heat spreads through my cheeks, and my lips part ever so slightly. He's standing in front of me, so close that his unmistakable scent surrounds me. I take a slow, shuddering breath, inhaling deeply. There has been a delay, he rumbles as he draws me close. He places his large hands on each of my temples, threading his fingers through my loose hair. My usually short hair has grown longer since we left Kithia. He seems to like it that way. I blink as I look up, meeting his gaze. But... The Trans-Pacific Skyflyer is due to leave on the hour. They're never late. He stares at me as if I'm speaking a language other than universal. We are not traveling on some crowded human transport like common slaves. I'm tired of relying on human technology. I've sent for my own flyer. It will be arriving shortly. But until then... He traces his fingers down my cheek extending his pinky to caress my lips. We have time. I take his finger between my lips, sucking on it. A low, throaty growl escapes him. Desire burns in his dark red eyes, threatening to consume me with its intensity. I thought the Federation didn't want you operating Cordolian aircraft in Earth's atmosphere. I don't give a shit about what the Federation wants. Tarak lifts me effortlessly into his arms. We have been more than cooperative with your people, but I am tired of these endless human routines and rules and this senseless bureaucracy. Why do humans obsess over forms and documents? Is a written agreement going to stop me from doing what I want? His ears twitch slightly betraying his frustration. I suspect I'm the only person in the universe who thinks that little trait of his is endearing. Poor baby, I say softly. Have my people been driving you nuts with their demands? I haven't encountered a species more obsessed with procedure and detail than humans. Tell me about it, I agree, as he drops me gently onto the bed. You're not the only one. It used to annoy the hell out of me, too. But I guess we humans have been conditioned to accept these things. If we didn't try to organize ourselves, Earth would have descended into chaos a long time ago. His distracting hand pushes my dress up over my thighs. I'm on my back and he comes up over me, his hand sliding down the bare skin of my inner thighs, raising goose flesh on my legs. He leans in and kisses me, his tongue darting between my lips, applying pressure, his kisses deep and hungry and wanting. His sharp fangs graze my lower lip. He's savoring me. He brings his naughty hand over my pussy, which is already wet. 
He strokes me through the thin fabric of my underwear, making me gasp. We've already been here today, I say weakly. It's not a complaint, more a statement of fact. We have, he agrees, using his other hand to untie the belt at my waist. The thin gray dress falls open, revealing the swell of my belly and my full breasts straining against my soft, thin bra. He slides it down over my shoulders, leaving me unclothed in only my underwear. The ever-present fluttering movements of my baby fade into the background as Tarak's attentions take center stage. He stares at my breasts. Throughout the pregnancy, they've grown. He fumbles with my bra, a sense of urgency overtaking him as he tries to figure the garment out. He unclasps it, and my breasts spring free. They're full and pendulous and slightly tender. Faint stretch marks decorate the undersides, and my areli and nipples have enlarged and darkened. Right now, they are exquisitely sensitive. Taking care not to press on my stomach, he brings his lips to my breast, kissing my bare skin. These have grown nicely, he says approvingly. A wonderful tingling sensation radiates from every place that his lips touch, sending a pleasurable shiver down my spine. His lips close over my nipple, which is a little bit sore, but as he sucks on it, the pain disappears. His mouth is warm and moist, and his tongue is oh so gentle as it glides over my sensitive flesh. I exhale slowly, closing my eyes. If the sex was incredible before, it's now become earth-shatteringly amazing thanks to the changes my body has undergone. As he sucks on my nipple, his fingers are caressing my pussy. They're tantalizingly warm through the moist fabric of my underwear. My mate is such a good multitasker. I let out a soft cry as he hooks his fingers underneath the elastic of my panties and tugs them downwards, sliding them over my legs. He moves to my other breast, treating it with the same amount of care. Intense arousal courses through me, making my pussy throb with need. It's as if every single nerve ending has been dipped in liquid pleasure. His tongue circles my nipple, making me gasp with delight. He looks up, responding to my vocalized pleasure with a fanged smile. Oh, he's the perfect picture of arrogance, completely sure of himself. He knows exactly how helpless I am before him, and he enjoys it. Your body pleases me in this state, he growls, dragging the tip of his finger over the moist flesh of my pussy. He chuckles softly as I whimper, craving his touch. I can make you climax just with the tip of this finger. I try to give him my best withering stare, but it probably comes across as more of a pleading look. Damn him. Right now, I'm a hot mess. Are you sure about that? Hmm. He lets his finger do the talking, carefully watching my face as he slides between my sensitive folds. Oh, I gasp as he starts to move his finger back and forth. Yes, he agrees smugly. I struggle to find a witty comeback in the deep, pleasure-fogged recesses of my brain, but the only thing that comes out of my mouth is a breathless gasp. He's staring straight at me the corners of his eyes crinkling with amusement. His deep red irises are shot through with flecks of black, and they burn into me as he slides out and finds my clit with his lubricated finger. Uh, oh, 
I utter as he touches that tender nub for the first time. His touch sets off a little explosion of pleasure down there, making me squirm. My legs flail about as my body seems to take on a life of its own. It's no longer under my control. I watch his face as he pleasures me. This severe Cordolian warrior has turned into a male who exists to please me on his terms. A rare smile graces his features, transforming his face. He's smug and pleased and possessive and considerate all at the same time. This is his secret bedroom expression, reserved only for me. He brings his thumb into play, slowly rolling my clit between thumb and forefinger, generating new sensations that I never would have thought possible. This pregnant body of mine is a revelation. Everything is a tingling bundle of nerves, melting into pleasure at his touch. My arousal grows with every caress, taking on a life of its own. It's like an ember that he stokes with his little touches, turning into a powerful blaze. I close my eyes and run my fingers through his hair. It's impossibly soft, neatly trimmed in his usual military crew cut. The slightly raised points where his horns originate from fall under my thumbs as I explore the familiar contours of his face. They've been growing back, but he keeps filing them down, much to my annoyance. They're sensitive organs, and they give him pleasure, but he says they're not practical. He lets out a low, throaty sound as I run my thumbs over them. You cheated, I whisper, my voice hoarse. He cocks an eyebrow. You said only one finger. Hmm. He rubs a little harder, cutting off any argument. I'm trembling under his touch, which is both gentle and firm. He strokes me faster, and the tightness in my core builds. It surges like a wave, the sensation becoming almost unbearable. At the same time, I don't want it to end. But I need release. It's coming. He knows it. I know it. He slows down a little, applying only the lightest pressure, because that's all that is needed. By now, my body has become fine-tuned to respond to his touch. Every time we do this, the climax comes a little easier, and it becomes more intense. If I didn't know better, I'd almost think he's been training my body to do this. Now, all that's needed is a little flick of his finger, and we're there. It's coming. He caresses me once more, with a feather-light touch, and it comes. That feeling. It picks me up like a giant tidal wave and carries me along, a powerful sensation that builds and builds, rippling through me, making me cry out. Just when I think it's about to crash, it grows stronger, and he keeps his finger on my clit, holding my hips as I buck and sway, thrusting his fingers into my pussy now. Going deep, finding wetness, curling his warm palm around and drawing his fingers out slowly as I climax. Wave after wave of bliss rips through me, each one more powerful than the one before. I cry out and drag my fingers through his hair, drowning in pure sensation. My orgasm builds, becoming almost scary in its intensity. And when release finally comes, it's glorious. My whole body writhes, and Tarak is there with his lips on the soft skin at the hollow of my neck, grazing me with his fangs, inhaling me. 
As he moves, his erection presses gently against me, alerting me to his arousal. I'm basking in deep satisfaction, and down there I'm all tingly and warm. I've had my fun, and now it's his turn. What would you like, General? I ask invitingly, my eyes fluttering open as the aftershocks of climax ripple through me. You, he answers. I'm all yours, I rasp as he spreads my legs, dragging me to the edge of the bed. He unfastens his belt, and his cordolian robes come loose. They slip to the floor, revealing his sculpted torso. His cock springs forth as he drops his black trousers, and I moan in anticipation. He leans in, dropping to his knees. As I lie on my back at the edge of the bed, he folds my legs up against his torso, kneeling at the bedside. He circles his hands around my thighs. My legs curl around his taut body. His muscles bunch and flex as he leans in, entering me. I let out a low moan as he slides into me, the ridges along his cock gliding over my most sensitive parts. I quiver as a deep sensation takes hold, and to my surprise, I'm in the grip of another orgasm. I cry out, bucking against him as he holds me tight. His lips curve into a satisfied smile. He starts to move his hips back and forth, slowly at first, then thrusting a little deeper. He fucks me tenderly, carefully, never once putting pressure on my pregnant belly. He gently draws out his pleasure his intense gaze fixed on me at all times. I'm basking in the glow of our lovemaking, enjoying the view from down here. I admire the lean, sculpted planes of his stomach that rise to join impressive pectoral muscles and powerful shoulders. His arms are slightly flexed, accentuating his toned biceps. His forearms are corded with muscle, tapering down to large hands that can be either gentle or deadly. He's as impressive a specimen as I've ever seen, but the most incredible thing about it all is that this lean, lethal warrior is all mine. As he thrusts inside me, his expression becomes fiercely possessive. He takes me slowly. He goes deeper. His massive erection stretches my hypersensitive flesh. I pant and moan, biting my lower lip. He trembles and exhales. His lips part slightly, revealing the points of his fangs. I watch him, taking in his elegant features. The hardness in his expression is all but gone, replaced with a softness he only ever shows to me. He's alien and otherworldly, and exactly what one would imagine a Cordolian to look like. I look at my legs, pressed against his body, marveling at the contrast between his gray-silver skin and the deep tan of my thighs. We're so different, and yet, when we're together— those distinctions don't matter anymore. My thoughts are stolen away as that blissful sensation grows, threatening to explode into another orgasm. I voice my satisfaction as Tarak increases his speed ever so slightly, and that little adjustment is enough to send me over the edge again. Oh, oh, I cry out as he holds me tight. I come with him inside me, my hips moving back and forth, my pelvic muscles contracting. He slows his movements, letting my body do its thing, the ripples of my orgasm causing me to clench around his hard shaft. My body must be doing something right, because all of a sudden he's gripping my legs tighter, a low rumble issuing from his throat. 
He goes taut, closing his eyes as his features twist into an expression of pure pleasure. And then he comes. It's a chain reaction, setting me off again. This is too much. I cry out, louder this time. He finishes inside me, his seed spilling forth. I maneuver my legs so they're curling around his waist. He curves his hands over my pregnant belly, feeling the tiny vibrations as our child moves. He's breathing heavily. My, 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 he whispers. Look at what this pregnant state has done to your body, my Amina. Tell me about it, I sigh, unable to help the smile that tugs at my lips. Every time we do this, it just gets better and better. The same raging hormones that make me moody and give me sore boobs and make me crave sugar at random times also make me like this. Constantly horny, able to have multiple orgasms. They never taught us about any of this in my human biology course. And I've got my very own skilled Cordolian male who knows exactly what to do with me when I'm like this. I arch one eyebrow. You know, you've been away from me for too long. As I lock my legs around him, he caresses my stomach with gentle, reverent hands. So, as far as I'm concerned, you have a whole lot of making up to do. Noted, he says, with a deadpan expression. This humble Cordolian is entirely yours, without reservation. Yes, I agree. You most definitely are, except for the humble part. And I have no problems with that at all. Chapter 3 Tarak I am glad to see the end of the human residence as we depart, making our way down the narrow, paved pathway. Agreeing to live on Earth on the Federation's terms was never part of my plan. But when we first arrived, we had to appease the nervous humans. By agreeing to stay in a residence of their choosing— we were agreeing to let them limit our movements and monitor us. The humans felt more secure knowing where we were and what we were doing. That was several cycles ago. The situation has evolved since then. Humans are coming to terms with the fact that an alliance with us can be most beneficial to them. Our presence here effectively turns Earth into a militarized force to be reckoned with. Now, other hostile species will think twice before trying to take advantage of Earth and its inhabitants. Darkness has fallen, giving me welcome relief from the harsh light of the day. My vision is never as acute in the daytime, and if I spend too long in the sun, my skin starts to burn. The one physical advantage humans have over Cordolians is their resistance to ultraviolet light. But when the sun disappears over the horizon, we are very much in our element. For that reason, my hand is on Abby's shoulder as we walk. The way is illuminated by soft electric lights, but in the shadows she is prone to fumbling, so I guide her. In my other hand, I carry her travel bag and my own personal belongings, which consist of nothing more than a few simple garments and an array of small communication and monitoring devices. I tend to travel light. We are making our way to the bot car. It will take us to this island skyport, where my stealth flyer is expected to arrive soon. As we enter the car... My holographic comm device alerts me to an incoming call. I retrieve it from inside my robe. A small, three-dimensional image of the caller appears above the screen. It's Zalikian. General, he begins, running a hand through his long hair. Abby, he adds, acknowledging my mate. 
Hi, Zell, she smiles. I'm sorry, Abby, but I'm going to borrow your general for a little while, and I'm going to speak in Cordolian, because I suspect I'll end up cursing. Go ahead, Zell, Abby says. You know cursing doesn't bother me, though. I know, but he gets a little funny if anyone acts less than honorable around you. Don't I know it, Abby laughs. I understand, Zell. So, if whatever you need to talk about is so aggravating that you need to curse in Cordolian, go for it. They exchange a look. I glare at my mate. Why do I somehow get the feeling they're enjoying a silent moment at my expense? Zalikian, I growl in Cordolian, get to the point. Yes, sir, he says, his expression becoming serious. The humans are panicking. Humans are always panicking, I reply, unconcerned. The bot car begins to move. Is this the reason for your call? Until recently, Zalikian had been staying with us in the diplomatic residence. But several weeks ago, he'd left Novaterra with his new-found human mate, the female called Sarah, to go and do something called skiing. Apparently, there is a place on Earth called the Alps, where it is just as cold as Kithia. I've just received word from Senator Aquinas that they've detected alien flight activity over the Pacific Ocean. His amber eyes narrow in suspicion. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? I shrug. I have requisitioned a stealth flyer. If I am to live on this planet, I will not travel around in some substandard human craft, and I refuse to allow my mate to do the same. I frown. Although I'm surprised they were able to detect the stealth flyer's entry with the cloaking systems activated. Perhaps I have underestimated the sophistication of human technology. The prince shakes his head. We can't be bringing our craft into their atmosphere by stealth. They'll think we have another agenda. Have we not pandered to them enough already? I am sick and tired of being limited by these ridiculous restrictions, simply because these humans are uneasy. Abby rests a hand on my arm as my tone becomes harsh, cautioning me with her eyes. She can't understand what we're saying but she seems to sense my frustration. I have pledged my entire fucking fleet to help defend their disorganized mess of a planet, and still they worry. Zalikian sighs. I agree with you, General, but humans have one of the most complicated political systems I have ever encountered. There are some who don't support our alliance and would seek to undermine it. This kind of activity gives them fodder for dissent. Let them dissent. It is nothing to do with me. Every galaxy has its idiots, and you cannot convince them all. That's all very well and good, Tarek, Zalikian snaps. But you're not the one who has to deal with the fucking human politicians and their cronies, one of whom just happens to be my mate's father. It is rare for his composure to crack like this. I can't help but wonder what sort of special little hell he has walked into. His mate, Sarah, is the daughter of a large political dynasty, after all. It sounds like a recipe for instant aggravation. But Zalikian is a survivor of the Kithian court. Managing the humans should be child's play for him. Your Cordolian nobility, I say dryly. Find a way to make them understand. I'm just a general, Zalikian. Politics isn't my area of expertise. I merely supply the troops and the weapons. The prince blinks. It's so difficult to tell when you're being serious and when you're messing with me. I keep my expression deadpan. If I am indeed subtly mocking him, he will never know. 
I am merely stating the obvious. I don't care for politics, Zalikian. You know that. When enemies threaten us, I will fight. But don't expect me to play these silly human games for too long. The prince sighs. I suppose this is to be expected, considering it's you, after all. You can't deny that I've shown particular restraint while I've been on Earth, Prince. That's only because you wish to please your human mate. We all know that if it weren't for her, you would have implemented a military takeover a long time ago. I don't deny that, but I have shown restraint. I don't suppose anything is going to make you change your mind. I stare at Zalikian's image not bothering to give him a reply. He knows the answer to that. The calm beeps gently, a stream of data flickering below the projected image of Zalikian. Less than a half phase until my flyer lands, I inform the prince. Are the humans going to cause me unnecessary headaches? I will inform the senator, Zalikian says wryly. I will also advise him of the assault capabilities of a Cordolian stealth flyer, and why it would be a bad idea for any humans to engage in any hostile activity. You do that, I agree. Your mate's father seems like the kind of man who can read between the lines. I'm sure he will understand what might happen if the humans obstruct my pilot's attempts to land. I'm sure he will, the prince says mildly. You owe me one, General. I snort. Consider it a condition of my ongoing cooperation. Zalikian rolls his eyes in a most human way. He turns his attention to Abby as he switches to Universal. Sorry about that, Abby. Best of health to you and the little one. And don't let our general terrorize too many humans. By the way, Sarah says hello, and that the Snow Lodge is yours any time you wish to visit. The general's invited, too. My mate smiles sweetly. For the entire conversation, she's been watching me intently. Her sweetness can be deceptive. By now, she's picked up on the meaning of a few Cordolian words and I'm sure she's understood more than she lets on. Not much escapes her, even though she sometimes acts deceptively innocent. Thank you, Zal. Say hi to Sarah for me as well, and enjoy the powder. Will do. The prince farewells both of us with a mock salute as I terminate the communication. Abby looks at me questioningly. So what impossible diplomatic task have you given the poor prince this time? Does it have something to do with the fact that we're not traveling on the public sky flyer? She's as astute as always. It's a minor issue, I shrug. Nothing to be concerned about. I don't want you to worry about anything. An amused snort escapes her. If I let you have your way we'll probably end up with a small army of groveling human servants. Someone has to keep you in line. So don't you worry about me worrying. I'm pregnant, but that doesn't mean I'm suddenly fragile. Is that so? I take her hand into mine, staring at her slender human fingers. Everything about her is soft and fragile. And what is wrong with having human servants? My lips quirk upwards. Idiot! She gently punches my arm. You're not getting servants. We can get a dog, but no servants. Dog? I don't believe I'm familiar with this species. Dogs are amazing. Wait until you meet Nix and Zeus. They're adorable. The affectionate look that crosses her face tells me she is fond of these dog creatures, whatever they are. As I twine my fingers with hers, I'm filled with a strange emotion. 
I struggle to identify it at first. But then it hits me. Contentment. With her, I am content. I look at our joined hands. Her soft palm rests against my rough skin, her fingers so small and delicate. We are from entirely different worlds. We are entirely different creatures. And yet, somehow, nature has gifted us with the ability to reproduce. It beggars belief that a pure female like her has chosen to be with a killer like me. She's a gentle creature who has never truly known what it means to raise a hand in anger against an enemy. As far as I am aware, the only time she has ever harmed another is when she shot a silent one, a feared imperial assassin, in order to protect me. It wasn't necessary. I would have dispatched the assassin eventually. But this fragile creature dared to go against her innate nature. Through the clear roof of the flyer, she shot the silent one in the head with a plasma gun, her aim true and steady. All because she was worried about me. Never before has any individual, let alone a human, stood up to protect me like that. That simple action warmed my black heart in the strangest of ways. And now she sits beside me, pregnant with my child. I never imagined that I would have the opportunity to extend my bloodline in this lifetime. Cordolian males who enter the military expect to die in the service of the military. There is no talk of mating and procreation. In this era, that is a privilege reserved almost exclusively for the nobles, who wish to keep their Cordolian bloodlines pure. I snort softly. Their notion of racial purity is becoming more and more ridiculous. They will be wiped out within a generation. I place my other hand on her belly and find my child stirring. The movement is reassuring. Sometimes, if it is silent and I focus, I can hear their twin heartbeats. Mother's is slow and steady, a reassuring background rhythm for baby's rapid, fluttering heartbeat. What's on your mind, Tarak? You, I reply, watching her as our car turns into the entrance of the skyport. In typical human fashion, the place is lit up like a blazing star field. If humans had a choice, they would probably choose to live in constant daylight. Cordolians prefer constant darkness. Care to elaborate? Perhaps, I murmur, as the car navigates past a stream of foot traffic. Even though night has fallen, the skyport is busy with humans swarming everywhere. We enter a line of bot cars similar to our own, heading towards a drop-off bay. The cars are all the same make and model, and they are all painted in the same color, white. There's a certain uniformity to things in this place. If I dwelt here for longer, I might think it strange. Abby hits me with another playful punch. Enough with the dark, mysterious thoughts already. I swear you're the king of being cryptic. One's motives must always be concealed, I say half-seriously, reciting a fundamental lesson from military school. Leave your enemies guessing, and your allies slightly insecure. So does that make me an enemy or an ally, General Acadian? You're neither of those. You are my mate. Do you understand? I stroke her face gently as the car rolls to a stop. I place my fingers on her chin, turning her face towards me. 
Departure point reached. Please exit the vehicle. The bot car's automated voice system echoes in the background. I ignore it, focusing on her shimmering, speckled eyes. They remind me of the glowing halo that's left behind after a star explodes. I'm starting to understand, she says softly. You are more valuable to me than any alliance. And you have the potential to be more dangerous than any enemy, I tell her. Her eyes widen. Dangerous? To you? No way, lover. Believe me, I assure her. You are both my greatest strength and my greatest weakness. Even I don't know what I would do if anything were to happen to her. I am only Cordolian, after all. I take her hand, guiding her out of the car. Her face is slightly flushed, and her expression is one of mild disbelief. Come. She steps out after me, protectively holding her belly with one hand. A porter bot arrives at our side, and I load our belongings onto it. You have waited so patiently for me in this lifeless place. She shakes her head. I completely understand why we had to stay here. You had to fight off the evil Cordolians, and at the same time, the Federation was uncomfortable with you guys staying outside the diplomatic zone. Yes, but now the treaty is almost finalized, and I believe we have more than adequately demonstrated our intentions so they have relaxed their restrictions on us. My tone is scornful. Do they think they can truly restrict me from doing anything I want? I am merely cooperating because of her, because I do not want my mate to be ostracized by her own people, and because I swore to myself that I would try to do things more diplomatically. I owe it to Abby, to my unborn child, and to the oppressed Cordolians who will eventually make their way to Earth to begin a new life. I am soon to be a father, and a child should not have a father who is a warmonger. Abby smiles. Even when I don't tell her much, my mate understands. You're all mine now, she says as we walk through the crowds, the porter bot trailing behind us. You need to stay with me until I pop this little one out. No more skirmishes in space, no more military stuff, no more random trips to silence. You're staying right here, buddy. Everything has been taken care of. I glare at an elderly human woman, who is staring at us as if we're a pair of newly hatched Zargek spawn. She quickly looks away as my eyes meet hers. Humans are not yet developed enough to understand universal etiquette. It's considered offensive to stare. Good. Then let's go to Teluria, she says, dragging me through the crowd. She is much better at dodging people than I am. Then she stops, staring up at me in confusion. Tarak, she says slowly. If you're taking me there in a Cordolian flyer, then why are we at the skyport? This is where we will board. I gesture for her to follow me. There's no point wasting time explaining things. It's better if she sees for herself. Abby When your other half is a Cordolian general, who is used to being obeyed and not questioned... Little things sometimes get lost in translation. Such as, why are we at the second busiest skyport in the Southern Hemisphere? Does he expect to land his stealth flyer here? Ugh, so many things aren't making sense right now. We pass through the cavernous departures hall. It's a giant dome-shaped structure with a transparent roof. The full moon glows above us partly obscured by drifting clouds. 
Tarak leads me towards a plain door at the back of the departures hall, hovering around me protectively, and rewarding anyone who dares to look curiously in our direction with a death glare. Seems like you know your way around, I remark suspiciously, as he presses his palm against a bioscanner. The doors slide open, recognizing his biological signature. What the hell? They've given you clearance? I have made my presence known, he says nonchalantly. Behind us, the porter bot whirs as it transports our bags. Well, my bag. Tarak's luggage is a small black metal case. And I thought I traveled light. Oi, General. A man in a gray uniform appears, striding towards us. He seems to recognize Tarak. You're early. I look back and forth between them, still confused. The man holds out a weathered hand to me as he approaches. He has sandy blonde hair and skin that's seen a little too much time in the sun. You must be the missus, Mom Jack Franklin, the sky boss here. Your lad and his boys have been very helpful to us over the last couple of weeks. His speech, an odd combination of universal and English, has a distinct old-world twang. I suppress the inappropriate laugh that threatens to escape us. Something about him referring to Tarak as a lad seems faintly ridiculous. Tarak, I say slowly, narrowing my eyes and glaring at my mate as I shake Jack's hand. What have you been up to? Tarek's expression is unreadable. Jack grins in a boyish way. We've had a bit of a problem with smugglers over the past few months. They've been bringing in drugs and controlled technologies and whatnot. The general here alerted us to the problem, single-handedly caught a crew of disguised genetic smugglers, and generously offered a few of his soldiers to help enforce the law. The technology these guys have for detecting narcotics vapors, weapons traces, and occult radiation is second to none. Jack shakes his head, a conspiratorial grin crossing his features. The Universal Ports Authority gave us a shit of a time when we were trying to get these boys in, but they've been invaluable to us ever since. I don't know how they do it, but they're like wolfhounds when it comes to sniffing out the riffraff and contraband. These Cordolians are something else. Tell me about it. Human technology isn't sensitive enough to detect molecular implants on an Ephrenium hauler, Tarak says, as if that explains anything. I have no idea what he's talking about. And before we came, they hadn't implemented any screening for subviruses or radiation nodes. Oh, okay. I don't know what any of those are, but I'm strangely relieved. Despite what he'd told Zal, Tarak wasn't going to just force his stealth flyer to land at the skyport. He'd thought ahead and actually made an arrangement with the sky boss. They've also been having problems with Ifkin slave traders entering Earth illegally using sophisticated cloaking methods, he adds quietly. Humans don't have a chance of catching them but Cordolians do. We've been hunting the Ifkin for a long time. I shake my head in disbelief. Those harmless-looking, four-armed, pale guys who have eyes in the backs of their heads? You think those little guys are a threat? Ifkin are far from harmless, Tarak growls. They worship chaos. Don't ever underestimate an Ifkin, Abby. They would slit your throat in broad daylight for the promise of a few credits. I'll keep that in mind, I say dubiously. I don't particularly have plans to hang out with the Ifkin any time soon. We make our way down a long corridor that branches off into a private lounge, filled with the smell of freshly roasting coffee. Human security guards stand in the corners, plugged into their interfaces, watching us warily. Beyond the glass walls is the landing zone of the skyport. An endless network of runways stretches off into the distance, lit up with an array of tiny green lights. 
several multi-tiered platforms provide alternative landing sites for different kinds of space and intra-atmospheric craft. In three sieves, or five of your Earth minutes, my stealth flyer, Dark Shadow, will be here, Tarek murmurs, putting a reassuring arm around my shoulders. Everything has been arranged, Amina. Do not worry. I'm a bit overwhelmed and speechless right now. It seems that while I've been busy being pregnant and stuffing my face with ramen and muffins, Tarak's been hard at work setting up strategic relationships with certain humans. Why do I suddenly feel like I've lost control of everything and landed in some alternate version of Earth reality? I'm so not used to feeling this way. I used to be so in control of my own little world, which was confined to a small biodome on Fortuna Tau. We walk down to the exit of the terminal, which I'm surprised to see is guarded by two armored Cordolian soldiers. They see Tarak and greet him with a silent fist-on-chest salute. With their movement-enhancing black combat suits and twin plasma guns, they appear dark and menacing standing perfectly still as we pass. Beyond the security point, human skyport workers zoom across the landing zone in small hover vehicles called darts, and signal bots shine their guide lights up and down the runway. It's a highly guarded hive of activity that Tarak has somehow managed to infiltrate with Cordolian soldiers. Is it disturbing that Tarak has oh-so-conveniently placed his men in one of the most strategic locations on Earth? On paper, it looks that way. If I didn't know him, I might think so. As we walk across the tarmac, a brisk wind laced with a hint of salt greets us from the north, reminding me that in the darkness beyond lies the Pacific Ocean. Jack has been trailing behind us, he gives Tarak an odd salute as we reach our spot. I'll be off then, buddy. He nods in my direction, taking in my obviously pregnant state. Best of luck with everything, ma'am. Uh, thanks, Jack. The sky boss whistles, signaling one of his workers, who zooms over on a dart. He steps onto the hovering platform, and they glide away, leaving us standing alone in the middle of the landing zone. As the wind tugs at my long hair, I become aware of a strange sound. Correction. It's more like an absence of sound. It's coming from the north. I look up to the sky. The stars seem to shimmer a little more than usual, but that's all. The soundless sound becomes more intense, like a giant vacuum that pulls noise away. The rush of the wind disappears, and the mechanical background noise of engines and motors ceases. There's a sensation like pressure, and I suddenly feel as if I'm being hemmed in on all sides by some unseen force. I'm overcome with nausea. I hold my stomach, resisting the urge to throw up. Little Monster is there with me, tumbling about like she always does. Tara puts his hands on my shoulders. What's wrong, Abby? His voice is laced with concern. I feel sick, I complain. It isn't morning sickness. That's long gone. This is different. It's the kind of nausea you get after a messy atmospheric entry. I think I'm going to throw up. He pulls me against him, holding me tight. Sorry, this is my fault. You can't hold yourself responsible for every little... I gag as the sensation grows stronger. The stars above look the same, but different. Sound has disappeared, sucked away into some invisible, noiseless vortex. There's a weird pressure in my head. My heart pounds, and my baby kicks. I clutch my belly, as if that can somehow protect her. I hope she's not feeling the same way. As the sensation grows, the landing platforms in the distance blur for just a split second before snapping back into place. 
It was so fast I could have missed it, like a momentary rip in the space-time continuum. And the lack of sound is so obvious now, so oppressive. Tarak is unaffected. He holds me tighter, caressing my belly, putting his lips on my ear. I think he's murmuring something to me, but I can't hear what he's saying. And then, the stars and buildings start to peel away. Am I losing my mind? An image starts to form in front of us. It's faint at first, but it quickly starts to come together, forming an outline. As it solidifies, the horrible nausea sensation starts to disappear. The cloaking technology can sometimes have this effect, Tarak says, as sound returns to my ears. All of a sudden, the pressure's gone, and there's a Cordolian stealth flyer in front of us. It's surprisingly big, about three times the size of a human flyer. And its body is made entirely from that impenetrable black metal the Cordolians call Calidum. It's sleek and menacing, and looks as if it's been built for absolute speed and silence. It's like a mini version of their warship Silence, which floats in Earth's orbit, carrying a devastating arsenal of fission missiles. Nice ride, I say weakly, as my poor tummy recovers. You won't feel the effects once we're inside, Tarak reassures me. The cabin is insulated. Good, because that was freaking awful. Hmm. He's still holding me tight, but he's looking back over his shoulder, distracted by something. He did apologize, though. He's getting better at that. As a door opens in the stealth flyer, a ramp extending from it, Tarak continues to stare at the terminal building. What is it? He remains silent, as infuriatingly cryptic as always. Two black-uniformed soldiers exit the flyer, saluting their general as he turns to greet them. He issues orders in Cordolian, and they rush to my side, picking up my belongings from the porter bot. Go inside, Tarak tells me. I need to check on something. I'll be back. The stern-faced soldiers give me a little bow and wait expectantly for me to follow. The opening of the ship is a black, gaping maw, revealing only darkness beyond. Like all things Cordolian, it appears sinister and alien. If I had to sum up the Cordolian aesthetic in a few words, I'd call it Evil Empire Chic. I glance back at Tarak. A predatory look crosses his features, his dark red eyes narrowing. What the hell is my big silver alien up to? Reluctantly, I make my way onto the stealth flyer, which he called Dark Shadow. Don't do anything excessive, I warn, even though I still have no idea what's caught his attention. I don't like the look on his face. I know him well enough by now to know when he's thinking no good thoughts, such as contemplating how to hurt someone or something. Tarak gives me a little, I know what I'm doing, raise of his eyebrow before turning and striding back across the tarmac. With an aggravated sigh, I turn and make my way up the ramp. Ugh, men, generals, Cordolians. When we get to the Oceanic Republic, there will be no more surprises, because that's my home turf. Besides, we'll be staying out of town, on a property where there's the bare minimum of technology. I can't imagine what could possibly go wrong out there. Chapter 4 Tarak As Dark Shadow lands, something catches my attention. My eye is drawn to an irregularity on the roof of the terminal. I stare at the glass-domed roof as Abby looks at me questioningly. She is ever curious, but I can't reveal my suspicions to her. I don't want her to worry unnecessarily. I order my troops to take her inside the flyer as I head back towards the terminal. 
A strange sensation prickles at the back of my neck. My battle sense tells me we're being watched. I do not like this. If I'm right and someone is watching us, they would have seen me turn back. If they are clever, they will be attempting to leave the scene right now. If I were an ordinary soldier, they would have a good chance of escaping unnoticed. Too bad for them, I'm anything but ordinary. As I pass inside, the two Cordolian 3rd Division guards stationed at the entrance look at me, anticipating my command. Stay where you are, I snap. Eyes on the landing zone. If you see anything out of the ordinary, mark it. But don't act unless I give you the all clear. They nod in understanding. I move across to a part of the terminal where the view is partly obscured by a solid section of roof. I take a moment to empty my thoughts, drawing on the symbiotic force that dwells within me. Countless nanoparticles flow in my veins, infected with a virus that makes them responsive to neural commands. I assemble a mental image of a heat trace visor. It's one I've gone over millions of times, learning each painstaking detail. There is no room for error. Otherwise, the entire structure will collapse. A familiar stretching sensation spreads across my face as billions of subcellular nanites are drawn out of my bloodstream, passing through flesh and bone and connective tissue, activated by my mental command. The process involves a tiny degree of telepathy. The surgery that's been carried out on my brain has left me with just a small remnant of the telepathic ability all Cordolians possess, the ability that is usually lost to us shortly after birth. It's just enough that I can utilize the nanites in this way, and it's the reason I survive the vicious effects of the initial infection. The suffering I went through to harness these nanites and bend them to my will was immense. It nearly killed me. There's a momentary flash of searing pain before the nanostructure settles over my eyes in the form of a heat trace visor. I step out of the sheltered area and stare up at the transparent roof, searching for a heat trace. There. It's faint, barely visible. A less experienced soldier would have missed it. But it's there. The faint blue and green pattern resembles footsteps. They're beginning to fade before my eyes. My suspicions were correct. Someone was on the roof, watching us. They're gone now. They must have been very, very good to evade my notice at first. No human would have been able to carry out such a feat. It had to be another Cordolian. An Imperial assassin, perhaps. It is a good thing we are leaving this place. The thought of an enemy laying eyes on my mate sends a torrent of anger through me. If anyone is stupid enough to keep following us, I will hunt them down, and I will kill them. And if they have been sent by the Empire, I will send their head back to the Empress in a fucking cryo-box, so she may consider herself warned. Abby must never suspect a thing. This isn't her fight. She has done nothing except choose to become my mate. And I won't have her living in fear or worrying while she has a young one to nurture. Abby Tarek joins me shortly after I board. He's gone all quiet and broody, staring silently out of the viewing port as we prepare to depart. The Cordolians have prepared a seat for me, lining it with plush, colorful cushions patterned with intricate motifs. I recognize some of the designs, they're characteristically Veronian. There's a neatly folded pale blue blanket on the seat, 
and as I sink into the cushions, I lay it over my legs, having nowhere else to really put it. This kind of thing has been happening more and more often lately. Small, exotic surprises have started to appear here and there, without explanation or warning. A box of Veronian sweets, a fragrance diffuser emitting a dreamy, relaxing scent, that beautiful cash can, a finely woven metallic necklace that's richer than gold and as fluid and light as silk. I'm starting to suspect that my general could be a romantic at heart, not that he would ever admit it. We're sitting in the cockpit of this sleek, dark craft, and Tarak is to my right, looking over the shoulder of his pilot. The Cordolian medic called Ziara sits on my left. Shortly after I boarded, she cornered me, running her graceful hands over my belly and muttering soft things in Cordolian. Then, she stuck a blue starfish-shaped device next to my belly button, telling me it was a monitor of some sort. Shortly afterwards, it started to glow. Of course, she hasn't explained anything to me yet. The old me would have been freaking out. The new me simply accepts that I'm wedged between two less-than-talkative Cordolians with a glowing starfish stuck to my belly. That is what it means to trust someone completely. Tarak turns to me as the Cordolian in the pilot's seat flicks through the indecipherable controls of the flyer. Everything on the control data feed is written in the angular symbols of the Cordolian language. I can't make any sense of it. One of these days, I really need to pester Tarak to teach me some Cordolian. As if reading my thoughts, he turns to me. Coordinates? Huh? I blink. Where are we going, my love? Dark Shadow is at your command. I hate to admit it, but that sounded kind of cool. Tarak gives me an impatient look, making me feel like a student who's been asked a difficult question by their teacher in front of the entire class. The pilot swivels in his chair, his orange gaze fixed intently on me. Is he waiting for a command from... Me? I shift uncomfortably in my seat. I'm not used to this being in charge stuff. Coordinates? I don't know the exact coordinates of my aunt's place. In the past, I would catch a ride to Teluria Skyport, and she'd pick me up in a terrain vehicle. The property is about an hour's drive out of town. Tarak gives me a blank look, as if he has no idea what I'm talking about. It's in the middle of the Simpson Desert, I add sheepishly, as if that might somehow be helpful. In the Oceanic Republic, formerly called Australia. You're being unhelpfully vague, female, Tarek grumbles. Have you even notified this relative of yours of our arrival? Not specifically, I mumble. She doesn't have a calm, and she doesn't trust the networks. She lives off-grid. Off-grid? One of Tarak's pointed ears twitches a little. Aunt Kenna's not a huge fan of technology. She is what we humans call a disconnector. Sounds like a foolish notion. She has her reasons, I say, a little defensively. To some... Dear old Kenna might seem like a paranoid ball-breaker, but underneath the rough exterior, she's a sweet old woman. So, your relative is unaware of our arrival, and we don't have the exact coordinates for her dwelling. Tarak sounds skeptical. I can probably spot it from the air if we're in the right place. Otherwise, you'll just have to land at Teluria Skyport. Surely you have the coordinates for Earth's main skyport in your galactic atlas. You are being a little imprecise for my liking, my love. I'm human, I shrug. Not everything's about exact coordinates and calculations, my love. Sometimes you just have to wing it, like you did when you abducted me. Abducted? He inclines his head. 
If I recall correctly, you were rescued, not abducted. It's all a matter of perspective, I say dryly. I would rather land directly at your relative's dwelling if the surrounding terrain is suitably flat, Tarak insists. Unlike Nova Terra Skyport, I have yet to secure Telluria. So you're going to find a way to station your men at Telluria Skyport, too? He smiles enigmatically. Eventually, it is useful for us to establish a presence at the main ports of entry on Earth. Ah, take over by stealth. He stiffens. Although I am the author of the Manual on Planetary Colonization, that is not my intention. I raise an eyebrow. As we humans would say, you wrote the book? Indeed. And somehow you've made your guys invaluable to the authorities here. Correct. Just in case, huh? Abigail, he growls warningly, do not question my motives. I have told you already, I'm not going to subjugate your planet. He seems genuinely offended. The thing I've learned about Tarak is that he seems to get rather serious when it comes to keeping his word. Instantly, I feel bad for doubting him. It's just that when your mate is such a powerful and complicated being, it's hard to believe he might do certain things just to make you feel comfortable. He could have us humans terrified and running for cover if he wanted. I hate the fact that I keep thinking there has to be a catch. So far, apart from Tarak having had to spend long periods of time in space dealing with threats from the Empire, there hasn't been one. Maybe there isn't one. I realize the pilot is still waiting for my orders. The young Cordolian's gaze flickers back and forth between me and the general. Why don't you just set course for Telluria, I suggest, waving my hand around in a nonspecific manner. When we get there, we can fly around and look for my aunt's place from the sky. Since we'll be invisible anyway, it won't matter how many times we circle the place. I'm pretty sure I'll be able to spot it from the air. Tarek and his pilot look at each other meaningfully, sharing some sort of silent Cordolian male communication, before turning to stare at me in disbelief. Very well, he sighs. We shall attempt to visually locate the destination. He turns to the pilot. Set course for the human skyport called Telluria, and its... surrounds. Tarak. The distance covered is not far. It takes us the equivalent of a human hour to reach the middle of a dry, arid landscape. It is a true desert, devoid of any meaningful vegetation or surface water. Dark Shadow's cloaking has remained on, but I have no way of knowing for sure whether we've been tracked. The fact that the humans had managed to track us in the first place, despite our cloaking, is unwelcome news. But even if the humans have been able to monitor our path, I'm not overly concerned. What are they going to do? Start a war? I look across at my mate, who has fallen asleep. To my relief, the cloaking technology hasn't affected her inside the cabin. She's leaning on a rectangular pillow, her face upturned, her lips slightly parted. Her eyes are closed, revealing long, brown lashes. Even in sleep, she cradles her belly with both hands, at times murmuring soft, indecipherable words to herself, talking in her sleep. Humans are such funny, ridiculous creatures. Why does the simple sight of her sleeping make me suddenly feel as if all the battles and wars I've fought in my life have been pointless? I turn to Ziara, who sits beside Abby. All is well? 
Your offspring is healthy, she whispers. Careful not to wake my mate. Your mate is healthy. You have nothing to worry about, General. Zayara looks at the sleeping abbey. She has approximately one cycle left until she gives birth. Are you sure you wanted to stay on Earth during that time? Silence's medical bay is well equipped to handle any obstetric emergency. She needs to be comfortable. On Kithia, it would be considered disgraceful to hold a berthing on a warship. You know that. I will not do that to her. And silence is always going to be the first point of attack if Imperial forces return. I reach across and straighten the blanket across Abby's legs. It's starting to slip. If she is healthy, as you say, there should be no reason to excessively monitor her. The process of giving birth is as old as the dead star Ithra. Whether she does it in a human clinic or under your care in a place of her choosing, it shouldn't matter. Ziara studies me, momentarily silent. She seems mildly surprised. This is unlike you, General. I'm well aware of that. Usually, I would impose my control on such a situation. What has made me think like this? There was a time when I would never have considered settling for the human way of doing things. We pass over a giant expanse of dry land, heading towards the human skyport called Telluria. Our final destination is outside the skyport, somewhere in the desert. We have caught the sun, which is setting across the land, casting a fiery red glow over the barren plains. Earth's landscapes are varied and interesting. Few planets I've visited hold as much diversity. We will retrieve whatever you need from silence, I tell Ziara. I will build a Cordolian medical facility on Earth. There will be no reason for you to return to space until after my child is born. Silence is temporarily without a medic but Zayara's replacements are on their way from the fleet station. By bringing my best combat medic to Earth, I have done a most selfish and illogical thing. Zayara dares to smile at me, amusement curving her gray lips. This is most unlike you, General. I am merely adapting, I reply, wondering what in Cain's name. I really mean by that. Dark shadow banks, and as a large human settlement comes into view, we start to descend. We've reached Teluria, the pilot says, awaiting further instructions. Although I'd like to remain in the sky, watching my female sleep, it's time to wake her. Reluctantly, I put a hand on her cheek. Her breathing is deep and even, her chest rising and falling in a gentle rhythm. Her green-brown eyes flutter open. What? She looks around wildly, as if she's forgotten where she is. I am here, I say gently, forgetting the pilot, forgetting Ziara. Her eyes go wide and unfocused, and then she blinks rubs them with her hands, and fixes her gaze on me. A soft yawn escapes her. Are we there yet? Sweet, innocent human. Take a look outside, I tell her quietly, and tell me where you wish to go. Abby. There! I blurt in relief, pointing to a familiar outline of buildings and fences. It's hard to make it out in the fading light, but once I lay eyes on the haphazard jumble of buildings, I know instantly what it is. It's been years since I visited the property, but it doesn't look like anything's changed. Tarak signals to the pilot, and we begin our descent. A hundred kilometers out of the world's largest skyport is this place 
the unofficial Kendricks family ranch. Amidst the dust and sand and ancient cracked bitumen roads, this place is a hidden oasis in a landscape that's been largely forgotten since the advent of regular air travel. There was a time when we humans used to travel by land across this huge continent. Not anymore. The small inland towns that were dependent on car traffic have long since been abandoned, and the vast crumbling networks of roads that were built hundreds of years ago have been abandoned to nature, an echo of a long-distant past. One of the few people actually crazy enough to still live out here is my Auntie Kenna, my father's sister. Dark Shadow swoops in, heading for a flat patch of earth. The cabin is eerily silent, despite the huge forces generated by the stealth flyer. Tarak tells me that's because of its cloaking technology. Apparently, the only downside to this sort of cloaking is that it requires huge amounts of energy to sustain. The visual camouflage alone isn't so bad. It's the noise blocking sucks up all the juice. As far as Earth's concerned... We've departed Nova Terra and disappeared from their monitors, like some sort of unexplained extraterrestrial phenomenon. I'll bet that someone in some navigation center on Earth is probably freaking out right about now. Not that I care. Not that Tarak would ever care. He's made it pretty clear that he's happy to cooperate with Earth's rules to an extent— but I think he's starting to get tired of pretending to be a good boy for the humans. It's the nature of the beast, I guess. And because of what he is, he'll always be perceived as a threat to Earth. A shudder rips through the flyer as we land, coming down vertically. An almighty thud shakes the cabin, and then everything stops. We've landed. The setting sun streaks the viewport with an amber palette vibrant orange fading to deep purple as it slips over the horizon. We've ridden in on the most advanced technology in the universe, but I feel as if we've stepped back in time to a prehistoric place where there is only the sun and the sky and the endless expanse of the outback. There's something so raw and primal about this place, and this time of the day... When the searing heat gives way to the creeping chill, is my favorite. Tarak hovers over me as we exit, taking my hand as we make our way towards the residence. Ziara and the pilot, and two random soldiers I hadn't noticed until now, follow us at a respectful distance. The temperature has started to plummet, and the wind whips at my back as we walk. I am dressed for Nova Terra, not the middle of the desert, where it's blazing hot during the day and freezing cold at night. Tarak unfolds the soft, cashmere blanket I was using on the flight, draping it across my shoulders. Thanks, I say quietly, the wind stealing my voice. But I know he's heard me. I've spent long enough with him to know that Cordolians have near preternatural hearing. Not that I have anything to hide, but one actually has to be careful. You never know when he might be listening. Sneaky, snarky grumblers, take note. The walk down the dirt driveway to the Kendricks' residence is a long one. In the fading light, I have difficulty seeing, but Tarak's reassuring arm is around my waist, guiding me. People don't usually wander around out here after dark. There are rumors of frenzied, virus-infected wolf packs and dingoes that roam the desert. From time to time, there have been reports of people mysteriously disappearing. Not that I'm afraid. Why would I be when I have an apex predator by my side? As we reach the end of the driveway, I see a warm glow coming from the windows of the old ramshackle house I once called home. It's strange, though. The dogs aren't out. Usually, Nix and Zeus would have been slobbering all over me by now. The house looms before us, dark and imposing, apart from the few windows that are lit up. It's a ramshackle collection of original buildings, with added-on modifications. 
Although my father had some modern prefab structures erected out the back, Kenna prefers to stay in the old house. As we make our way up the front stairs, a familiar shadow appears behind the fly screen door. What have you dragged into my place now, Abby girl? Kenna peers at us, her eyes widening slightly as she takes in Tarak. In her weathered hands is an old-fashioned metal bullet shotgun. And you've gotten yourself knocked up, she says with a disapproving frown. I reach the fly screen door and yank it open, putting a hand on the shotgun. Relax, Auntie, there's no need for that. I push the barrel down so it's pointing at the floor. Tarak growls, moving to step between us. Don't touch that weapon, Amina. Is he the father? Kenna glares at Tarak, her blue eyes narrowed suspiciously. She has gunmetal gray hair that's cropped short and a tough weathered face. She's as lean as a whip, quick and wiry, despite her age. Behind us, Ziara and the Cordolian troops are standing awkwardly in the driveway, sensibly keeping their distance. Auntie Kenna, I say slowly, in an even placating tone, this is Tarak, my Cordolian mate, and the father of my unborn child. I omit a few details, like former general of the Cordolian Imperial Military and biologically altered elite soldier. I turn to Tarak. Tarak, this is my Auntie Kenna. Tarak and Kenna glare at each other in a tense standoff. They're both stone-faced, neither of them saying a word. But at least my aunts relaxed a little and lowered her gun. Finally, Kenna speaks. You should have sent word, she grumbles. I would have had more time to get dinner going. It's your fault for refusing to get any connectivity in this place. What do you expect me to do? Send you notice by actual letter mail, like some eccentric paranoid quadrillionaire? Do you know how much that would cost? Kenna inclines her head as if she's actually serious. I sigh. Tarak glowers. At least this boy looks more serious than your last one, Kenna says sternly. I resist the urge to drop my face into my palm. The problem with this tough lady is that she doesn't have a filter. Her tendency to speak her mind used to get her into all kinds of trouble. Can we not talk about that in front of Tarak? I glance at him, feeling a little awkward. That's ancient history. Tarak's ears twitch. Humph! Kenna rebuffs me with a dismissive wave of her hand as she lowers her gun to her side. Come on in, then. I'll get the oven going. She looks over my shoulder, noticing the Cordolian standing in the driveway. Those your friends, too, then. You better not be passing yourself around between them like all I've heard goes on with some of these aliens. Watch yourself, human, Tarak growls or I will shoot you with that foolish weapon of yours. Canny old Kenna grins. He's a bit different to those idiots you used to go around with, isn't he? I cringe. Tarak looks as if he's ready to break something. Oh, I think I like this one, Kenna remarks, before disappearing into the house. I'll put some dinner on, she calls, her voice drifting down the hall. You can all stay in the ice cubes out the back, just like you used to. Just don't be having any drunken orgies. Jeez, that was like 15 years ago, I yelp, suddenly embarrassed. And there weren't any orgies. I'd like to think I've grown up a bit since then. In my university days, I had my share of wild flings and one-night stands. I was young and foolish back then. Do human females all become insane in their old age? Tarak shakes his head. Is this the woman who raised you? Pretty much, I shrug. Ignore her. She's just trying to get a reaction out of you. She disrespected you, and she's stubborn. Tarak turns and beckons to his people, who join us on the front porch. I can understand better now why you are also stubborn. I'm not stubborn. 
You must also teach our child to be stubborn. It is a good trait. I told you, I'm not stubborn. Hmm. Let's go inside. It's getting too chilly out here for my comfort. I show our guests inside, feeling a little giddy. We enter the old house. What an odd procession we make. A Cordolian pilot, two armed-to-the-teeth guards, a lilac-haired medic, the general, and I. And my old Aunt Kenna, who is paranoid as hell, has just taken it all in her stride. But, then again, her mistrust is mainly towards humans, not aliens. I take the Cordolians straight through the house and out onto the back porch, which overlooks a small grove of orange trees between the house and the modern buildings my father built that Kenna calls the Ice Cubes. The view from the back is completely different. The front of the house is deceptively ramshackle and dry. Out here, green lawns stretch across land that curve slightly downwards, illuminated by soft lighting along the garden paths. To one side is a vegetable garden, and chickens and ducks roam around freely. The ice cubes are two sleek glass and metal structures that rise beyond the orchard. They're the twin houses that Dad built with his generous salary before he died. One was for me, the other for him. They're lit up like galleries in the darkness. The glass walls of the houses absorb energy from the sun during the day and emit it at night. The sight sends a sudden, unexpected pang of sadness through me. Dad never lived long enough to enjoy these beautiful buildings or realize his dream. He'd always wanted to turn this place into a fully functioning biotech facility, capable of engineering hyper-productive fruit trees. Tarak is gazing at the scene below, a strange look in his eyes. I wonder what he thinks about all this. Does he think I'm foolish and sentimental for wanting to come out here? Maybe the things we humans think are wonderful seem petty and insignificant to Cordolians. He speaks to his soldiers in Cordolian, and the males spread out, disappearing across the back lawn and into the darkness. We are going to check the perimeter, he says softly. The sun has all but disappeared now, and beyond the relative safety of the orchard, everything is black. Up above, the stars are impossibly clear in the night sky. Tarak leaves me on the porch, joining his soldiers, who have already slipped into the cold embrace of darkness. The chickens scatter as he walks across the orchard, a stalking black figure, silent and lethal. Then he's gone. Chapter 5 Tarak We scour the perimeter, splitting up to search for any sign of life. Anything that might indicate that we're being watched. But we find nothing. Out here, there is just sand, dirt, small, scraggly bushes, and the occasional odd earth creature. At one point, a strange, warm-blooded animal crosses my path. It has two large hind legs and a long tail, and it propels itself by jumping during all my galactic travels, I have never seen such a bizarre-looking animal. I'm sure Abby didn't consider this, but from a defensive standpoint, this area is an ideal location. There is no cover, and potential enemies would be easy to spot. Now that it's dark and the temperature has dropped, I'm infinitely more comfortable. I'm sure my soldiers feel the same. Anything out of the ordinary? I asked them through the neurocom, which I've had re-implanted behind my ear, its complex biosynthetic circuitry threading directly into my auditory nerve. It's my hidden link to the universe while I remain on Earth. But should I desire privacy, I can also turn it off when I wish, by pressing a small button. It is much more discreet and convenient than the holocom I use to talk to civilians. No, sir, they answer, 
one by one. Like me, they're first division soldiers. I have taken the liberty of recalling them from one desert and posting them in another. Just sand and rocks and bushes out here, boss. Some tasty-looking wild animals, though. Good. Set up a trip perimeter. Afterwards, you may hunt. Yes, sir. I leave them and make my way towards Dark Shadow. The flyer is camouflaged from above by nothing more than a thin holographic representation of the surrounding terrain. The hatch opens as it recognizes my biological signature. I pass through the dark interior. From the weapons cache, I retrieve a pair of Calidum longswords, two plasma guns, and a sheathed Calidum dagger that I hide in the folds of my robes. I seat myself at the controls and open up a secure communication with the rest of my First Division. Although I could talk to them non-visually through the discreet Neurocom, I want to get a visual of their situation, as I am curious to know what they're dealing with. What's your status, Kalan? The Big Gunner is my unofficial second-in-command, although the First Division consider each other to be equals. He appears on my hollow screen, his rugged face streaked with dirt. Give me a fraction of a sieve, General. We've got incoming. He's breathing heavily. I expand the hollow vision. He appears to be in some sort of stone tunnel, a narrow space with a low roof that forces Kalan to duck his head. For a Cordolian of Kalan's size, fighting in such close quarters isn't a good idea, but I mindfully hold my tongue. He appears to be in the middle of a combat situation. The First Division has been fighting the Zargek without me ever since I left them on the human mining station, and Kalan doesn't need my uninformed input at this critical moment. They're coming! I recognize Raikal's voice as it echoes down the tunnel. It's followed by a familiar chittering sound. Smoke the fuckers! Raikal yells. He's outside of my vision, so it's difficult to locate him. But I think he's farther up the tunnel. On it! Kalan yells. Get your ass out of here! He starts to run his image shaking as he takes big strides down the tunnel. Sorry, General. Just gotta take care of something first. As he reaches the end of the tunnel, he turns and pulls a heavy-duty plasma cannon from his back, hefting it over his shoulder. I rotate the vision and see a horde of juvenile Zargek larvae racing towards him. All clear? Clear! I'm gonna burn him. Do it, Kale! He activates the cannon its blue charge indicator flickering. Gonna be a bit of interference on your end, General. Stop talking and fire the fucking thing, Kalan, I growl. Sir! There's a deafening roar, and then the hollow screen goes blank as he discharges a powerful blast at the Zargek. I wait, and eventually the vision flickers back to life, accompanied by Kalan's harsh breathing. He's running down the narrow tunnel, it opens into a large cavernous area filled with stone statues that depict strange earth creatures. Indecipherable markings are etched into the walls. Some sort of religious temple, perhaps? But Kalan doesn't have time to enjoy the scenery. He sprints across the wide space, entering another narrow tunnel. I get the sense he's heading upwards. Are they underground? He pushes forward grunting with the effort, the vision becoming shaky and grainy. Although he's carrying a heavy plasma cannon on his back, he never falters. The hollow vision flashes white as Kalan bursts out of the tunnel and into the light. He rolls to the side as several of the Zargek pour out of the exit, skittering across a dune of golden sand. Some of them are missing limbs, and tendrils of smoke rise from their chitinous exoskeletons. Fucking sunlight! Kalan grunts, hefting his cannon as he activates his helm, shielding his face from the harsh, ultraviolet light. 
It is dark here, and light there. Clearly, they are on the other side of the planet. He fires again, and again the vision goes momentarily blank. When the projection is restored again, Kalan has retreated to another small tunnel, out of the blinding sunlight. He's removed his helm, and he wipes the dirt from his face. Sorry, boss, he says, his voice hoarse. Just a little infestation we had to smoke out. They've gone down into these fucking human-built tunnels and multiplied like cursed Borchik. But at least we've been able to contain them. We're just finishing off the dirty work now, cooking them underground before they can escape and infest the nearby human settlement. He shakes his head in frustration. But whenever we think we've got the last of them, another clutch of larvae appears. There's got to be a queen down there somewhere. Do you need reinforcements? Not yet. You might be interested to know that the humans are working on something they reckon is going to take care of these Zargek once and for all. Some sort of biological fix, they say. I'll believe that when I see it, I say dryly. Very well. Carry on with your strategy. But alert me if you require backup. Don't waste too much time chasing insects in the catacombs. I will have need of you soon. Got it. Once we get the queen, it's all over. Good. And Kelan? Yes, sir. I am informed that you have found yourself a human. Uh, he shifts awkwardly. Are you mated? Well, if you're mated, then you're mated, I snap. I trust you are treating her well. Kalan gapes, an expression rarely seen on his hard, battle-worn face. E yeah, she's completely nuts, but somehow it just works between us. Good. I have no doubt that my most experienced soldier will treat his female well. Then I wish you a successful hunt. Keep me informed. Always, boss. Unable to help himself, Kalon executes a fist-on-chest salute. Once military, always military. I kill the communication, and his three-dimensional image flickers out. The last thing I do is retrieve a device from inside my robes. It's the drone cam I plucked from the air when I was with Abby. The one that was following us on Nova Terra. It might be nothing but a harmless journalistic device, but I have my suspicions. Most of those cursed journalists gave up on bothering us a long time ago, after I warned them in no uncertain terms that the next footage they took would be their last. I would be surprised if any of them had ignored my warning. No. This seems to be a different type of surveillance device. I drop it into a message capsule and enter three simple commands. Dismantle. Identify. Trace. I drop the capsule into its chute and enter the destination. Silence. A press of a button is all it takes for the launch chute to fire the capsule into the sky. It will punch through the atmosphere and enter space, where it will activate its own propulsion systems and head for the warship. Once it arrives on silence, a team of technologists will carry out my bidding. Being a human-made device, it shouldn't take them long to analyze. Having completed what I set out to do, I leave the flyer and walk into the cold, clear night, carrying a small arsenal of weapons. These will be carefully hidden from view, because I do not wish to concern my mate with such trivial things. She does not need to suspect that anything is amiss. She has a much more important task ahead of her, and I do not want to burden her with unnecessary worry. Abby. As we go back indoors, I'm bowled over by two overexcited black fur balls. Hey, Nix! Hey, Zeus! I gush as the dogs swarm around me, their tails wagging. 
Nyx is a midnight black Kelpie, and Zeus is a dopey black Labrador. It's been years since we've seen each other. Nyx rears up on her hind legs, trying to put her paws on me. I bat her away, mindful of my pregnant belly. Get down, girl. Zeus makes a low, doggy sound of pleasure deep in his throat as he circles me. I reach down and pat both of them. Good boy, good girl, I say approvingly. Ziara is standing out of the way, looking wary. These are... Earth creatures? At the sound of her voice, the dogs look at her, their ears pricking up. They stare at her curiously, but make no attempt to approach her. Strange. These dogs are usually so friendly, even with strangers. They're not afraid, though. They're just wary of the unknown. Ziara stares at the dogs with a dubious expression. They have quite prominent canines. Do they not bite? I laugh. Zeus is a big old teddy bear. He won't bite anyone. Nyx hunts rabbits sometimes, but she won't bite people. Oh. Ziara elegantly brushes a stray bit of black dog fur off her impeccable white robes. With her imposing height, long slender limbs, and angular features, she looks like some sort of ethereal fairy tale elf queen. They won't bite, I reassure her. I point to her. Nixie, Zeus boy, go and say hello. Say hello to the pretty Cordolian lady. Slowly, the dogs approach Ziara, Nix going first. She nudges Ziara's hand with her nose. Give her a pat, I suggest. Tentatively, Ziara strokes the sleek fur on Nix's head. The dog closes her eyes and sits down. I think she likes you. A hint of a smile graces Ziara's dark lips. I have heard about the strange creatures on Earth. These dogs are interesting animals. Emboldened by Nix's reaction, Zeus steps forward, nudging himself under Ziara's other hand. He can't let her be the center of attention, after all. I'll leave you with these guys for a moment, I tell Ziara, as I head for the kitchen. Make yourself at home. Ziara nods, depositing herself gracefully on the couch, the dogs curling up around her feet. She looks instantly at home, a serene goddess amidst the clutter and kitsch of Kenna's living room. It occurs to me that this is her first time visiting anywhere on Earth outside of Nova Terra. Most of the time, she's been stuck on silence. I have to admire the way she takes her responsibilities seriously, but a girl needs to let her hair down once in a while. One of these days, a shopping trip to Telluria might be in order. In the kitchen, Kenna is busy chopping carrots. The rich, meaty aroma of goat stew surrounds me as I sneak up on her. I don't understand why you don't just get a kitchen bot like everyone else, I grumble, stealing a piece of carrot and popping it in my mouth. It's crisp and flavorsome, unlike the mass-produced recombinant chunks that so often pass for vegetables these days. Kenna turns, grinning. You kids and your automatic lives, she says. You forget that some of us grew up in a time of war, and we had to actually do things for ourselves. She chops another carrot with a vengeance. Manufactured things just don't taste the same, and Jupiter knows what kinds of chemicals they put in them, getting you kids hooked for life. She slides the carrot piece into a huge steel pot that's bubbling away on an old-fashioned electric stove. Addictive chemicals? Unable to help myself, I chomp on another bit of carrot. You and your conspiracy theories. I eat that stuff all the time, and I'm fine, aren't I? You tell me. Kenna stirs the pot, tendrils of steam rising from it. She's wearing a faded blue apron, and her face is slick with a faint sheen of sweat. So, my girl, she says, changing the subject, this boy of yours, what does he do for a living? You haven't been watching the networks at all, have you, Auntie? I don't have time for propaganda. But you know about Cordolians, right? Hmm. What have I heard? 
that they're predatory aliens, hell-bent on colonizing the universe? You know thy said that about the Veen when thy first came to Earth, and thy turned out all right. From what I've seen so far, your boy treats you just fine. And what makes you so sure about that? Well, I was being downright offensive when we first met, and he didn't lift a finger against me. And when you tipped my gun barrel down, he was ready to step between us. He respects you, but he's protective. He'll tolerate your human eccentricities, but when you're in real danger, he'll ignore everything and follow his instincts to protect you. Oh, I like that. You can tell all that just from a brief interaction? I was testing him. Kenna's grin turns wolfish. And I know that you're smart enough, girl. You're not going to bring just anybody home to meet me. Not after what happened the last time. That was fifteen years ago. Exasperated, I munch on another bit of carrot. I was a teenager. Questionable decision-making skills were part of the territory back then. I'm older now. I've been to space and back. I've been to hell and back. You wouldn't believe the things that have happened to me since then, I add quietly. And now you've got a bun in the oven. Damn right! I pat my belly as little monster flutters about. She is full of beans. She never stops moving. I can't imagine what she's going to be like when she's a toddler. Big Bad is going to have his hands full. And this boy. You're sure he's going to stick around? He has a name, Kenna. It's Tarak. And he sticks to his word. He's not going to drag you off to some distant planet, is he? I laugh. Been there, done that. No, we're not going back to Kithia in this lifetime. Good. Kenna grabs a spoon and tastes the stew. She makes a face and adds a sprinkling of salt. I look inside the pot and see a rich gravy with chunks of sweet potato, carrot, and celery floating about. That looks and smells incredible. I sigh, my stomach rumbling. It's too bad Cordolians don't eat vegetables. Kenna stares at me in disbelief. What did I eat, then? They're carnivores, meat-eaters. With those fangs, it figures. I'll have to go and get more meat from the deep freeze, Kenna grumbles. She starts to untie her apron. Watch this do. I put a hand on her shoulder. Relax. Those boys are more than capable of looking after themselves. You've already done enough. Oh, I can't have guests trying to feed themselves, she protests, clearly uncomfortable with the notion. I said, relax. My tone becomes firmer. I'll handle it. You're not going to go to all the effort of making another dish. What about your arthritis? Kenna opens her mouth to protest. I hold up a hand. You're the most independent person I know, but I don't expect you to look after a bunch of fully grown Cordolian males. I'll handle them. Kenna scrutinizes me for a moment. Unexpectedly, she laughs. What? Look at you, waddling around like a fat duck and still trying to be responsible for a pack of Cordolian warriors. I know how you get, girl. Her harsh features soften. Mike, sure you put your feet up for the next few weeks and rest. When the baby comes, you'll be forgetting what the word rest even means. Mike, sure that Cordolian of yours is at your beck and call, and not making excuses to run off to some distant galaxy or spend long hours at work. When your maid is in charge of half an army, that's a bit much to demand. But Kenna has a point. I'll try, I say unconvincingly. I've never been one to sit back and put my feet up, but maybe I need to. Over the past few weeks, I've started to get these terrible backaches when I stand for too long. I blame the ever-growing little one inside me. The sound of raised voices alerts me that Tarak and his crew have returned. I leave Kenna to the cooking. I'm claiming that stew for myself, I inform her. It's been years since I've had wholesome, home-cooked food that hasn't come from a kitchen bot. 
So, don't feed the rest to the dogs, because I'll eat the leftovers. Kenna grunts, but a slight smile cracks her weathered features. I return to the living room to find four big Cordolians and one female medic lounging around on Kenna's worn sofas. The dogs have hidden beneath the dining table. They're cowering and whimpering. Tarak is reclining in a floral-winged armchair, his booted feet resting on a green velvet ottoman. There are strange creatures in your house, he says flatly. The dogs whimper again. They're terrified of him. They're pets. Stop scaring them. The creatures just know their place, he replies. They are well trained. Nix and Zeus look at me balefully, their ears flat against their skulls, their tails tucked underneath their bodies. Poor babies. I try to soothe them in my most placating voice. Don't be scared of the alien. He's not as bad as he looks. Tarak glares at me. His subordinates are politely looking in the other direction. Ziara is trying to conceal a smirk. Nix and Zeus look as if they're about to bolt out the back door at warp speed. When I unconsciously put a hand to my stiff lower back and stretch, Tarak rises silently and fluidly from his seat to be by my side, his eyes full of concern. You need to rest, he says quietly, echoing my aunt. The dogs fly out of the room, becoming twin black streaks as they disappear into the night. Chapter 6 Tarak After Abby has fed, I take her across the green lawns to one of the twin houses out the back. They are sleek structures, relatively modern for Earth, and entirely different to the dilapidated collection of buildings at the front. I offer to carry her, but she refuses, telling me not to be ridiculous. I don't understand why I should not carry you, I complain, as we reach the first building. Abby touches her palm to a panel, and the doors slide open. We step into an entrance hall lined with glass walls that glow softly against the darkness. To my relief, they are opaque. We cannot be seen from the outside. The entrance opens into a spacious living area divided by a central courtyard. A single twisted tree grows out of the ground, which is covered with small grey stones. It is a strangely opulent space. By the time we reach the second level, she is slightly bent over, clutching at her back. She's in pain but she tries to hide it with a smile. Unable to take it any longer, I scoop her up and lay her gently on the bed. Her relieved sigh doesn't escape my notice. I put some pillows behind her, and she leans back, her brown hair fanning across the white fabric. I inspect her carefully, noting that her ankles and feet are swollen. You've been on your feet for too long, I growl, more annoyed with myself for not noticing earlier. Why don't you ever say anything when you're uncomfortable? It honestly didn't occur to me to say anything, she says, putting her hands behind her head. I thought this stuff was normal in pregnancy. Besides, this is nothing compared to what I'm going to have to put up with during childbirth. And don't forget that you're going to be right next to me for every sweaty, painful, messy, profanity-laden minute of it. I am? I blink. On Kithia, birthing is a strictly female affair. The thought of witnessing such a thing seems more daunting than fighting a horde of vicious Zargek or battling fanatical soldiers from the old Cordolian Empire. Of course you are. She unties the belt at her waist, allowing the folds of her gray garment to loosen. Her body is swollen and ripe, tempting me even when she is supposed to rest. Her scent is all around me, her female essence mingling with the fragrant stuff she uses to wash her hair. 
I sit down by her side and take a moment to watch her. I watch the rise and fall of her chest, admiring her full breasts, which strain against the garment that holds them. I can see the twin points of her nipples through the fabric. Her body is undergoing remarkable changes. She closes her eyes for just a moment, and the weariness falls away from her features, leaving her with an innocent expression. It is quieter here than on the island we left behind, where the rush of passing traffic and the roar of the ocean would reach my ears in the night. I can hear her heartbeat. I can hear my child's heartbeat. Those twin sounds merge into a single, sublime rhythm. It is a sound more precious to me than anything else in the entire universe. As I watch her, the pounding of her strong, steady heart becomes faster, and she opens her eyes. A flush has spread across her cheeks, and her dark pupils are dilated. She's aroused again. I can smell it on her. But she's supposed to be tired. I am torn. Normally I wouldn't hesitate to respond and take what is mine. My cock is hard, and my desire for her knows no bounds. And she knows very well that I'm not one to hold back, ever. But she has been in discomfort all day, and she needs rest. What am I supposed to do now? This kind of indecision is completely new to me. You could start by giving me a massage, she says, her voice low and sultry. A massage? One of the quickest ways to a woman's heart, she quips. I try to recall the training I received on Kithia as a youth. The time I spent under the tuition of a sendar, a scholar of female pleasure, was brief compared to the extensive training undertaken by some Cordolian males, especially those who wished to be taken into a noble house. But I did receive basic lessons on how to manipulate flesh for pleasure and the relief of aches. Undress and sit before me, I tell her. I do like it when you order me around like that, General, she says teasingly. She sits forward and slips the dress over her shoulders and tosses it aside, leaving her clad in only her undergarments. I lay my hands on her stomach, feeling the life within as it moves about. Soon we will have to discuss names. I maneuver so that she's sitting in front of me with her legs crossed. I run my fingers over the notches of her spine, unclasping her bra. Ah, oh, you have no idea how good it feels to get rid of that, she sighs as she throws the offending garment across the floor. Yes, I whisper in her ear. Beautiful things should not be restrained. I trace down the curve of her spine, appreciating the smoothness of her golden flesh. Her skin is lighter in the places where the sun hasn't kissed it. The rest is a darker shade of pale. I press my palms against the small of her back. Is this where it hurts? She grabs my hand and guides it lower. Here. I knead her skin gently with both of my thumbs. Here. Oh, yeah. That's the spot. She groans with pleasure. Also, here. I go a little lower, pressing over her sacral area, massaging her soft skin. Her warmth radiates through to my fingers. Yes. She moans, and here I move my fingers up again, pressing the muscles on either side of her spine. Especially there, 
She sighs. You are tense, I inform her, applying gentle pressure over her stiff points, working at the knots in her muscles. You seem to be solving that problem pretty quickly, she mumbles, throwing her head back and closing her eyes. Why didn't you tell me you had such talented hands, General? Did you not know that already, female? My voice is a low rumble, thick and heavy with lust. Her pleasurable moans are driving me to the edge of control. Oh, she moans, arching her back. That feels good. I lean in and inhale her complex scent, planting my lips on the soft skin at the base of her neck. Her scent is earthy and warm and undeniably female. I taste her slowly, tracing my tongue over her skin as I knead the soft flesh of her lower back with both hands. Her stiff muscles are starting to yield to my touch. "'loosening under my fingers. "'Is that better?' "'I trail soft kisses up her neck, "'sucking on her skin, "'moving over the angle of her jaw to her earlobe, "'which I take between my lips. "'She shudders. "'A hundred times better. "'You should have told me sooner,' "'I chide gently, "'rubbing her back, as she leans against me. I'm rather pleased with my efforts, but I'm finding it harder to concentrate on the task. Her pleasurable moans are driving me to distraction. My erection strains against the fabric of my trousers. I don't know if I can stay in control for much longer. I pause, trailing kisses back down her neck resting my lips at the point where that large artery pulses, feeling and listening to her hammering heart. I inhale deeply, tasting her sweet, salty skin, smelling her, feeling her, my hands caressing her back, my lips pressed against her wildly beating pulse. All of this is mine. You, my silver menace, are dangerous, she rasps, her voice high-pitched and breathless. I thought this was going to be a simple therapeutic massage. What did you think was going to happen? As I pull her closer to me, my cock brushes against her, letting her know in no uncertain terms what I want. You knew from the start that I was dangerous. She laughs, a low, sexy sound. Yeah, I knew that. She wiggles her ass, moving even closer, brushing against my erection. You're so dangerous you can give me a back massage that almost makes me orgasm. Oh? You know I'm horny as hell these days. I've noticed, I say dryly, although the way she says it, in that mesmerizing, throaty voice, makes me hunger for her even more. Would you like me to help you finish? You know what? Keep your hands down there, on my back. They're doing wonders. Are you sure? I'm mildly surprised that she would refuse such an offer. Just keep doing what you're doing with that massage. It's exactly what I need. Hmm. I press my thumbs into her back, rubbing against her tender muscles. I'm not entirely satisfied with her response to my offer. Did I not please her enough last time? She starts to moan, tipping her head back onto my shoulder. Her eyes are closed, her lips slightly, slightly parted. 
She's doing something down there, with her hand. I look over her shoulder, but I can't see past the swell of her belly. Are you pleasuring yourself, my love? You silver devil. Your massage is so good that all I needed was a little extra touch, she manages to say, between deep, gasping breaths. Oh, oh she pants, her back becoming slick with sweat. The thought of Abby touching herself makes me tremble with need. I'm on the verge of turning her over and claiming her for myself. Uh, uh, she cries, her voice rising an octave. Her entire body sways as she nears her climax. I reach around and cup my hands over her breasts, caressing her hard, engorged nipples. My touch tips her over the edge, and she comes in my arms, digging her heels into the bed and pressing her body against mine. Oh, Tarek, she gasps, voicing her pleasure as her body writhes. There is nothing quite as arousing as having your female pleasure herself to the point of climax, right in your very arms. The orgasm runs its course, leaving her breathless. She collapses against me with a contented sigh. My erection is still pressing into her back. You never fail to have that effect on me, she murmurs. But obviously, we aren't done yet. Let me see you. She runs a hand over the sleeve of my robe. One of us still has his clothes on. That can easily be taken care of, I rumble, as I gently lay her down and stand, preparing to undress. Abby A small, lustful cry escapes me as I appreciate Tarak and all of his naked glory. Is this better? He stalks towards me, his body shimmering in the soft glow that radiates from the opaque solar cell walls. His red eyes consume me. His lips are slightly parted, revealing the points of his fangs. A sense of carefully restrained power radiates from him. He's lean and muscled, his body sculpted by years of combat. His cock is massive and erect a trace of moisture beating at its tip. I sit up as he comes to stand in front of me. I'm completely naked now, save for the little blue starfish stuck to my belly. Its pulsating glow tells me my baby is content. The terrible ache in my back has magically disappeared. I take Tarek's cock into my hand, feeling its hard, ridged length as I curl my fingers around it. As I pump it slowly, he slips his fingers into my mouth, and I suck on them. Unlike humans, Cordolians have completely smooth fingertips, devoid of lines and whorls, but Tarax are marked here and there with calluses. They're the hidden marks of violence. His hands have been shaped and scarred by the weapons he holds. I know he has dark claws hidden beneath his black fingernails, but he keeps them retracted at all times. Cordolians are such a fascinating species. My tongue glides over his fingers as he hooks his thumb under my jaw, tilting my face upwards. He watches me, his gaze roaming over my breasts and my rounded stomach. I increase the pressure around his cock, moving my hand up and down, holding him tighter, going faster. A low growl issues from deep within his throat. His other hand is on my head, his fingers twining through my hair, caressing my scalp, pulling my head back, forcing me to look into his eyes. I lose myself in those crimson depths. He exhales and closes his eyes, shuddering a little, a low groan escaping him. His eyelids flutter, 
his eyelashes starkly white against the silver gray of his skin. He's so damn ethereal looking, with his angular features, sharp cheekbones, and pointed ears. Sometimes, I just can't believe that this fierce, dangerous, otherworldly creature is all mine. What an insane fantasy this is. He brings me back to Earth by opening his eyes and putting his large hands on my shoulders. I'm still holding and stroking his cock, my fingers moistened by his pre-cum. On to your side, he whispers as I lay down on the bed. I curl up in the fetal position, cradling my belly, the life inside me moving reassuringly. The starfish glows blue, flaring bright, then dim, echoing my mood. I'm content, cocooned, and aroused. Tarak slides in behind me, one powerful leg hooking over mine, his strong arms curling around me. He places his hands on my swollen belly, and little monster kicks, as if she's saying hello to Daddy. His cock is right up against me, and with a single thrust, he enters me, his ridged shaft parting the moist folds of my pussy from behind, filling me with the most wonderful, all-consuming sensation. He wraps himself around me, huge and warm, and starts to fuck me slowly. His hands caress my pregnant belly. He's tender and careful as he moves his hips back and forth. I lean into him, surrounded by his scent and his warmth. I turn my head, and he captures my lips, his long tongue exploring my mouth, tasting me. He nips at my lower lip with his fangs, drawing out the faintest trace of blood. A coppery tang fills my mouth, mingling with his unique, salty taste. I close my eyes and allow myself to be totally consumed by him. He makes love slowly, as if we've got all the time in the world. My body is consumed by a slow-burning fire, responding to every thrust and every caress as I surrender the last of my self-control. I'm entirely his. My senses are stretched taut, and I become aware of everything all at once. The sensation of his hard body pressing against mine, warm and strong. The feel of his lips on mine, possessive and wanting. The comforting caress of his hands on my stomach, gentle and protective. The soft, steady sound of his breathing, in tune with mine. The beat of his heart, deep and primal and unwavering. The sheer size of him, stretching me, overwhelming me, driving me yet again to the brink. It's not fair. It's almost too easy for him to send me spiraling into bliss. Waves of sensation begin in my core, fanning outwards, becoming stronger more powerful, reverberating through my curled-up body. Whenever we reach this place, time stops. The entire fucking universe stops, and it's just the two of us. The orgasm takes me by surprise, rippling through me and sending me to heaven. His deep chuckle underscores my soft, high-pitched gasps. All the while, he continues to fuck me. And the climax builds again, then releases. Sweet heaven and hell, this is just too much. My swollen, bloated, tender body is a quivering, erogenous mess. As soon as this little one has been born, I may consider getting knocked up again, if it's going to be like this. He takes his time going deep, bringing his hands up to my breasts, fondling my nipples. I never knew my boobs could be this sensitive, giving me so much pleasure, even when they're sore as hell. Almost imperceptibly, 
he increases the intensity and speed of his thrusts, taking the greatest care with my body. He's rough where he needs to be, and gentle where he needs to be, and all I can do is lie on my side and go along for the ride. He groans with pleasure, a rich, animalistic sound. His muscular legs have captured mine, and he bends them, bringing my knees close to my belly. I'm wrapped up like a neat little present. He's claimed me in both body and soul. His hands go to my hips, sliding appreciatively over my generous flesh as he plunges deep and comes, crying out as he ejaculates. I sigh as he holds me close, breathing in my scent. And as he wraps his body around me, I drift into sleep, floating amongst the stars. Tarak I permit myself to indulge in a half-sleep, with Abby curled up against me, listening with great pleasure to the twin rhythms coming from her body. But I can't relax completely in this unguarded, unknown location. Although Earth is a relatively safe planet, especially with silence guarding it from space, I can't afford to become complacent. I'm highly tempted to bring in several divisions of my soldiers to guard this place, but that would only alarm Abby and cause a potential flashpoint with the humans, jeopardizing the treaties Alekian has worked so hard to establish. The presence of a few soldiers will not concern them, but entire divisions? I do not wish to cause conflict for conflict's sake. However, I need to remain vigilant. Back on Nova Terra, someone was following us. First there was the drone cam, then the spy on the roof. Something is not right. I'm too battle-weary and cynical to give in to wishful thinking and hope it was just a harmless human journalist. Things are rarely that simple. Outside it is still dark. With great care I disentangle myself from her. I cover her with a blanket, pulling it over her bare shoulders, tucking it beneath her feet. She remains asleep, a look of contentment on her face. I want her to feel this way always. I move downstairs on silent feet, leaving my discarded garments upstairs. The only thing I take with me is my sheathed calidum dagger. I'm entirely naked, but that doesn't matter, because I throw out a silent mental command, activating the nanoparticles that lie dormant in my bloodstream. Pain rips through every part of my body as the nanites swarm through muscle and sinew, appearing on the surface of my skin as tiny black dots at first. The dots mesh together to form an impenetrable network of armor that covers my entire body from neck to toe. Because the nanites are fluid, my armor has extreme flexibility. The calidum particles fuse to the nanites make it impossibly strong and lightweight. It's the perfect defensive armor, turning my body into a weapon. It is possibly one of the single most advanced feats of technology in the known universe. I enter the small courtyard in the center of the house, the gravel crunching slightly underfoot, as I identify a metal pipe that seems to serve the purpose of collecting water from the roof. I take two rapid steps, grabbing onto the pipe as I propel myself up the wall with quick vertical steps, my exo-armor enhancing my movements. I land on the roof and gaze out at the landscape below. The land is flat and barren. We're on a slight hill. Aside from the odd collection of buildings that make up the human residence, there is nothing for as far as the eye can see. My soldiers are out there in the darkness, keeping watch. They will take turns to rest, using dark shadow as their quarters. 
they were more than happy to be excused to explore and hunt the strange jumping animals that seemed to inhabit this environment in large numbers. Ziara has taken the building adjacent to us as her quarters. I'm relieved that Abby now has proper medical support as the time of the birthing draws near. Walking to the side of the building, I peer over the edge, identifying the camouflaged places below where I've stashed my weapons. With nothing more to do, I sit on the edge of the roof and wait, feeling at home in the darkness. Chapter 7 Abby The incessant ringing of my link band pulls me from sleep. Ugh, what time is it? I rub my bleary eyes and sit up. The solar cell walls have gone dim, and the room is shrouded in darkness. And it's freezing. I forgot to turn on the heaters. 6.31 a.m., you have an unidentified call. The link band's neutral female voice helps me out. Tarak isn't here. That's why I'm feeling so damn cold right now. Answer or decline. Will you answer or decline? Do you want a visual? I groan. Who would be calling me this fucking early in the morning? Someone in a different time zone, obviously. Maybe it's someone on Novaterra. Maybe it's someone from the hospital wanting to talk about test results. Answer it, I command, quickly trying to clear the sleep from my voice. I look around, but it's too dark to see anything clearly. No visual. I can't do a visual call right now. I'm not wearing anything. Where the hell is Tarak? Miss Kendricks, this is Dr. Asher. The doctor's familiar voice echoes through the speaker. For some reason, she's speaking English instead of the standard universal. I'm sorry to call you on this number, but we've tried to get in touch with you numerous times now. The housemaster of the diplomatic zone tells me you left the residence yesterday. What's this about, Lorelei? I sit upright, activating the lights with a click of my fingers. I don't see how that has anything to do with you. What do you want? After what happened at the hospital, the time for niceties is over. I'm not afraid to be blunt with her. I'm just following up after our discussion at the hospital. You seemed quite stressed out, and I wanted to make sure you'd had enough time to make the right decision. Of course I've made the right decision. Even if you have the best of intentions, I'm not dealing with anyone who works for Syncorp. Are you sure you're not under some kind of... duress? Lorelei attempts, not very successfully, to sound sympathetic. What are you trying to suggest? I'll be frank with you. We all know that Cordolians have quite a... a... Reputation, and I just wanted to make sure that you haven't been intimidated in any way, that you haven't been forced into doing things against your will. I blink as my foggy brain tries to process what she's saying. The gall of this lady is unbelievable. You're making a lot of assumptions, doctor, I say quietly. I don't think I have anything more to say to you. I know you have a lot on your plate right now, but you need to try and approach this rationally. Rationally? My voice turns sharp, conveying my anger. Did you call me at this ridiculous hour just so you could patronize me? Please, doctor, let's just agree to terminate the call now and not take this any further. From now on, I'll be seeking an alternative care provider. I thought I already made that clear. Miss Kendricks, I would strongly suggest you reconsider your position. If you're incapable of making decisions that are in the best interests of your unborn child, we may be forced to report you to the ICPA. The International Child Protection Agency? I scoff. The baby isn't even born yet. Are you that desperate to get your hands on its genetic material? 
Don't you dare try to manipulate this situation, Lorelai. You have no idea what you're messing with. Are you threatening me, Miss Kendricks? Her voice has risen in pitch. No, I say mildly. I'm just telling you how it is. There's no way I'm letting my child have anything to do with Syncorp. And I'm the nice one. Trust me, you do not want her father to know that this call ever took place. So if you'll promise to leave us alone and never contact me on this number again, I'll do you a giant favor and keep this strictly between the two of us. I'm afraid company policy states that... I cut her off. Forget it, doctor. I know how these corporations work. And trust me, whatever recognition you think you'll be getting by following the rules won't be worth the fallout you'll get if you try to fuck with me and my baby. Don't you think you're overreacting a little, Miss Kendricks? She regains her composure. She's trying awfully hard to sound like she's being the reasonable one. I'm not going to be drawn into that kind of argument, Dr. Asher. Goodbye. I terminate the call before she can say anything else. I've already given her too much airtime. With a sigh, I close my eyes and take a deep breath. There's something about this conversation that's made me so freaking angry. I feel as if I might explode, and it's not just because I'm hormonal. I know what's making me so angry. It's because the good doctor even dared suggest she might try and separate me from my child. That didn't go down well at all. She's just lucky Tarak's not around right now. He's the type who would wage war over something like this. Little Monster is back to her usual bubbly self, moving around inside me. As I put my hands on my belly and lie back, my anger starts to dissolve, my mind becoming clear. I trace my fingers over the glowing blue starfish, a little amazed that it hasn't fallen off during sex. Curiously, I try to pull it off, but it's stuck fast. It's almost as if it's burrowed in, becoming an extension of my skin. Weird. The old me would have been freaking out by now, but I've just spent six months in space, cooped up on board a Cordolian warship as we escaped from a terrifying dark planet called Kithia. Nothing much can surprise me anymore. At least the star's blue and glowing. Ziara said that was a good sign. If it turns purple, it's a warning. If it's pink or red, the baby's in trouble. It's connected to a monitoring device that Ziara carries with her. That's also reassuring. I'm no clairvoyant or telepath, but based on dates, I'm giving it about six weeks until I hatch this daughter of mine. A thrill of excitement courses through me. It's the first time a human and a Cordolian have mated, and no one has any idea what the baby will look like. Will she be silver or human-toned? Will she have my eyes or Tarax or some combination of both? Will she grow horns and fangs? So many questions. I can't wait to meet her. Speaking of Daddy, where has he gone? I gather a thick blanket around me and head downstairs, the synthetic floor icy cold underfoot. Lights, I say, and the downstairs area comes to life. The solar cell windows, which turn opaque at night, have gone back to clear in preparation for the coming day. They emit a gentle light through which I can see the landscape outside. The sun is starting to creep over the horizon a faint orange glow breaking through the darkness. Tarak, I call, my voice echoing through the empty space. It's cold down here. I shiver, adjusting the blanket around me. Underneath, I'm stark naked. A sense of unease fills me. I don't know if it's the darkness or the ancient primeval stillness of the desert, but suddenly I feel very alone. Where is my lethal alien when I need him? I suddenly wish I had the black calidum dagger Tarak had given me as a present once upon a time, when we were traveling to the dark planet. But, silly me, I left it back on silence, 
thinking I wouldn't need it anymore. Realistically, I'm not going to be able to do any serious damage to anyone who can walk faster than a duck. Not right now. Not in this blimp-like state. That's what Tarak is for. But I would feel better with some sort of weapon around. A lone bird cries out, making me jump. I shake my head, telling myself not to be stupid. We're out in the middle of nowhere, in a place that has no connectivity and isn't on any of the modern maps. Aside from myself and a few Cordolians, who the hell would be crazy enough to come out here? Still, Lorelei's call has unnerved me. I grab a glass of water from the kitchen and step out onto the front deck, bracing against the chill. The sky is becoming lighter as blackness gives way to deep purple, shot through with the fiery red and orange of the rising sun. A chorus of birdsong pierces the still morning air, and I take a deep breath. The air is crisp and cold, and my breath mists as it escapes my mouth. Out here, it's peaceful. I lean against the balcony railing, glass in hand trying to forget my irrational fear. There's nothing quite like sunrise in the desert. Thank Jupiter there are still some tranquil places on Earth. Nova Terra was sterile and strange, and had me constantly on edge. With Tarak going back and forth into space, and the First Division soldiers acting as my silent shadows, I could never quite relax. I take a sip of water and promptly spit it out again as a shadow drops from the roof. Said shadow puts a hand on the railing and jumps over it, soundlessly landing on the deck. What are you doing out here, dressed in only that? Tarak glowers at me as I will my pounding heart to slow. You don't even have footwear, he says disapprovingly. This temperature is uncomfortable for humans. General, I scold, are you trying to give me a freaking heart attack? How many times have I told you not to sneak? I squeal as he sweeps me up into his arms, blanket and all. The glass drops from my hand and rolls around on the deck. Thank goodness it's artificial glass. We're soaked in orange now as the rays of the early morning sun burst over the horizon. Tarak squints, not liking the sunlight. He stares back across the orchard, his attention drawn to something in the distance. What are you staring at, old woman? His deep, commanding voice splits the stillness as he bellows at some unseen figure. I'm feeding the chooks, boy, Kenna yells back. Some of us have to work to keep this place up and running. I cringe. My partial state of undress suddenly has me feeling very self-conscious. Let's go inside, I whisper to Tarak, wishing I could curl into a little ball and pull the blanket over my head. If you're going to muck about with each other, do it inside, my aunt yells, her cranky voice echoing through the silence. Where's your sense of responsibility, boy? She'll get a chill if you stay out there for too long. Humph. Tarak turns and steps inside, his ears twitching. Disagreeable old crone he mutters under his breath. I'm pretty sure my cheeks are flaming red with embarrassment right now. Are you not comfortable, Amina? What? I'm actually very comfortable in his arms. He carries me about as if I'm as light as a feather, even in my current state. I'm fine. Then why do you have that look? What look? You wear the human expression of shame. Oh, do I? I shake my head, slightly flustered. Well, it's not every day that the woman who wiped your two-year-old ass catches you in the arms of your lover. Tarak looks bemused. Mating and relationships are a part of life, he says, as if it's the most obvious and natural thing in the world. There is nothing to feel embarrassed about. I know that. It's just... It's hard to explain, but it's a... Human thing. He completes my sentence. Yeah, 
I laugh as he sets me down. I think you're finally starting to understand. I will never understand humans, he says flatly. Complicated, contradictory, emotional, unpredictable creatures that you are. A smile curves his lips. You especially. Wait a minute. My jaw drops as I look down. He's completely naked. Stark fucking naked. How did I not notice this before? I swear he was fully dressed when he dropped from the roof. There's no way he was walking around out there, naked, in full view of everyone. I know Cordolian males aren't shy when it comes to showing off their manly bits, but geez, this is Earth, not Kithia. That means he'd drawn on his freaky exo-armor before, sneakily retracting it while he was holding me in his arms, hoping to distract me with his nakedness. A cunning plan, but I know him too well. Tarak, I say slowly, resisting the urge to ogle him. I could lay on the couch and watch him all day and never get anything done. What are you up to? What? He tries his best to look innocent and fails miserably. You were creeping around on the roof in the early hours of the morning in your battle suit. I was surveying the area. There is nothing for you to be concerned about. He manages to look slightly affronted. I was not creeping. He's secretive at the best of times, and I suspect I don't know even a quarter of the various plots and projects he has going on at any one time. But right now, I get the feeling he's up to something. That's what happens when your mate is a renegade general from an evil empire. What's going on, Acadian? I try again, even though I know it's futile. Getting information out of him when he's in cryptic Cordolian general mode is like praying for snow in the desert. As if to sabotage my information-gathering attempts further, my stomach growls loudly. You are hungry. Tarak leaps at the opportunity to change subject. You must take nourishment. I will go and ask the old crone to prepare something for you. I can't deny that I'm starving. Pregnancy and serial orgasms can really take it out of a girl. Hmm. I regard him with a narrowed gaze, pulling the blanket tighter around me. I know she's eye-wateringly blunt, but that old woman fed me and put me through school, so I won't have you calling her Old Crone. Tarak growls in irritation. Very well, but only because you requested it. It's a start. Baby steps, Abby. I remind myself that this is a man who's used to being obeyed without question. He's never had any time to learn social skills, let alone human etiquette. And my aunt isn't the most welcoming type, either. My stomach rumbles again, louder this time. He's standing overwhelmingly close, looking down at me. Heat surges between my legs as I move closer to him, my body acting automatically. Seconds later, my brain kicks in, and I realize he's smiling. He gently strokes the back of my neck as I lean into him, sending shivers of pleasure down my spine. Wrapped in my blanket, standing next to my naked cordolian, I feel impossibly safe. He touches my belly his powerful arms curving around us. Our baby is quiet now, resting contently. As for me, well, now I'm terribly aroused, and from the, uh, feel of things down there, so is he. Damn him, forcing me to choose between food and sex. I've been reduced to my most basic, primal urges, and it's amazing. If only life were always this simple. Chapter 8 Tarak One and a half quants, or two earth weeks, since we arrived in this remote, barren place, 
and Abby has convinced me we need to travel to the nearest settlement, a place called Telluria. Apparently we are to travel on something called a land vehicle, an ancient cumbersome thing that has sat unused in the old woman's storage house for far too long. The land vehicle is a primitive thing, constructed of metal and various polymers. I study it dubiously, wondering how such a cumbersome-looking vehicle can traverse the unsurfaced terrain. There is a large wheel at the front that I assume is the steering device. The body is rigid and heavy, and for reasons I cannot understand, there is a complete lack of any kind of roof. It sits on four unstable-looking wheels, giant inflated things that elevate the vehicle to an impractical height. The engine is in the front, covered by an array of panels that harvest and convert solar energy. You are not driving, I tell Abby with absolute certainty. Not when you are heavy with child. But you don't know how to drive a terrain vehicle, she protests. Don't worry. I've been driving these things since I was twelve. I'll be fine. You will not fit in that seat. I so will fit in that seat. No, Abby. Just no. I cross my arms, glaring at her in exasperation. What if we were to hit something? We're in the middle of the desert. There's nothing to hit. Her jaw is set at a stubborn angle. She glares back at me, her chin tilted upwards, her lips pressed together. I almost find myself giving in. She makes me want to yield. She challenges me in a way no one else can, in a way no one else would dare. I rather like it. But this is about safety, so I will not give in. Her stance softens. Look, if you knew how to drive that thing, I'd let you get in the driver's seat right now. But you don't, so it's up to me. I look at the silly vehicle disdainfully. I have not yet encountered a single vehicle in the entire universe that I can't master. You're just saying that. Oh, try me. I bear my fangs. I will wager you I can master this thing before you finish fastening your safety restraint. You want to bet? She says flatly. So, what are we betting, General? I stare at her lustfully. She's wearing the cash can I bought for her. It drapes nicely over her ripe body, accentuating her curves. Her lush hair is arranged on top of her head, wrapped in a blue scarf. Her pale neck, bare and elegant. Like me, she wears dark glasses that conceal her eyes. I look her up and down. I will determine the price when I win, I say slowly. That's still a very big if, Tarak, she retorts. Go on, then. I'm looking forward to seeing you fall off your high horse for once. I have no idea what she's talking about, but she's smiling. At least she is amused. I turn and signal to my soldiers and Ziara, who are seated under a lone tree out of the harsh sun. Come. They lope towards the vehicle, jumping into the back. I offer Ziara the front seat beside Abby who is sitting between us. Keep an eye on her, I tell the medic. Zayara nods coolly, her face concealed by a light scarf, protecting her from the sun. It is affecting all of us, except Abby. She seems to be enjoying it. My soldiers have also covered their faces and hidden their eyes, unused to Earth's unique climate. I am the only Cordolian foolish enough to face the morning sun. Even I won't last long before the light from that infernal star starts to burn my skin. At least in my case, the nanites are constantly repairing the damage. 
but I still find the sensation irritating. I wrap the soft black scarf around my face, my skin finding instant relief from the burn. I take the driver's seat. Sitting beside me, Abby presses her palm to some sort of ignition panel. The vehicle roars to life. I'll admit, there seems to be power under that ungainly solar cell hood. There are two pedals underfoot. I assume one is for acceleration, and the other is for braking. I tap one experimentally, and the vehicle lurches forward, eliciting a gasp from Abby as she grips my arm tightly. That is the accelerator. The other is the brake. I press the brake, and the vehicle slows. Accelerator. Brake. Simple. The vehicle's motion becomes smoother as I familiarize myself with the controls, driving it with ease. It's actually ridiculously simple. I glance at my mate, feeling more than a little smug. As I said, my reward shall be determined later. You're going the wrong way, she says dryly, before I have time to savor my victory. I've fought many battles, but these kinds of victories are the sweetest. You didn't tell me what direction we were supposed to take. My ears twitch under the scarf. Teloria is south of here. She points to a mapping system on the control panel. See? I swing the vehicle around. And remind me again, why is it so important that we go to Teluria? We have been living on the remote property for the equivalent of two Earth weeks now, without incident. After much arguing and protesting, I have finally allowed her to make this trip, although it doesn't sit well with me. Why could we not just use Dark Shadow to go there? We need to buy baby stuff. Clothes, toys, booties, diapers. And Tellurri is huge. You can't just land on the outskirts and walk all over town. Trust me, the outer ring is a mess. Diapers? I have no idea what she's going on about. She laughs. A sinister sound that has me instantly on edge. Oh, you'll learn about diapers, Daddy. Trust me, you'll learn quick. Abby Our trip to Teluria is relatively uneventful, considering I'm sitting in a vehicle full of Cordolians, my own personal military entourage. At first, Tarak absolutely refused to let me go into town. It took me two weeks to convince him. After our last argument, he finally agreed, on the condition that we all go together. So, I have an armed guard consisting of himself and three large Cordolian males, and Ziara, who's also probably packing something. I'm sure they have all sorts of weapons concealed under their plain Cordolian robes. What does he think might happen? An abduction attempt? On Earth, such things are unheard of. With our rugged terrain vehicle towering above the stream of bot cars, one would think we'd stand out, but most people don't give us a second glance, because Tellurians are used to strange things. Telluria Skyport is Earth's main entry point for alien traffic, and the locals here have seen it all before. Telluria is a trade town. Vast sums of money pass through here, giving rise to all kinds of activity, both legal and illegal. The locals are a diverse, eclectic mix of humans and various aliens who have ended up making Earth their home. Some of the aliens come here willingly. Some are left behind, stranded and penniless, with no way to reach their home planets. We exit the mainstream of traffic and turn down a narrow alley. After following the alley for a while, the road starts to become patchy and poorly maintained. 
The buildings on either side of us are a strange collection of styles, ranging from badly maintained late 20th century structures to cheap modern preformed affairs, with their fabricated box-like rooms and polymer windows. We're heading for a place called Dark Side, where almost anything can be traded or bought. It's the only place where one can exchange Sector One Imperial credits for a currency that can be traded on Earth. In my rush to come to Teluria to do baby shopping, I'd forgotten one crucial thing. I'm totally broke. My credit account is completely overdrawn. Termination of employment by abduction can do that to you. I was supposed to get some sort of compensation payment from the corporation that ran Fortuna Tau, but the company declared bankruptcy soon after the mining station ceased to exist. I know Tarax Boys had something to do with the complete destruction of Fortuna Tau, but he's never really explained what happened back there. I'm just glad most of the workers, including my friends, made it out of there alive. Are you sure you know where we are going, female? This location is not indicated on the navigator. Tarax's grumpy voice cuts through my reverie. To my surprise. He drives like a total grandfather. I somehow assumed he'd be a speed demon, but I guess being a badass in real life doesn't necessarily equate to being a badass driver. That's because we're in the gray zone, I explain as we hit a minor pothole. Luckily, this terrain vehicle has good shock absorbers. It won't show up on the standard mapping systems, but I know my way around. This is some kind of illegal district, semi-legal. I correct him, and you are familiar with this place. Kind of, I shrug, putting on my best innocent look. Hmm. I can't see Tarek's expression underneath the thin scarf concealing his face, but I know he's curious. I know what he's thinking. What reason could a nice girl like me possibly have to come to a place like this? I used to trade biomaterial for money. I say quietly, so softly only he can hear. Plant and fruit genetic material mainly. After Dad died, Kenna and I were desperate for cash. A random thought occurs to me. Maybe that's why I saw pineapples on board a freighter heading for Kithia. Maybe that was my doing. That's freaky. We reach a familiar landmark, the dilapidated corner cafe called Greasers. Its old-fashioned, brightly lit pink sign casts a lurid glow across the street. Turn left here, I whisper, as Tarak carefully rounds the corner. Shops and restaurants and dive bars start to appear amongst brightly lit advertising boards. There's a bit of foot traffic here. It grows denser as we head for the center of Darkside. Humans and aliens of all kinds walk alongside each other. The stream of foot traffic becoming a dense crowd, which parts before us as we roll down the street. I see shoppers dressed to the nines. Their porter bots trundling behind them. A busker sits on the pavement, creating a complex tune on his digipad. A guy dressed in an old-fashioned tailored suit watches us with a cold black stare as we pass. Only dark side gangsters wear those kinds of suits. Dark side seems a whole lot busier than it used to be. But then again, I haven't been here for years, and galactic trade with Earth has increased dramatically since then. The upside is that we don't stand out amongst all the weird and wonderful souls that frequent this place. A terrain vehicle full of sun-averse Cordolian warriors, a purple-haired medic, and one very pregnant human. Nothing to see here, people. Move along. I glance behind me at the three Cordolian soldiers who have tagged along with us. They're taking everything in their stride, quietly chattering amongst themselves as if they've been here a thousand times before. I guess these guys are used to visiting strange new planets. We pass through the pleasure district, 
heading for the bunker-like offices of Bank Street. It's an ironic name. No one actually uses banks anymore. Stop here, I tell Tarak, as we roll to a halt outside a building with blacked-out windows. Makeshift frequency blockers bristle from the roof. Odd metallic dishes and twisted antennae jutting out at strange angles to form a strange metal canopy. The building has no name, but everyone knows it. This is the place. Two armed guards stand out the front, wearing army and plate vests. They're both packing bolt cannons. I don't remember them being here last time. Have things gotten dangerous in Darkseid? This is the place? Tarek asks skeptically. You want to get rid of your Imperial credits? This is the place. Hmm. Tarek signals to one of his boys. Loden, you come with us. Gerald and Nithian, you will guard the vehicle and keep an eye on those guards. Ziara, come or stay, whatever you wish. I'll stay here, the medic says. This place is interesting. I want to observe a little. We slide out, Ziara helping me down the metal steps at the side of the vehicle. Tarak brings me to his side as the guy called Loden, who I recognize as Dark Shadow's pilot, follows close behind us. The Cordolians keep their faces concealed under their light scarves. With their imposing heights and dark exotic robes, they look mysterious and threatening. The two human guards at the entrance approach us. State your business, one of them says. Before Tarak can do anything unpredictable, I step in front of him. We're here to exchange credits. The guard looks me up and down in disbelief, noticing my pregnant belly. His stare borders on lecherous. Tarak growls. I put a hand against his chest as I glare at the guard. Are you going to just stand there all day gaping, or are you going to let us in? The guard grunts and mutters something into his calm. The doors slide open. Security check first. He points to a glass-walled room just inside the entrance. Oceana Group would kindly request that you leave any weapons at the door. He smiles wolfishly, staring at Tarak and Loden. It's company policy. Tarak snorts softly, as if I would need any weapons to kill the likes of you, he mutters under his breath. I elbow him in the side. There will be no killing, I say quietly through clenched teeth. Tarak says nothing, placing a reassuring hand on the small of my back as we pass into a weapons clearing area. A stout, matronly-looking woman, dressed in a security uniform, approaches us. She's got short, curly, graying hair and a jagged scar across one eyebrow. Show us what you're packing, boys, or else I'll have to do a strip and search. She cackles evilly. Although, I wouldn't mind getting my hands on the likes of you. Tarak leans down and whispers in my ear. Is all this really necessary just for currency exchange? I would rather not abandon my weapons. I sigh. I know it seems excessive, but this is probably the only place on Earth that will take Imperial credits. And security checks are standard operating procedure in most of these places. I would rather order a shipment of goods from Sector 1. That'll take at least six months. We could probably make cloth diapers from some of Auntie Kenna's linens. I shudder. But it's not ideal. I glance at the security lady. She is waiting expectantly, her arms crossed over her generous chest. Sir, Loden looks at his boss. We're at a crossroads. I'm sure Tarak's danger sense is being challenged in a big way right now. I've stretched him to the limits by asking him to go against his protective instincts. I don't like it, he grates. It seems unnecessarily risky. I put my lips close to his ear. We've been in way worse situations before, I whisper. We have to live, Tarak. Wherever we go, there's going to be some kind of potential danger. 
If it isn't a threat from the Cordolian Empire, it's going to be human spies or dark side gangsters. The last two are not a threat. I'm sure you would have no problem dealing with them, but what I'm trying to say is that there is always something out there in the universe that could kill you. I refuse to live in fear. I'm not going to let fear dictate to me. You don't really know the universe, my love. What you've seen has only scratched the surface. His voice is both dark and gentle. Something powerful stirs inside me. I drag him to the corner, ignoring Loden and the security lady. I pull him close to me, and he leans in so I can speak softly, my voice dropping so low that it's nothing but a breathless whisper. This isn't easy for me either. I have nothing right now but you and our child. Depending on someone else for money goes against all my instincts. But if it's you, I don't mind, because I've given myself to you completely. Hmm. He's gone still. A low, protective rumble escapes him, reverberating deep in his chest. So, we have to live, and we're having a baby. Babies need stuff, Tarak, and I want our child to have everything. I could scrounge money from Kenna, and Sira has offered to help me with anything I need, but the only being I can ever allow myself to depend on is you. So let's go in there and exchange these Imperial credits of yours, because even without weapons, I know I'll be completely safe if I'm with you. Hey, lovebirds! The security guard yells, cutting through the silence. We don't have all day! Show me your weapons and get inside or get out! Ignoring her, Tarek puts an arm around me. Just this once, he growls. I will lay down my weapons just this once. You're probably in one of the safest places on Earth, I reassure him. It's in their interests to keep this place secure. Violence is bad for business. I can't read his expression underneath the scarf, but he's looking at me something fierce. He's still and quiet and part of me fears he's about to bundle me up, take me home, and lock me away in some heavily guarded fortress. His large hand curves around my neck, caressing my sensitive skin. I love you, he murmurs, so softly I almost miss it, so quietly no one else hears. My heart hammers, a warm, happy feeling unfurls in my chest. Sweet, impossible man. He's an expert at dropping penny-melting, heart-squeezing bombshells when I least expect them. It's a devastating war tactic. Before I have time to react, he's turning me around, dragging me by the hand back to the inspection bay. I close my wide-open jaw. The security lady regards us with a sly look. Hate to spoil your lover's tiff and all, but the boss doesn't like it if the customers spend too much time in this here cage. If you want to speed things up, I can do a strip search, she offers. In your dreams, lady, I snap, and she laughs, staring up at the two Cordolians with poorly concealed fascination. Time to remove those wraps and sunnies, she says. Let's see those pretty faces of yours, my honeys. Tarak rips the scarf from his face and removes his dark glasses, storing them in some unseen pocket in his robes. He bares his fangs. Be careful what you wish for, human, he snarls. Some of us bite. Oh, my! The lady's eyelids flutter as Loden also removes his scarf. The softly spoken Cordolian pilot is younger than Tarak with fine, elegant features and striking golden eyes. Unlike the hard-faced general, he's quite pretty for a Cordolian, in an almost feminine way. He's not my type, because I only have one type. But I can see how some of these Cordolian boys might appeal to the ladies. I wasn't expecting Cordolians, she gushes. Show me your weapons, boys. 
Tarak gives her an irritated sidelong glance and reluctantly starts to fish various weapons from underneath his robes. Loden follows suit. Four plasma guns, two short swords, three daggers, three small bombs, and one vicious-looking garrote thing later were finally allowed through the security point after a brief body scan. If you touch any of those, you will be punished, Tarak warns the security lady. Glancing at the rather substantial pile of dark alien weapons. Punish me any time, the woman mutters something under her breath that sounds suspiciously saucy. I throw her a death glare. How dare she look at my mate like that? As we pass, I pause beside her. Do all male customers visiting Oceana Group get such special treatment from you? She manages to look somewhat guilty. Don't get your knickers in a knot, girly. I know he's yours. Lord, the way he looks at you. But an old biddy like me has to take whatever tiny thrills she can get. I don't mean nothing by it. I swallow the tirade I'd prepared earlier, settling on a slightly strangled laugh. You're just lucky I'm here, lady. I shake my head. She really has no idea. I shudder to think what the old Tarak would have done in such a situation. He wouldn't have agreed to surrender his weapons to humans, that's for sure. Tarak I will repeat myself only once, human. I snap, losing patience. I wish to exchange ten Grand Imperial Kavaroons. Kavaroons? The human currency broker, or whatever he is, punches something into his terminal, his eyes wide. Let me just look that up. It's Cordolian currency, Abby adds, trying to be helpful. As if that isn't obvious. The ignorance of humans never fails to surprise me. Fucking humans. Why can't they just accept Cordolian currency like almost every other planet in the Cain cursed nine galaxies? I'm just going to get the manager. The human smooths his gray jacket nervously and disappears into a back door. I take the opportunity to analyze our surroundings. Lodan lounges near the exit, looking deceptively relaxed but I know he's marking everything and everyone in this room. At the first sign of danger, he will be back inside the cage, retrieving his weapons. This place is at odds with its shabby exterior. Inside, high vaulted ceilings rise towards an ornately patterned roof embedded with a cluster of glittering lights. I assume they are supposed to represent stars. Numerous discreet booths lie in the room, and a human worker is assigned to each one, serving various customers. Not all of the clients are human. I spot a pair of Ifkin males being ushered into a booth opposite us. I watch them carefully as they pass, my senses on alert. They are short, two-legged creatures with stark white skin and hairless heads, Wide foreheads and hairless, ridged brows overhang small, glowing blue eyes. They lack noses and have small, lipless mouths set above a narrow chin. Their upper limbs resemble normal arms, but they also possess a pair of lower accessory limbs, which hang limply by their sides. One of them pauses, his behind eyes opening. The Ifkin have four eyes, two in front and two at the base of their skulls. Without turning his head, he stares at me with a baleful, glowing blue gaze. Excuse me, sir. The human broker is back, along with another senior-looking human. This one has dark skin and brown eyes. His hair has been arranged in intricate knotted patterns that stretch the length of his scalp. He wears a neat black suit. Its only ornamentation is a small silver pin in the shape of a bloom attached to his breast. He smiles as he sits in front of us. I tap the desk, impatient to be on my way. 
This human place is making me uneasy. There are too many unknown variables here, and I am at a distinct disadvantage. I am unfamiliar with this environment. As we drove into this chaotic, disorganized human settlement, I once again experienced the sensation of being watched. I wonder if my mate's pregnant state is making me over-vigilant. My fingers twitch, yearning for the familiar sensation of a hilt or trigger. I feel as if many eyes are upon us. I hear you have Cavroons for me. This new broker wastes no time, not even bothering with an introduction. It's not every day we get someone coming in here with Imperial Cavroons, let alone ten of them. In fact, I've never seen one in my lifetime. I'll tell you what. You're going to empty our networks today, but I can offer you fifteen billion Earth credits. I wave my hand dismissively. Money is of little consequence to me, and bartering seems like such a tasteless practice. I just want to finish and be out of here. This amount should tide us over for the time being. As long as I can pay my soldiers and buy Abby the things she desires, it should suffice. I have plenty more cabroons stored away, courtesy of the Imperium's coffers, and when those run out, we can contract out our services as mercenaries to some of the lesser planets. But first, the Empire must fall. I am about to accept the offer when Abby leans forward. Fifteen billion? She rolls her eyes. What do you take us for, idiots who've never left Earth's orbit? I would think twenty billion would be a more reasonable figure. The broker doesn't miss a beat. That might have been true a few months ago. But we all know the Cordolian Empire isn't what it used to be, since half of them decided to break away and make Earth their home. He shrugs giving me a pointed look. Currency fluctuates. Cordolian credits have been on the downslide lately. I was quoting twenty with those adjustments in mind, my mate says dryly. I raise my eyebrows as I glance at her. The broker frowns. That exceeds our currently available daily transfer limit. If you want to walk away with a whole amount today... You're going to have to settle for less. Abby stiffens, her eyes locking with the brokers. They sit like that for a moment, as if they're waiting for some unseen signal. Then it starts. I'll give you fifteen five, final offer, the broker snaps. Abby laughs. Please, don't insult me. Nineteen billion is reasonable. Sixteen. Eighteen and a half. You're dreaming, lady. I'll give you sixteen, and that's absolutely final. Seventeen. You're kidding. Sixteen three, and that's it. I can't offer you any more. The networks are absolutely maxed. I watch the two humans in mild fascination, especially my mate. She haggles like a seasoned pirate trader. Where did she learn to do that? As she opens her mouth to protest, I squeeze her hand. Enough, I say. Take the offer. She pouts, looking most adorable. Fine. Sixteen-three it is. Even though I know you're going to make a killing trading those coverons. The broker keeps his expression carefully composed. You're getting a good deal, lady. There isn't anywhere else on the planet you'll be able to offload those Cordorian credits. He turns his dark gaze towards me. Humans have had mixed feelings about your people ever since the annihilation of Earth became a possibility. I remain silent. I still plan to make the Empire pay for their audacity. 
I reach into my robes and retrieve two credit chips. They are keyed to my biological signature, so no one else can use them. This holds nine. The other has one. Exchange them like for like. As you wish, sir. The broker inserts the chips into his terminal and starts to input commands, the data pad hidden from view as he types. I look at Abby, raising an eyebrow. She shrugs, the very picture of innocence, even though I know she's anything but. I make eye contact with Lodan, who's watching the exit. The unease I felt earlier has settled in the pit of my stomach, and I can't shake it. It is unusual for me to feel this way, but then again, I have rarely experienced what it is like to live as a civilian. In the military, mundane activities like procuring goods and handling credits are usually handled by a logistics crew. But now, our growing family needs a logistics crew of its own, and said crew consists of me and my mate. Once the procedure is complete, the broker hands me the credit chips. I check the amounts on the credit display carefully, doing some quick mental calculations. The amounts check out. I nod at the broker, and that signals the end of our transaction. Abby smiles sweetly, holding her pregnant belly. You did not need to haggle, I hiss as we make for the exit. I will not have my mate bartering like some common Veronian pirate trader. In Cordolian culture, haggling is considered vulgar. She regards me with a strange look. Whatever. I just scored you over a billion extra credits. Her smile turns wolfish. It's distractingly sexy. Now... We can go shopping. I don't want to go shopping. I want to take her someplace quiet and fuck her until we are both blissfully spent. In pregnancy, she has become more responsive to my touch. She has become pliant and easy to arouse, and every single one of her orgasms is music to my ears. Her body is ripe for the taking. A luscious, juicy prize. Stop staring at me like that, she whispers as we leave. It is with relief that I collect my weapons, concealing them underneath my robes, giving the foolish human female guard a warning glare. Intentionally, I brush against Abby, my hands grazing her rounded ass. She's aroused. I can tell by her sweet, musky scent. Behave yourself, General, she protests. You're going to cause an accident. These kinds of things are never accidents, my love. I walk out into the blazing sunlight with my hand around her waist. Sixteen point three billion earth credits in my pocket and a raging hard-on. Chapter 9 Abby The sun is high in the sky, and it's freaking hot by the time we leave the commercial district. I've got what I came for. The back of the train vehicle is packed with boxes of diapers, both the regular and self-cleaning types. Baby clothes, fluffy toys, booties, a self-assembling crib, and my favorite thing of all, a tiny holographic projector that attaches to the ceiling— sending out a stream of luminous stars as it plays soothing music. It was fun to be able to place our order and watch the synth bots come to life, producing our custom-ordered items in minutes. Now we're back in the terrain vehicle, heading towards the property, driving over barren terrain. Whatever roads existed in this place have long ago become degraded, leaving random chunks of eroded bitumen here and there. The Cordolians are all miserable, wrapped up in their scarves and sunglasses like desert raiders, 
melting under the blisteringly bright sun. And even though I love this sort of dry heat, I've taken care to wrap myself in a shawl and one of Dad's old cooling vests, mindful of the baby. I sip a chilled pineapple smoothie as we leave the outer limits of Telluria and enter the flat expanse of the desert. I curl my legs up on the seat, cradling my belly. Little monster is quiet again after the excitement of the morning. Should have taken Dark Shadow, Tarak mutters under his breath. From the stiff set of his shoulders, I can tell he's unhappy. Here, I grab a chilled bladder of water from the satchel at my feet. Hydrate! I pass water to Ziara and the soldiers in the back. They offer appreciative murmurs of thanks as we roll across the dusty ground, stirring up a red plume behind us. No smoothies for them. Cordolians, I found, hate the taste of anything sweet. Tarak lifts his scarf, puncturing the self-degrading disposable water bladder with his fangs and taking a deep drink of water. He stops midway, glancing over his shoulder. Somehow, he maintains the speed of the vehicle, driving forward, even though he's looking back. What's wrong? I ask. But he ignores me, looking at his soldiers, particularly at Loden, who's seated directly behind him. He says something to them in Cordolian. I can't make out a word of it above the rush of the wind and the roar of the engine. Damn it, he's doing it again. That whole, action now, explain later thing. Then, several things happen simultaneously. Tarak jumps from the driver's seat, leaping out of the vehicle. What the? I yell, turning my head, my hair whipping about my face. Loden has somehow slipped into the driver's seat and taken control of the vehicle. Tarak starts running, moving parallel to us, but getting farther away as we drive on. He's sprinting incredibly fast. Ziara puts a reassuring hand on my shoulder. He's just going to check something out, she says, as we speed across the desert. Remarkably, Tarak is keeping pace with the terrain vehicle, but at a distance. It chills me to realize I still have no idea what Cordolians are truly physically capable of. Tarak's abilities seem particularly monstrous. Check out what? I ask. There's nothing out here. For hundreds of kilometers, it's flat and dry. What could have possibly caught his attention? I squint as his dark figure becomes more and more distant, still keeping parallel to us, but getting further away. Don't worry about him, my lady. One of the soldiers, Gerald, I think his name is, tries to reassure me. He is only going to check on something. He speaks universal in an oddly formal way. That's the second time a Cordolian's told me that. I'm not buying it at all. Something's definitely up. The two Cordolian soldiers sitting in the back have their hands inside their robes, and I'm guessing they're holding on to their weapons. They turn their heads, staring off into the vast desert as we speed along, heading for home. I realize I can't make out Tarak anymore. Where the hell has he gone? Tarak I sprint across the dry ground, drawing out my exo-armor and discarding my civilian clothes as I pull the short sword at my side from its sheath. The sensation of being followed wasn't just my imagination. As I drove the land vehicle... I'd caught a familiar flash of white in the corner of my vision. It could have been nothing. An earth creature, perhaps. But I have been around too long to vainly dismiss the things that stir my instincts. I trust my battle sense. It has never failed me. As I get further away from the land vehicle, I see the very thing that gives our stalker away. Footprints in the red dust. Tiny puffs of dust rise from the ground as the figure runs, veering away from me. Whoever this individual is, they are using some highly advanced camouflage technology, and they are running very fast. 
the runner has to be a Cordolian, and of the Cordolians I know, only a few would be capable of such feats. The runner is fast, but I am faster. I pump my legs, the nanites of my exosuit propelling me as I come alongside the camouflaged figure. I can see his outline now. He appears to me as a faint shape, covered in the shifting colors of the desert. The colors flow and move over the runner's body, trying to adjust to the changing background. Close up, the illusion is good, but not perfect. I run even faster, the short calidum sword in my right hand. I consider shooting the runner, but I want to take him alive. I have questions. A blue bolt of plasma comes at me, seemingly from nowhere. Still moving at full speed, I shift my body to the right, allowing it to fly past. At the same time, I swing my blade, catching the runner in the back of the thigh. There's a grunt of pain, but he keeps going. Black blood seeps through the illusion. He's slowing down now and I use the opportunity to propel myself forward, throwing away the sword as I bring him down with a diving tackle. We tumble across the dry, rocky ground, and the graphic illusion that serves as his camouflage disappears as a plasma gun clatters out of his hand, skittering across the red soil. Silent one, I grunt, anger reverberating through my voice. What is an Imperial Assassin doing on my planet? He is clad in the customary all-white of the Imperial Assassins, his face hidden by a blank death mask. The Silent One, as is his nature, says nothing, instead trying to bring his arm around my neck in an attempt to choke me. I grunt, pushing against him with brute force. He is strong. With his other hand, he tries to slip a garrote around my neck. It won't work. I'm covered from head to toe in thin, flexible calidum exo-armor that serves all of my needs, whilst being completely impenetrable. Do you really think you can kill me? I grate through clenched teeth. Of course, he doesn't say anything in reply. We grapple in the red sand. The thin calidum wire goes over my head. He tries to pull the noose tight, but my armor protects me. Enraged, I grunt and roll, flipping him on his back. He squirms underneath me, bringing a knee up to my groin. It's a powerful strike, but my armor sustains the blow, protecting me. In his hand is a short black dagger. He stabs me repeatedly in the stomach, trying to find an opening. At first... It doesn't penetrate. I hold him down, struggling to restrain him. He keeps stabbing with that infernal hand. If he continues at this rate, he will penetrate my armor. A calidum blade is the only thing that could do it. I struggle to grab his wrist as he squirms, hitting me in the groin and stomach with powerful strikes of his knee, flailing about like a fucking wild skazajik. He stabs again, and I feel the outer layer of the suit give, the point of his dagger penetrating into my flesh. Sharp pain rips through my abdomen. I respond with a vicious headbutt, my armored head shattering his mask. At the same time, my hand squeezes his wrist until the dagger clatters from his grasp. A few drops of blood seep from the wound in my belly, before the nanites swarm in to repair the damage. I'd rather they wouldn't right now, because any major healing event sequesters nanites and weakens my armor. But it isn't like I have a choice. They're programmed to prioritize healing over anything else. One of the assassin's sightless black eyes is revealed through a crack in the mask. The Silent Ones are wretched creatures, their existence mysterious and steeped in mythical lore. Ever since one of them tried to kill me back on Kithia, I have made an effort to find out more about them. Now I know why their eyes are black. 
from the little information I've gleaned, I've learnt that their sight is stripped from them at birth, in order to enable them to develop the rare ability of Takui, the second sight. We all have it to some extent, but the Cordolians lose it shortly after birth. In the Silent Ones, the trait is beyond measure. They are marked and selected out from the day they are born. Give up, I grunt, pressing down on the assassin with all my weight, my hands clamped around both of his wrists. I lock my legs around him in a powerful grip, rendering him unable to move. The shattered pieces of his mask fall away, revealing a pale face. He is a colorless creature, with eyes as black as deep space. Even the whites of his eyes turned obsidian by whatever technique they used to blind him. His features twist into an expression of pure frustration. He flails under my grip, but I do not give, despite the searing pain that shoots through my abdomen as the nanites do their work, knitting my wounded tissue together. You are the first to wound me in such a way, I say, once he stops moving, once he realizes it's futile. For that, I respect your skill. But now, you must die. The silent one writhes underneath me. I grit my teeth against the pain, grunting at the sheer exertion required to keep him contained. He makes a strangled sound in his throat, but I know he can't say a word. He is controlled by a powerful compulsion called a mind bond. Cease this, I order, even though I know he has no free will. His mistress would have ordered him to kill me, and until one of us is dead, he will not stop. As far as the Empire is concerned, the kill order they placed upon me still stands. I have no idea how he even managed to come to Earth. He strains against me, his pale features twisting. His skin is pale silver, lighter than mine, a fine network of black veins visible just beneath it. His hair, by contrast, is deep black arranged in intricate braids, similar to those worn by the Icoon. I have never seen a silent one without his death mask. For a Cordolian, his appearance is unusual. I did not think it possible. But could this one be a hybrid of some kind? It is of no consequence. He is going to die. The Empire sent you. I state flatly. I know you're under compulsion. Based on the small amount of intelligence I have on the Silent Ones, I know they undergo a kind of psychic imprinting, which binds them to the will of a master or mistress. I can release you from this pathetic existence if you cooperate, I tell him. Do you wish for freedom? He stares back at me, his unnerving black eyes sightless and unfocused. But I know his mind's eye can see me with perfect clarity. Clenching his teeth together, the assassin fights against some invisible force, pulling his head downwards into a sharp, brief nod. I'll take that as a yes. As soon as I release you, you're going to try to kill me, I say softly. Your bloodlust is so powerful I can feel it. A breeze whips around us, stirring up a fine scattering of red dust. You need to fight it. I am your only way out. He doesn't say anything, because he can't. The imprinting has also stripped him of his ability to speak. I'm going to move now, I warn him. I leap to my feet, drawing a calidum dagger from where it is sheathed at my thigh. 
the assassin pulls a thin stiletto blade from somewhere on his body. I'm guessing it's poison-tipped. He's going to go for my wound. Fight it, I urge him mentally. If you wish for the solace of the afterlife. We lunge at the same time. He is fast, blindingly so, as expected of an imperial assassin. But at the last moment, he seems to hold himself back, giving me an opening. I plunge the dagger into his heart. A great gasp escapes him as he falls to his knees. It is as if he is expressing both agony and relief. I move with him, keeping my hand curled around the hilt as the life starts to drain from him. I will the helm of my nano-armor to retract, allowing him to see my face as I squint against the harsh sun, my vision blurring. But we're close enough that I can still make out his features. He lets out a soft cry before blinking in surprise. His blood is seeping out of his chest, coating my gloved hand in inky wetness. You! His hand flies to his mouth as he realizes he's spoken for probably the first time in his life. Perhaps the power of the mind bond slips away as his life force dwindles, releasing its grasp on his speech. In his last living moments, I have given him something he never had in his short, brutal life. Free will. I have been called many things during my long career. I can be violent, ruthless, and calculating, but I do not believe I am excessively cruel. And this being's existence feels all too cruel. He slumps against me, his lips turning black, his skin taking on a deathly pallor. I have seen death in all its intimate forms. His time is very near. The... The... He tries to say something as I support him, laying him gently on the sand. Black blood has stained his white clothes. It seeps out onto the red sand. Quiet, I say gently. The goddess awaits you. He shakes his head weakly. There is another, he whispers, forcing the words out. Stronger than me. A true wraith. He is coming for you. Enough. I place my bare hand on his forehead. His dark eyes seem to look right through me as his sharp features lose their fierce expression. Go peacefully now into the arms of the goddess, I say quietly as he closes his eyes. I am not a religious man, but for his sake, I need to believe there is a goddess on the other side. His face relaxes as his spirit leaves his body, his expression turning serene. I kneel beside him as he exhales his last breath, becoming still. In the unbearably hot sunlight, I say a quiet prayer to the goddess, the only one I know, speaking in the Aikun tongue. The nameless assassin's face is peaceful in death, strands of his braided hair framing his head like a dark crown. All around him are the broken shards of the death mask. I stand and walk away, letting the sun blind me as I leave the assassin's body to the mercy of the elements. It is a lonely death to end a lonely existence. When they gave him the order to kill me, he would have known he was walking towards his death. It was only a matter of time. 
All the while, some part of him desired freedom, and death was the only way he could find it. I reach up to my neck, mildly surprised that the garrote is still there. As I pull it off, I realize it's made a small indent in the surface of my armor. If I were anything else but a First Division soldier, I would be dead. Chapter 10 Abby In the relative coolness of the old house, I watch as Kenna prepares a giant omelet. So, your silver Ileans don't eat sugar or anything from plants, but they can eat meat protein and fat, she repeats managing to flip the entire thing without breaking it. Something like that, I reply, glancing worriedly at my link band. It's been almost three hours now, and Tarak hasn't returned. He just disappeared into the vastness of the desert without another word. To check on something. Even though I know he's practically invincible, a small part of me can't help but worry. The sun isn't a friend to the Cordolians, and it has to be about a hundred centis out there. It's fucking hot. I tried to contact him through the strange Cordolian communication device he'd given me, which apparently links directly to him. But he was offline. I even went and asked the three soldiers if we should drive back out and look for him, but they didn't seem worried. The general will return the one called Nithian had told me, with absolute certainty. Do not worry, my lady. So, here I sit, in a kitchen that's so old and familiar, I feel like I'm a kid again. And all I can do is wait for my Cordolian to return. Why aren't you scared of them? I ask my aunt, as she chops a juicy-looking tomato. Huh? Kenna gives me an odd look, as if I've asked a ridiculous question. You freak out at the slightest mention of technology. You don't go into Telluria unless you absolutely have to. You don't even own a comm device. And we haven't seen one another for years. But when I show up with a bunch of strange aliens, you don't bat an eyelid. I shrug. What gives, Auntie? At my feet, Nix and Zeus lie sleeping, their dark, furry bodies outstretched their chests rising and falling with the calm rhythm of their breathing. I run my bare foot over Nick's affectionately. Kenna leaves her cooking, sliding the omelet onto a large plate. She sits down beside me, wiping her slender, worn hands on her apron. Her blue eyes are intense as she looks at me. I never told you this, she says quietly. But I was in love with an alien once. My eyes widen in surprise. No, you never told me. I wait expectantly, not wanting to interrupt her with all the questions that are rushing through my mind. It was in the first contact days, when Earth had just opened her skies. Some of the first visitors to our planet were the Avene. The winged ones, I say reverently. You've seen them, Abby. You know what they're like. These days, you see an alien walking down the street, and you don't look twice. But back then, with their giant glossy black wings and long tails, the Avene were like nothing we'd ever seen before. I stare at Kenna in fascination. In all my time growing up on the ranch, she's never been this open about her past. I was working as a guard in the diplomatic zone at the time, she continues. We had a hard time trying to communicate with the Avene soldiers. No one really spoke universal at the time. But one of them wanted to learn English. Her eyes take on a faraway look. That was our than for you. He was the curious one out of the bunch, and the most beautiful thing I'd ever laid eyes on. I must have seemed equally as exotic to him, with my blonde hair and blue eyes. He was damn persistent, that fool. Never stopped chasing me. You had an Avene lover? My mouth opens wide, 
I never, ever would have guessed it. He was more than a lover, Kenneth says wistfully. After our Than, I never found anyone else. The expression on her face is so sad. What? Kenna holds up a hand, silencing me. Oh, I fell for him, kid. Fell hard. Just like you have for that silver demon of yours. I could see it in your face as soon as I opened the front door and found the two of you standing on my porch. I understand what it's like, Abby. I don't know Cordolians, but I know you, girl, and you would never settle for a man who didn't treat you right. She pauses as Zeus sits up. Sensing her mood, he pads over to her side and plonks his butt on the floor, nuzzling her hand. In the end, Arthan got what he wanted. I was a tough nut to crack, but he chased me day and night. Oh. I try to picture it in my head. A young Kenna, slender and petite, yet tough as nails, hooking up with a dark-winged Avene warrior in a time when humans were just beginning to discover the truth about life beyond Earth. It seems wonderfully romantic, but there's a note of sadness in her voice. She closes her eyes. Oh, Arthan. I can picture him like it's yesterday. There was one important thing he didn't tell me when we got together all those years ago. Kenna shakes her head, a look of pain crossing her features. He never told me that... What we were doing was strictly forbidden in the Avene culture. That he would face death at the hands of his own people if they found out. When they finally got wind of it, we tried to escape. We disappeared, went off the radar. I brought him here and tried to hide him. Those were some of the best and most terrifying days of my life. Nyx joined Zeus at Kenna's side, licking my aunt's hand as if to try and soothe her. I thought the humans wouldn't be in on it. But the Avene made it into a political thing. And it was in the humans' best interests to appease them. We went on the run, going everywhere trying to stay one step ahead of them. Arthan was trying to arrange to get us off planet, but spice travel from Earth wasn't so easy in those days. Oh, Auntie, I murmur, taking her rough, calloused hand into mine, because I know what she tells me next isn't going to be good. We were hiding in Siberia when he left me. I should have known something was up. Deep down, I think I knew, but I chose to ignore it. We were young and invincible, and I thought what we had would last forever. But one morning, he was gone. It was as if he'd disappeared into thin air without leaving a trice. The Federation caught me and hauled me in for questioning. They held me for three days and three nights. But I never gave them anything. On the fourth day, I was mysteriously released, all charges dropped. But I never saw Arthan again. To this day, I don't even know whether he's dead or alive. I hold her hands tightly. This is the first time I've ever seen a glimmer of vulnerability from this stubborn, independent lady. I'm sorry, Auntie Kenna. Oh, don't you worry about me, she mutters, her mask slipping back into place. That's ancient history now. All I was trying to say was that if you find a man who's willing to fight for your right to exist together in this universe, then you should damn well keep him. I know, I say softly, running my fingers across her weathered palm. I know. Beneath us, the two dogs start to whine, their ears going flat. They retreat under the table, hiding in the shadows. Speak of the devil, I say dryly. I think he's back.
Tarak. I jog across the red earth, passing rusted, hollowed-out bodies of abandoned terrain vehicles and the occasional concrete ruin. At one point I passed through an entire settlement. It appeared long abandoned, complete with decaying roads and crumbling buildings, a desolate echo of its former glory. That infernal star called the Sun beats down on my back, mercilessly hot. I have never encountered a planet where the ultraviolet is as strong as it is on Earth. This environment is unrelenting. I could have ordered Lodan to return and retrieve me, but instead I chose to run the rest of the way back to the property, inactivating my calm so nothing would interrupt my thoughts. I needed some time alone to think. The black nanites have done their job and repaired the jagged wound in my stomach, leaving nothing more than a faint healing scar and a dull ache in my side. I draw upon the nanites to coat my body in a dark, breathable skin that is lighter than my usual exo-armor, but still able to shield me from the harmful ultraviolet rays of the sun. Although I can sustain the armor for long periods of time, the process requires energy, and a lot of energy has already been consumed by the nanites as they healed my wound. For long-distance running, this thin layer is more practical. A faint buzzing sensation crawls across my body as I cross the invisible frequency threshold of the intruder perimeter that has been set up by my soldiers. I pass the hidden outline of dark shadow, cresting a small hill as the buildings of the ranch appear in my view. The original dwelling has a flat, white metal roof that reflects the full force of the sun. Even though my eyes are covered by a visor, I squint as I make my way down to the entrance. Although I know my soldiers would have returned Abby safely, I am anxious to see her. I find the front door open. And as I pass into the welcome coolness of the house, the two small fur-covered animals called dogs bolt past me, their tails tucked between their legs. There is something about this setting that is unfamiliar to me. It feels like a true home, lived in and comfortable. I stand at the threshold, thinking I'm a stranger here, an intruder. I don't belong here. This kind of life was never meant for me. That's when she appears, her eyes lighting up as she takes me in. She isn't angry or anxious. She isn't hitting me with irritating questions. She's just happy to see me. She looks like a queen in her cash can its long, fluted sleeves swaying elegantly as she approaches me in bare feet, graceful and serene, like the goddess herself. She places a slender hand on my body. Her pregnant belly rests against me. I place a hand on it, and tiny movements transmit to me. I have walked from death's side into the warm embrace of my lover. She is the essence of life itself. My physical thirst is forgotten, replaced with something more primal. Welcome back, she says, her voice cracking slightly. She traces her fingers down my stomach, her warmth seeping through the thin layer of the nanoskin. Her gaze roams over me, taking in my appearance. "'You look like a ninja,' she remarks, her lips curving upwards in amusement. "'Won't you show yourself to me?' I blink, allowing the thin layer of nanites protecting my face and eyes to dissolve. Caught up in the delight of greeting her, I had forgotten about it. Abby shakes her head in amazement. That never fails to freak me out a little. They are completely under my control, I assure her. You shouldn't be afraid. 
To my relief, all traces of my violent encounter with the Silent One are gone. She should not know that out in that wild, barren place I just killed an imperial assassin. Not afraid, she whispers. Sometimes I just forget. I'm not entirely sure what she means by that. She studies my face carefully. You must be parched, she says. Wait a second. She returns with a large flask of cold water. I take it from her, slowly, remembering my manners. She watches me as I drink, the cool liquid quenching my thirst. Her gaze never leaves my face as I drain the flask. Finally, I crack. You have not asked me what I was doing out there, I grumble. Usually, you ask. Her elegant eyebrows drift upwards in surprise. I wasn't going to ask, because I didn't think you'd want to tell me. Hmm. For some unexplainable reason, that doesn't sit right with me. But she's right. How am I supposed to tell this delicate creature that I just killed a Cordolian assassin? She should always be protected from such things. The death of the Silent One has left a strange echo in my heart. Since when did I start to develop such a fucking conscience? There was a time I would have slit his throat without blinking, and not thought twice about it afterwards. Hmm, she responds, still giving me that odd look. You're tired she says softly, guiding me outside. Come and rest. Her eyes are wide and full of concern. I'm standing in front of her, armed to the teeth, and she's showing concern for my well-being. She's the only one in the universe who could possibly think I needed to be cared for. I snort. This notion is ludicrous. But somehow, I allow myself to be led, an imposter in this strange, light-soaked world, where life moves at a different pace. A cruel reminder of the Cordolian Empire visited me today, shattering the illusion of safety. The appearance of the Silent One filled me with rage, and at the same time I felt a strange kind of pity. But she does not need to know about any of that. And one thing has become clear to me. The Empire must fall. I know how vicious my people can be. I can't have my mate and the life growing inside her facing constant threats from a dying civilization consumed with twisted hatred and deluded ideals. As I walk back out into the light, Following her blindly through the garden, I decide that I will find a way to strike back at the heart of the Empire. I will have Vion's head. And if the nobles dare to continue with their insanity after their Empress is dead, then there will be war. Abby I don't know what the hell happened out there, but the expression on Tarek's face is a little bit scary. He looks a little different somehow. I lead him into the coolness of our glass-walled house, and he opens his eyes again, more comfortable in the shade. His civilian clothes are gone, replaced with a thin, flexible layer of black that coats him from neck to toe. It doesn't leave much to the imagination. I can see every contour and outline of his chiseled physique. Oh, boy. I'll never get sick and tired of admiring his body. He's a walking sculpture, his body honed by years of training and combat. He looks at me with the hungry stare of a starved wolf. The hollows of his cheeks are a bit more pronounced. He's leaner, more gaunt. 
The overall effect is that his features appear sharper, and when his red eyes grow distant and cold as winter frost, he looks like a stranger. There's nothing remotely human about him. Are you okay? I ask as I perch on the couch beside the courtyard, sitting in a shaft of golden light adorned with tiny luminous dust motes. Tarek sits in the shadowed part, preferring to stay out of the light. You don't need to fret so much over me, he says stiffly, as if the very notion that I should be concerned about him is ridiculous. I beg to differ, I protest gently. I'm allowed to care about my husband. Husband? Soon to be husband, I clarify. After I pop this little one out, you and I are getting married. Tarak inclines his head, awaiting further explanation. It's a human bonding ritual, I shrug. We get to dress up and say our vows and exchange rings. It's old-fashioned, but I've always wanted to have a wedding. This wedding is important to you? Funnily enough, it is. I rub my hands over my belly with growing excitement. Some weird motherly instinct tells me she's happy in there. A calmness has settled over me these past few days, and since returning to the ranch, I felt a sense of permanence. Then we shall do whatever this ritual demands, and you will have the finest of everything, he says haughtily. I will participate in this ritual and claim you in the human fashion, if that is what you desire. Then all humans will know that you are mine. Exactly, I smile. And that you are mine, I think to myself. The thought is incredibly satisfying. He's looking at me with a gaze so intense it makes my poor little heart flutter. I've been trying to be a good girl out of concern for him. But the truth is that ever since he appeared like a silent shadow in the front doorway of Kenna's house, there's been a delicious throbbing tingle down between my legs in my most secret, sensitive area. Why, oh why, am I not surprised? All of a sudden, I feel incredibly warm. My mouth is dry, my heart is racing, I'm sweating. His crimson gaze burns into me. I can't tell what he's thinking. He reclines back on his elbows like a panther, watching me. Come here, he growls, crooking his finger. My body moves of its own accord, and I slide across to be by his side. Lust has taken over my brain and removed all coherent thought. That seems to happen a lot these days. All I can understand right now is how much I want him. His erection is clearly visible under that black second skin of his. At the sight, a tiny cry escapes my lips. Get on your knees, he orders. Straddle me. I do as I'm told, moving over him so that I'm sitting on his lap, facing him with my thighs spread apart. As if unwrapping a present, he unties the lavender belt at my waist. As he pulls it away, my cash can comes undone. He slides his hands under the folds, and as he runs them over my stomach, a low rumble of approval escapes him. His hands run up my sides, caressing my waist, gliding over my ribs, cupping my bare breasts, where they pause for a moment before slipping the cash can off my shoulders. The garment drops, leaving me only in my panties. I thought you were supposed to be tired, I say hoarsely, unable to take my eyes off him. You're the one who assumed that female, he replies, as he brings his lips to my ripe belly and starts to kiss me, slowly and reverently. But I can never grow tired of you. And besides, it's time to claim my prize from earlier. I won the wager, you see. Silver-skinned and silver-tongued, I see. My sweet words are reserved only for you, he murmurs between kisses, 
his lips hot and wet, his tongue tracing small sensual circles across my belly. As the baby tumbles around, he presses an ear against my skin, listening. I can hear her heartbeat, he says, a note of wonder in his voice. She is healthy. A soft kick against the wall of my stomach startles him, and I laugh softly. Say hello to Daddy, I whisper. You're going to have him wrapped around your little finger very soon. Tarak looks up at me quizzically. You and your nonsensical human mutterings. It's a figure of spe— I yelp, distracted by his roving hand, which has somehow found its way into my panties. His finger slides up and down the silken flesh of my pussy. I'm so damn wet. And now, Tarak is naked. I blink. When did that happen? He slips his finger inside, going deep, adding a second one as I instinctively grind my hips, driven by pure sensation. He stretches me slightly, a slow smile spreading across his face as I move up and down, closing my eyes. I run my fingers through his moonlight-colored hair, finding the twin points at his temples where his horns are supposed to be. Whenever they start to grow back, he grinds them down, and his silver skin grows back over them. But the severed bases remain highly sensitive. I lean forward and touch my lips to his temple, sucking on the slightly raised area. A low, primal rumble escapes him. He tastes of violence and the wild, windswept desert. His fingers creep forward, finding the tender nub of my clitoris. With the smooth tip of his finger, he caresses it. I release my grip on him and let out a long moan. His movements are gentle, controlled, and precisely calculated. He could stroke me faster and get me to come right now, but he draws it out, sending shudders of pleasure through my body. With his other hand, he caresses my swollen belly, which is nestled between us. Everything about me is round and big and curvy. My breasts have grown fuller, my ass has gotten bigger, and my thighs are wider. He has worshipped every inch of my body and made me feel as attractive as sin. I arc backwards as he gives me slow pleasure curling my arms around his neck. In one fluid movement, he rises up and pushes me gently down onto my back, supporting me with one strong arm as he lays me down on the sofa. Somehow, his finger is still on my clit, stroking, making me gasp again and again. Impossible, man. I bend my legs as he lowers his head, and brings his lips to the entrance of my pussy, planting a slow, sucking kiss there. Then, with a single swipe of his tongue, he pushes me into an orgasm. Ah! I scream, as a torrent of pure pleasure rips through me. He keeps flicking his tongue back and forth, and another wave of climax comes, even more intense than the last. He's unrelenting, moving his tongue in tiny circles. A great shudder courses through me as waves of sensation take hold. I move back and forth as he grips my thighs with his powerful hands, steadying me as he tastes me, applying a little more pressure now as he caresses that insane bundle of nerves with his tongue. A wonderful tightness is building, bit by bit. He suspends me at the very edge of another climax. The orgasms are so intense and so close together that I don't even know where one ends and another starts. That tight, pleasurable sensation is building, and I'm panting and whimpering, having surrendered my body to him long ago. He gives it just a little more time and then tips me over the edge. 
I orgasm again, digging my fingers into his hair as he holds my legs down. My eyes are closed. I'm gasping. I let out a long, slow whimper of delight. Release comes and goes and fills me with wonderful little aftershocks as he slows his tongue. A feeling of complete contentment sweeps through me. He finishes with a slow kiss, looking up to meet my gaze. Mine, his expression says. Turn over, he says, on your hands and knees. Oh, so he wants to do it like that. Wordlessly, I do as he says, supporting myself on my elbows and knees, my belly well clear of the sofa. I find the position quite comfortable, as it relieves some of the pressure on my back. His hands are all over my ass as he gets up behind me on his knees. He enters me from behind, his giant erection tenderly parting the moist lips of my sex as he fucks me doggy style, pregnant style, one possessive hand on the back of my neck, the other gripping my ass. He's gentle and rough all at the same time, just the way I like it. He goes deep, taking his time, savoring the moment. After a while, he leans in, pulling me upright against his chiseled body, curling his arms around my belly as he thrusts again and again, his movements becoming deeper and more powerful. He brings his hands up to my breasts, cupping them, my nipples hard and responsive under his fingertips. He nibbles my ear, trailing kisses down my cheek and my neck down to my collarbone, all the while increasing the speed and intensity of his thrusts. His roaming hands caress every inch of me, finally settling on my hips as he pulls me close to him, holding me tightly as he comes. As he whispers my name with fierce authority, a warm feeling spreads through me. He's still moving, more gently now his hips rocking back and forth as he empties his seed into me. He's all over me, consuming me, marking me. I'm totally overwhelmed by him. There's no question about it. This alien has claimed me, body and soul. Chapter 11 Tarak I watch Ziara closely as she looks at her hollow screen with an inscrutable expression. How long? I asked, my voice laced with tension. Three quants. She turns to Abby. That's the equivalent of four Earth weeks. Four weeks? Abby touches her belly as a gentle smile crosses her face. That's not long at all. She lies back on the examination couch, the blue Harmony Star pulsing gently on her belly. Ziara has set up a mobile clinic inside Dark Shadow. She has brought everything required for Abby to have a safe and comfortable delivery, including a precious supply of our dwindling stock of medical nanites, and units of synthetic human blood matched to Abby's biological type, just in case of an emergency. I have no idea where she obtained the blood, but such things are apparently easy to synthesize. Abby turns to me, her face flushed with anticipation. Don't look so tense and grumpy, she says. For the next month, all I'll be doing is putting my feet up, eating organic food from Aunt Kenna's fields, and maybe a little bit of gardening. We have everything we need out here. There's no need to worry. Hmm. She is the very picture of health, vitality, and serenity. She epitomizes all the virtues of the goddess herself. She is my goddess. And she is happy here. Her happiness pleases me immensely. I never thought I would be reduced to such simplistic sentimentality. But it is the truth. If she is happy... 
I am happy. I can't allow anything to threaten this precious peace. The appearance of the Silent One reminded me that I must be ever vigilant. I decide then and there that I will bring three full divisions of soldiers to Earth to guard this property. The humans will panic, and Abby won't like it, but I don't care. We can't afford to have Silent Ones lurking around. Have you thought of a name yet? Ziara runs her slender hands across Abby's belly, checking the position of the baby. We haven't actually had that discussion, Abby replies, shooting me a meaningful glance. She has brought the issue up a few times, but for whatever reason, our conversation about naming always gets interrupted, whether it's by a problem on board Silence, or her ripe irresistible body. She should have a Cordolian name and a human name. Ziara raises her eyebrows knowingly. Both females are looking at me in a strange way. Why does it sometimes feel as if females have some sort of secret, silent communication? Perhaps she will be named after the light, I say as befitting of an earth child. Abby looks at me in surprise, her eyes widening. That's weird. I was thinking exactly the same thing. Hmm. I gaze at my pregnant mate, unable to comprehend how I have been blessed with such fortune. There are a thousand different names for the light. We must settle on one. It will come to us, Abby says confidently. I have a few in mind, but when we see her, we'll know. Indeed. At first, the thought of being a father to an infant filled me with trepidation. How can a hardened soldier like me, who has only known the military life, care for a child? My memories of childhood are fractured. But Abby said it well. If the way you treat me is anything to go by, then you'll make a great daddy. I'm not the pure-hearted man she deserves, but I will do my best to ensure our child has everything that I never had. She will have a Cordolian naming ceremony, I declare proudly, a sense of satisfaction filling me. We shall do it the traditional way, with Carveth fragrance, in Ivkris, then she will receive the goddess's blessing, in the Icoon fashion. Abby takes my hand. I don't know what any of those things are, but they sound wonderful. I'm going to do a quick scan now, Ziara announces, entering some commands into her data pad. An image appears on her hollow screen. I go still. A strange feeling enters my chest. It is like nothing I have ever felt before. The area around my heart is tight, as if something is squeezing it. Before us, in incredible three-dimensional detail, is an image of our child. She floats serenely in her fluid-filled nest. Her eyes are closed, and her face is incredibly peaceful. My breath catches in my throat. I look down at my mate, who is equally as transfixed, her crystalline eyes shimmering with moisture. It is a human thing, I think, for the eyes to water in response to strong emotions. She squeezes my hand, a look of wonder on her face. I never get tired of seeing that, she whispers. She's Beautiful. Yes. The tight sensation in my chest expands, filling me with warmth. What is this feeling? Beside us, Ziara interrupts some data on her hollow screen. Your child is healthy, she says. Perfectly so. Keep monitoring your Harmony Star. If it starts to turn purple... 
you must tell me straight away. But I don't expect it to. I don't anticipate any complications. Good. I kiss Abby on the forehead as I help her up. I must go and see to something, I tell her. Ziara, please escort her back to the residence. Of course, General. The medic gives me a low-key salute. As long as you don't get into any trouble, Abby warns. I answer her with an indulgent sidelong glance before slipping out of Dark Shadow's cool, internal chambers. The sun has dropped, and the temperature is cooler, but not by much. My shadow is long as I make my way back to the residence, donning a pair of dark glasses. I find Abby's relative, that old, irascible female called Kenna, skinning small meat animals on a stone surface behind the main house. Like most earth creatures I've seen, they are covered in fur, with long ears and a small stub-like tail. The smell of blood and fresh meat hangs in the air, making my mouth water as I approach. I'm starved and slightly gaunt thanks to the nanites that dwell in my body. They've used up most of my energy stores and have started slowly consuming my flesh. The blood scent has triggered my claw reflex. With great effort, I retract my sharp claws. Those small animals are good eating, I say by way of greeting. During the night, my soldiers and I had caught and roasted several of them. The old woman looks up in surprise, her gloved hand coated in blood. She holds a long knife. The rabbits out here taste a hell of a lot better than that mass-produced recombatant shit, she replies, as she starts to skin another one. The look she gives me is calculating. You look hungry, boy. You better be taking proper care of yourself. I can't have you getting yourself run down with a baby on the way. I scoff at such a ridiculous notion. I don't get sick. Ever. Abby told me you're kind of carnivores, the old woman continues, wiping the knife on her apron. She points to a freshly skinned animal with her blade. Take one. At first I hesitate, but then my hunger gets the better of me. I grab the thing by its hind legs allowing it to hang from my grasp. It smells fresh and sweet, so much more appetizing than the protein mix bars I normally consume. Before arriving on Earth, I never considered food a source of enjoyment. To a soldier, food is sustenance, nothing more. My thanks. I squat on my haunches beside Kenna placing myself at her level. Her eyes are clear blue and piercing, just like the wide skies above. In many ways she is quite similar to my mate. She has that same questioning stare, and she's a practical woman. We are both silent for a moment, evaluating each other. Her old, worn face gives nothing away. Well... You didn't come here just to say hello, did you? Finally, she speaks. Spit it out, boy! I seem to have become remarkably tolerant, because her use of the word boy doesn't bother me. Perhaps it's because I know this female is loved and cherished by Abby that I let it slide. This place, I say slowly, it belongs to you? This property's been in our family for centuries, she replies. It's three hundred square kilometers of dry land. Used to be a cattle station back in the old days, when farming was still done. But yeah, it's mine. Where does the water come from? Boar water. There's a huge artesian basin directly below us. You've got water for thousands of years if you recycle it properly and return it to where it came from. 
Half of what she is saying doesn't make sense to me. But I will understand once I get my geoengineers on the ground. I'm going to make a base here, I inform her. To my surprise, she laughs. <laughs> Judging by the tone of your voice, that's not up for negotiation, is it? It isn't, I agree. But I thought to inform you out of courtesy, and to warn you not to interfere in any of our operations. Ha! <laughs> she laughs again, a harsh, grating sound. I do not understand this human at all. Perhaps, like Cordolians, some humans become a little mad as they age. She is as cryptic and unpredictable as an Icoon elder. Kenna points at me with her knife. An old friend told me about you Cordolians. He said your civilization used to be honorable. Back before you found that black metal and started running out of women. Are you always this blunt, human? I glare at her, half annoyed and half surprised. Her words have the ring of truth to them, and I wonder how much she really knows about old Kithia. I could ask you the same question, Cordolian. Her blade glints as she waves it in the fading sunlight. But I'm getting too old to worry about trying to phrase my thoughts in a way that won't offend anybody. You just make sure you treat that girl well. You hear? If you don't, I'll come for you and skin you alive. A hundred insults run through my mind. But in the end, I settle on a mild snort of amusement. Spoken like a true blood relative. But don't be so presumptuous. She is my mate. You obviously don't understand what that means. In Cordolian terms, I am somewhat traditional. I take care of what is mine. The old crone shrugs. It's all I want to hear. She makes a sweeping gesture with her hand. There's flat dry land out there as far as the eye can see. No one lives there. What am I going to do with all that land? If you want to use it, it's yours. This all passes on to Abby when I die anyway. I rise to my full height, the rabbit creature swaying in my grasp. That's when the calm in my ear beeps softly, alerting me to an incoming call. I ignore it for a moment, looking down at Kenna. Understand this, human, I say softly. My fleet surrounds this planet. My elite soldiers are on Earth, fighting hostile aliens. I have brought a full-sized Cordolian fleet station all the way across the nine galaxies to this backwater planet, and I have refrained from forcing this inept government you call the Federation to submit to my rule. I have been very patient with their ridiculous human demands. Kenna lowers her knife, her eyes widening a fraction. I bare my fangs. The only reason I haven't colonized your infernal planet already is because of her. I turn, walking across the orchard, where the shadows have become long and distorted. The incessant beeping of the calm continues. Except, I snap. The call patches through from silence. General Acadian! It's Icris, one of my five commanders and the head of the second division. Commander Icris, you have news? We have a slight problem, General. Report, I order. We've intercepted an Ifkin transport with a rather interesting cargo. Fucking Ifkin, I snarl, wondering what in Cain's hells the humans are doing allowing Ifkin into Earth's orbit. What is the nature of this cargo, Commander? It's a flesh cargo. Their hold was full of humans, mostly female, but there were a few males as well. 
We think it was bound for the Kelathor slave markets. Hmm. I pause in the shade of a tree bearing round orange fruits. I assume you have dealt with the Ifkin accordingly? The humans tell us they were taken against their will. Some of the females had been molested. Icris's voice is laced with disgust. He is a son of the Aikun tribe, and the concept of slavery goes against his beliefs. I just wanted to check in with you before we go ahead and do the deed. Execute the slavers and return the humans to Earth, I tell him. I will inform Zalikian, and he will make the humans aware of what has transpired. Understood. I don't know how the humans deal with slavers, but I've decided that in the new Cordolian Empire, the penalty for slave trading is death. And preparations for the drop are still going as scheduled? Yes, sir. We should have the first container arriving as soon as night falls. Good. A thought occurs to me. Icarus, have the medics from the fleet station arrived yet? They're due to arrive in three phases. The sub-medic is seeing to the females who have been injured. Make sure they are well cared for. And warn all Cordolians that the women are not to be taken advantage of. Tell them I will personally deal with any reports of inappropriate behavior. This is not the old empire, and we do not treat humans like slaves. However, if a female is willing and displays genuine interest, relations may, of course, be pursued in one's leisure time. Yes, sir. As I terminate the communication, I stare up at the sky through my dark lenses. In the late day, the rays of the sun are weakened, and they seem to be fading quickly now, streaking the sky with shades of orange and red. If I were at all sentimental, I might even consider the scene to be beautiful. Chapter 12 Abbey I stretch and find Tarek side as a bed, empty. That doesn't surprise me much. He doesn't seem to need a lot of sleep, and he's always off doing secret military stuff, even when he's supposed to be on holidays. By now, I know not to ask. I don't even want to ask. I trust him, and I've got my own shit to worry about. Such as... Resurrecting my dad's dream of turning this place into a fully functioning biotech facility. He stashed a bunch of business plans somewhere in this big old house. I just have to find them. As I slide out of bed, Little Monster comes to life, kicking around as if my belly is her own personal playground. I yawn, rub my eyes, and stare out the window. What the? I blink. Beyond the treetops of the orchard, out on the dry, dusty plains, is a collection of large, black box things. I'm pretty sure they weren't there yesterday. It's hard to judge scale from this distance, but they seem huge. They look like cargo containers. That damn Cordolian, I mutter, fishing for a fluffy white bathrobe, which I pull over my naked body, belting it. This early in the morning, it will still be chilly outside. I slip on a pair of utility shoes as I head downstairs, bursting out the front door. I stomp across the orchard, where morning dew still covers the ground, shivering slightly as the cold morning air brushes against my bare legs. I tramp across the red soil, heading towards the cluster of mysterious boxes. There are around ten in total. A shimmer of air at the edge of this makeshift Cordolian Stonehenge is the only clue that Dark Shadow is parked beyond, the menacing craft hidden by some kind of optical illusion technology. Is there anything these Cordolians can't do? Tarak! I yell. My voice sounds tiny as the morning breeze steals it away, but if Tarak's around, I know he'll hear me. He could hear a pin drop in an avalanche. Sure enough, 
Big Bad appears a moment later, stepping out from inside one of the crate things. I gesture wildly towards all the boxes. What's all this? He's crossing the ground, walking towards me in that soundless way of his. Any trace of fatigue he displayed yesterday is gone. He's back to his usual self. I am making some modifications and improvements and adding to the existing infrastructure. Your what? Okay, so this is a surprise. Yesterday, I decided to be considerate and not ask any questions because he looked tired. What do I get? I wake up the next morning and find the front yard full of alien shipping containers. That's what happens when you drop your guard around Cordolians. I remind myself that from now on, I'm always going to ask questions. I walk up to Tarak and put my fists on his chest as he takes me into his arms. What are you doing? I ask him. Where did these come from? What's inside them? He stares down at me through his dark glasses, a hint of a smile forming on his lips. I arranged for a supply drop. It happened at night while you were asleep. There are construction materials inside those boxes, along with terraforming equipment, communications devices, and weapons. I thought it necessary to make our arrangement here more permanent and secure. Won't this upset the Federation? They can't be upset if they don't know about it. Wouldn't this have been picked up on the satellites? It was a stealth drop, he says smugly. And... Even if they have tracked it somehow, what can they possibly do about it? He pulls me closer, and I can't help but snuggle up to him, grateful for his warmth. See, Amina, I always answer your questions. Aunt Kenna is going to be furious, I sigh. How are we going to explain this to her? The old woman and I have come to an agreement, he says, surprising me. You have? Indeed. He buries his nose in my hair. You smell good. But, but... No buts. You always smell good to me. His low, rumbling voice, his warmth, and his masculine scent all have the effect of scrambling my brains a little. I close my eyes, indulging in a quiet moment with him. It's too early in the morning for me to process all this, and I haven't eaten breakfast yet. Tarak runs an affectionate hand through my hair. But as I snuggle up to him, all hell breaks loose. An explosion erupts, sending a flock of squawking birds flying. A plume of smoke rises from the direction of the orchard as Tarak stiffens and spins around. Cold, terrifying fury crosses his features. He snaps orders into his calm in rapid-fire Cordolian. Seconds later, the three Cordolian soldiers appear, as if out of nowhere, fully armored and packing enough firepower to assault a small city. A small silver land flyer streaks overhead, dropping a bomb-shaped object from its metal belly. Tarak's already moving, his armor clicking into place underneath his robes as he picks me up and runs behind one of the giant black boxes. He shields me with his large frame as white smoke blankets the area, making me cough. It's becoming thicker by the second, stinging my eyes and burning my throat. It's some kind of smoke screen, designed to obscure everything. The other Cordolians have disappeared into the mist, and there's no way I can make out Dark Shadow. I hear the sound of a plasma gun being fired, just as Tarak turns, the bolt hitting him in the back. A jolt goes through his body. But most of the impact is absorbed by his exo-armor as he shields me. He takes a moment to recover, as I stare up at him, frozen in shock. Then, to my relief... He starts moving again. He's swearing profusely in Cordolian. I can't get you to Dark Shadow right now, Amina, he whispers. It's too risky, and someone very dangerous is almost on top of us right now. I'm going to try and draw him away. Terrified, I nod, before a coughing fit overtakes me. 
Tarak tears off his robes and covers my nose and mouth with a strip of fabric, tying it around my face. He takes me around to the entrance of one of the black boxes. The door slides open, and he gently urges me inside. Go in, and don't come out until I tell you to, he says. His voice is gentle, but he can't disguise the cold anger in his eyes. They seem to glow red in the dim, hazy light. I'm pretty sure that whoever's responsible for this is going to die. You have to get Aunt Kenna, I gasp, worry surging through me as I step inside the box. It's dark inside. I shudder as my fear of enclosed spaces is rekindled. I will send Loden to get her, Tarak assures me, squeezing my hand. Do not come out, no matter what, until I say so, he repeats, whispering now. A sense of urgency has entered his voice. A plasma gun has appeared in his hand, and he presses it into my palm. At the same time, he presses his lips to my forehead. I will be back. He discards the rest of his robes, the black, seamless exosuit rippling over his body, concealing his features behind a menacing-looking helm. He stalks out into the thick white smoke, the door closing behind him leaving me in total darkness. Abby She's in there. That's what the trace from her link band says. An unfamiliar voice filters through the walls of the container. It's distinctly human. I get to my feet. It's pitch black in here, and I can't see a thing. Have they been tracking me through the link this whole time? Fuck. I thought I'd set it to covert mode. My understanding is that one can only track a link band if its signal has been registered during a prior call, and even then it's highly illegal to do so. Since we arrived on the property, I've only received one call. I shake my head. There's no time to think about that now. I press a button on the offending link band, and it illuminates the place with a soft blue light. The giant metal box is filled with mechanical equipment of some sort. I clutch the plasma gun Tarak's given me tightly, checking the blue charge on the side. It's fully loaded and ready to shoot, but the only time I'd dare use it is with my back pressed to the wall. Otherwise, the recoil is going to send me flying. All I can think of right now is keeping my baby safe. Someone or something has decided to ambush us, and for some reason, the attackers are human, not Cordolian. Don't they understand that they've practically signed their own death warrants? Someone is banging on the outside of the container. What the hell is this thing? It's all Calidon by the looks of things. I hear an appreciative whistle. Those Cordolian fuckers must have that stuff coming out of their ears to be able to make shipping containers from it. I back away, standing against the wall with the plasma gun raised. Where the hell is Tarak? He should have easily been able to handle a bunch of humans by now. I don't know what's happened, but something's gone very wrong. But who the hell would be stupid or arrogant enough to try and pull off something like this? I have my suspicions. With my free hand, I set the recording function on my link band. Then I unclasp it, letting it fall to the floor. If something happens to me and my child, Tarak needs to know who is responsible. You know how this thing opens? There's a panel here. Can't understand this language. Hang on. The door slides open, revealing three humans. White smoke pours in, making my eyes water. I search around for the bit of cloth Tarak had wrapped around my face earlier, but I've dropped it somewhere. The humans are dressed in combat gear, with respirator masks obscuring their features. They carry bolt guns. They're definitely hostile. Buck off or I'll shoot, I snarl as they approach. The lead guy laughs menacingly. What are you going to do with that tiny little pistol, lady? What do you want? I gasp as smoke enters my lungs, making me cough. 
We're under orders to retrieve you, the man says. Now, you can make this easy for us, and nobody will get hurt, or we can do this the hard way. Who sent you? You'll find out in time. Don't resist, lady. I'm warning you. For your sake, and for your unborn child's sake, don't fight back. Oh, no, you don't. They are not going to lay a hand on my baby. Don't take another step or I'll shoot. I'd really advise you not to do that. There are three of us and one of you. What do you think is going to happen? You probably can't even aim that thing straight. Now put the gun down and come with us. I promise you, nobody is going to get hurt if you cooperate. I can barely see them now with all the smoke in here. I'm starting to wheeze a little, my breath coming in great gasps. Get out, assholes, I snarl. You're all dead men anyway. The lead guy laughs. Sounds like you're not going to let us do this the easy way. He takes a step forwards, a hulking black shadow amidst the smoke. Get back, I scream between coughing fits. I can barely see anything now. Still, the three masked men approach. I can't let them take me away from here. I brace myself against the hard wall of the container, bringing my second arm up to steady my aim. I've fired one of these before. I can do it again. It's going to hurt like hell, but it's better than being nabbed by these three creepy jerks. Tarak had better hurry the hell up. This smoke is killing me. Last warning, I shout. They ignore me, laughing. I squeeze the trigger. Inside the container, the sound is deafening. A blazing blue bolt of light sears across my vision as my shot gets one of the guys in the chest. It rips through him, creating a splatter of blood and gore. It hits the opposite wall of the container in a shower of sparks. The impact pushes me right against the wall, my back digging into the hard metal. With the noise, smoke, and screams from my attackers, it's total chaos. Pain shoots through my arms as I lower the gun. I can smell charred flesh. I dry retch, fighting the urge to empty the contents of my stomach. I'm trembling. I just killed a man. A living, breathing human being is now dead because of me. But they're going to harm my baby, and I can't let that happen. Run, my instincts tell me. Clutching my belly with one hand, the plasma gun in the other. I duck down and rush blindly through the smoke, heading for the patch of light at the end of the container. But because of my pregnant state, I can't move very fast at all. Strong arms grab me. I flail around, raising the gun, squeezing off another shot. My attacker dodges, just barely, the shot smashing into the wall again, the sound causing a loud ringing in my ears. The impact sends both of us tumbling to the floor. I drop the gun and curl both arms around my belly as I fall onto my side, trying to protect my child at all costs. Something sharp pricks me in the arm, and my vision starts to go black. The assholes have injected me with some sort of sedative. My last thought before I slip off into the blackness is that when Tarak finds them, they're all going to die. Tarak Show yourself, Silent One, I snarl, as I step away from the cargo container. You are dead anyway, so why delay the inevitable? The heat sensors of my visor don't show me anything but I know he's there. I can sense his killing intent. He must be using an advanced cloaking device. Explosions, smoke bombs, the appearance of a silent one. This is a coordinated attack. It's obvious the Empire is behind it. Those responsible are all going to die. Thick smoke has settled across the plain, reducing the visibility to almost zero. It is too risky to get Abby to Dark Shadow when I don't know what's in front of us. 
and it's far too risky for her to be out here with a silent one stalking me. At least the container is made from calidum. It's virtually impenetrable, so she should be safe. I was tempted to lock it, but I didn't want to trap her inside. If something drastic happens, she needs to be able to get out. I step into another container, which is full of weapons. I glance across the racks until I find what I'm looking for. A pair of twin Calidum long blades. My preferred weapons. With no visibility to speak of, guns are useless. We're reduced to close combat. Open channel, I whisper into my neurocom, and the triple feeds of my soldiers filter through. What's your status, soldiers? That was a fucking Ifkin smoke bomb, Gerald says tersely. I know the smell. It'll last for a few phases. I hear a grunt. They're swarming all over the place. I've just killed three of them. Same here, Nithian chirps in. I have no idea where the fuckers came from, but I've killed two on my end. Lodan is silent. Lodan, I prompt. Hang on, boss. Just have to shake this fucker off. I hear a dull thud. That's better. Jiral and I are right. They're swarming in from somewhere. Lodan, go to the main house and find the old woman. All of you, keep at those Ifkin until every last one of them are dead. And keep the fighting away from Crate Nine, because Abby is in there. Protect it at all costs, but don't draw attention to it. As long as she's inside and it remains closed, nothing can harm her. I'm going offline now, because I've got an Imperial assassin on my trail. But one of you needs to contact Silence and send for reinforcements. And get the First Division over here. Tell them this order overrides any Earth treaty or convention. We will deal with the consequences later. If the humans try to obstruct us, you know what to do. Yes, sir. I terminate the calm. I step outside of the container with my blades drawn, and I wait. There's no use looking for him. He has to come to me eventually. He is a slave to the mind bond that compels him to kill me, and there's no way for him to resist it. Stop trying to think of ways to kill me in one hit, I call, trying to goad him. It's not going to happen. In the distance, the dying gurgle of an Ifkin attacker reaches my ears. The loud blast of a plasma bolt echoes through the air. At the same time, I hear a sound so faint I almost miss it. A footfall. I whirl, drawing my swords, as Calidum meets Calidum with a sharp clang. My twin swords are crossed, and so are his. The Silent One's cloak of invisibility melts away, revealing a blank mask with twin slits for eyes. As is the custom of the Imperial Assassins, he wears all white down to his gloves. This is the one the other Assassin warned me about, the one he called a Wraith. I can tell from the strength of the killing intent that spills forth. It might make a lesser warrior start to have thoughts of surrender, without ever knowing why but he has never fought anyone like me. Our swords are locked. As if sensing each other's intent, we withdraw at the same time, stepping back into an attacking stance. I move first, going for his neck, trying to draw him into my reach. He dodges the thrust and counters with one of his own, going for my arm. To my surprise, he manages to slice my upper arm, cutting into muscle. He's incredibly fast. I grunt as pain rips through me. But my nanites are already doing their work, healing the flesh. Not many are able to cut through my armor on the first stroke. This silent one is definitely more skilled than the last. I move forward, thrusting, dodging, blocking, parrying. He does the same, and we become locked in a deadly dance of swords as we move through the dense smoke, circling around the large cargo containers. I lead him further away from the container where Abby is hiding. We move faster and faster, 
neither of us finding an opening as we move away from the cluster of containers and out into the open desert. It has been a long, long time since I have faced such a challenging fighter. He's going to try to cut me again, but I won't give him an opening. And if I can't find one myself, I will just keep fighting until I wear him down. He goes for my abdomen, angling for a vicious cut along my belly. I leap back and execute a counter-thrust that slices through his right thigh. A trickle of black blood stains his white clothes. He attacks again, never relenting, never tiring, moving forward with a vicious fury as I dodge, trying to get his measure. We're almost evenly matched. Almost. I will find the advantage. I always do. My anger mounts. The longer I'm absorbed in this fight, the longer I'm away from Abby. I can't afford a long, drawn-out fight with this fucking assassin. But he's good. Better than any I've faced in a long time. I go on the attack, channeling my anger into my movements. I crush the restlessness, the anxiety that builds inside me. I can't afford to become impatient. Impatience leads to mistakes, and I can't afford mistakes. I must win, at all costs. I do not know what orders this assassin has been given regarding Abby and my child, but I will not let him through. I push back, sparks flying as our blades clash. Burning pain on my left cheek tells me he's grazed me there. In exchange, I slash his left arm. The difference is that I heal. He doesn't. I need to end this soon. I need to get back to Abby. I lunge forward again, but my blade meets steel as he resists. His expression is hidden behind that unnerving blank mask, and I can't read his eyes. An unreadable opponent is far more difficult to fight than one who gives away his movements through his facial expressions. I need an opening. There is a way to trap him. It's going to fucking hurt, and there is a very, very small chance I might die. But I need to end this, now. I make a wild stab with both swords, and in doing so I leave my abdomen open to attack. He moves as I'd expected, plunging his right blade into my stomach. I grunt, the pain almost crippling. I push it from my mind as his left blade enters my belly at an angle. At the same time, I slam my left blade upwards. It goes through his ribcage and into his chest. He gasps and staggers backwards, black blood erupting from beneath his mask. He pulls the mask off, tossing it aside. Blood streams from his mouth. I step forward, fighting through the pain. As he staggers back, I slice through his left arm at the shoulder. He grunts as his severed arm falls into the dust. That's all. He doesn't scream, doesn't cry out. His expression doesn't change. It's cold and blank. He falls to his knees, blood spurting from his shoulder. It splatters across the ground, contrasting viciously with the red desert sand. I pull both of his blades out of my body, tossing them aside as the nanites go to work, patching up my flesh, stabilizing blood vessels and mending connective tissue. My injuries are massive. I drop to my knees with the sheer pain of it withdrawing my exo-armor from the surface of my skin. I can't afford to sustain it when I'm injured to this extent. My vision is blurring. My face is bare now, the harsh sunlight burning my eyes. Right now I can't even summon enough energy to protect my eyes. I gasp as my flesh knits together. The skin above remains raw and red, but the underlying muscle has been repaired, and my blood vessels and organs have been reconstructed. 
I hear a clatter and realize the assassin has pulled my sword out of his chest. With great effort, I rise to my feet and walk over to him. Shielding my eyes with my hand, I stare down at him. He's still alive. Somehow, the bleeding has stopped. Blank obsidian eyes look back up at me. I know he can't see me. He can only sense me with his highly developed kakui. He's similar in appearance to the silent one I killed yesterday, with his pale, gray-silver, almost translucent skin, dark hair that is intricately braided, and sightless black eyes. He makes a strangled sound of fury. He tries to move, but his injuries are too great. I clench my fist, imagining my hand clamping tightly around his neck, squeezing the remaining life out of him. I should kill him. Do you want to live, wretch? I ask softly. Chances are he's going to die anyway, regardless of what I do. Uh, uh, he grunts, unable to give voice to his thoughts. Fighting the mind bond, he nods his head slightly. Use your kakui, or anava, or whatever it is to try and survive, I tell him. With a missing arm, and a wound that has likely pierced his heart, he's not going anywhere. If you survive, I may have use for you. I squat down beside him, grabbing his hair and yanking his head back so I can whisper in his ear. If you survive, I will find a way to break your mind bond, assassin. And when you break your mind bond, I will give you a new arm, and then you will serve me. Think on that as Cain wraps his cold hands around your heart and tries to drag you to the pits of hell, and decide what you want to do. I drop him and rise, leaving him half bleeding to death in the red sand. I walk back towards the black containers, every step causing me agony. I ignore the pain and start to run, half blinded, waves of thick white smoke surrounding me, making me cough. I reach the container where I've hidden Abby, my heart pounding with pure, naked fear. I have never felt fear like this before. The thought of losing her terrifies me. I reach container nine. The distant sounds of battle reach my ears, telling me my soldiers have not yet managed to suppress the Ifkin. As I walk around to the entrance of the container, my heart stops cold. My world plummets away. The door is open. She is gone. There is a body on the floor of the container, a dead human, his chest torn out by the impact of a plasma shot. Abby is nowhere to be found. A silver glint draws my attention. Her link band is on the ground, a small red light flashing. As I pick it up, rage, fury, despair, and fear rush through me in a wild torrent, I scream, punching the side of the container with my bare hand, the uncovered bones of my fingers shattering as the impact with the hard calidum surface. I vow to the dark god Cain that whoever is responsible for this is going to die. I must find Abby, and I must have her and my child back, safe and alive. Anyone who stands in my way will die. And if, for whatever reason, my precious mate and her child aren't returned to me, those responsible are going to wish they had been sent to hell. What I will do to them will be far, far worse than any torture from the God of Darkness himself.
Chapter 13 Tarak Over fifty Ifkin lie dead, the ground stained violet with their blood. Their pale, limp bodies start to bloat as the sun rises in the sky, and small, black flying insects swarm around them. The stench is terrible. I find my three soldiers scouring the battlefield as the smoke disperses. There is no trace of Abbey. Ziara is sprinting across the ground, a medic kit in her hand. She's changed into combat gear. What happened? Where's Abbey? She's gone, I say, a little surprised at how cold my voice sounds. I should be shaking with rage, but at least for now... I'm able to keep my anger tightly leashed. Can your equipment find her trace through the Harmony Star? Just a moment. Ziara opens her kit and pulls out a monitoring device. A hollow screen appears, filled with data. Its range is short. The signal won't last long, but they're heading south. The velocity of movement tells me they're in a flyer of some sort. I turn to my soldiers. Did any of the Ifkin survive? We kept two alive, Jeral replies. Restrain them for questioning later. I want to know who sent them, and how they found us. Are the rest of the First Division on their way? Yeah, they're crossing the ocean on a small stealth flyer. They will arrive shortly. Good. Reinforcements are also coming from Silence. The humans have raised concerns, but Commander Icarus told the Federation's representative what happened. He's warned that any interference will result in retaliation from us. Open calm. I activate my communication device. Get me Kazaran. The prince comes online. What's happening, General? There are reports of unauthorized Cordolian craft entering the atmosphere, and the Zargek containment effort has been abandoned. Have you recalled the First Division? We've been attacked, I tell him. Ifkin and Imperial Assassins. This has the Empire written all over it. I'm going to deal with it, but you need to use all your skills to calm, placate, and nullify the humans. Tell them not to do anything stupid or get in the way. If they value their own lives and the lives of their people, they will not interfere. At this point, I will consider anyone who gets in my way an enemy. I'll do that. There's no argument from him. Is Abby safe? No. Oh. He pauses as he registers the full implications of my answer. You're going to get her back, aren't you? Pray that I do, Zalikian. I terminate the calm. Nodan, is the old woman safe? Found her shooting a bunch of Ifkin with that old-fashioned weapon of hers. She killed four of them, and now she's holed herself up in the basement of the main house. Tell the reinforcements to check on her when they arrive. I point towards Dark Shadow. Retrieve extra weapons from Crate 6 and get on board. We need to follow that signal before it dies. Sir! The three soldiers are drenched in the blood of their enemies, but they show no signs of fatigue. Their nano armor will be slowly absorbing the blood, making use of all available energy to retain equilibrium. Abby's silver link band is wrapped around my wrist, the tiny red light still blinking. I press the main button, just below the hollow screen unit. One new recording it says in an artificial voice. Do you wish to initiate playback? Yes, I say, with a rising sense of dread. Smoke-obscured images play back to me, along with snippets of distorted sound. I see Abby fighting, fiercely defiant, discharging the plasma gun, telling her attackers to back off, her arms curling protectively around her belly as she tries to shield our child from harm. Every move against her sends my anger spiraling higher and higher. 
until I fear I will lose control. In the old days, I would have simply killed everyone. But that isn't an option right now. Two lives that are immensely precious to me, more valuable than life itself, hang in the balance. And I have to play this right, to ensure they are not put at risk. I can't afford to give in to my rage just yet. First, I have to find them. Slowly, I force my thoughts back into focus, retracting my claws, which have instinctively slid out, tearing the flesh of my palms. With great effort, I suppress my anger. I need to concentrate on getting her back. I need her. Otherwise, my whole world will collapse. Abby I open my eyes, and it takes a while for the world to snap back into focus. To my intense relief, the little one moves inside me. She's okay, and that's all that matters. Above me is a white ceiling, bathed in bright artificial light. I'm no longer wearing my bathrobe and utility shoes. Instead, I'm clothed in a white hospital gown. I try to move, but something is holding my wrists and ankles down. Great. Not this again. I let out a low sound of frustration. I thought only Cordolians did this kind of stuff, but it seems the humans are in on it now as well. At least my head is free. I turn my head slowly and realize I'm in a small, windowless room of sorts, and there's a rushing sound all around me. It sounds as if I'm on board a flyer. The white interior and the inferior sound-dampening technology tells me this is a human craft. If I had been captured by Cordolians, it would be silent and dark in here. Miss Kendricks. A familiar voice reaches my ears. I blink. Doctor? Dr. Asher rises from her seat and walks to my side, standing over me. What the hell do you think you're doing, Lorelei? I glare at her, hatred seeping into my voice. Are you mad? The doctor shakes her head, her perfect blonde ponytail swaying slightly. I offered you an easier way to do this, but you didn't want to cooperate. So we have to resort to this. This is illegal on so many levels, I growl. Assault, abduction, unlawful detainment. Do you really think you're going to get away with this? She leans in, glancing over my body. What makes you think any of this is going to come to light? If that were the case, then you'd be getting done for murder. She raises her eyebrows. Thirty-four weeks pregnant, and you shoot one of our operatives dead? That's impressive, Miss Kendricks. You know he'll come for me, right? Lorelei raises an eyebrow. You mean that alien lover of yours? The baby's daddy? There's no trace of fear in her voice. He won't be able to find us. Not where we're going. No one can. You don't know Tarak. I laugh derisively. You think you can hide from him? He will hunt you down and he will kill you. Even I won't be able to stop him. Not after what you've done. Lorelei's face seems way too composed. Her features are an immovable mask of impeccable makeup. We know all about your Cordolian lover, Miss Kendricks. He is an impressive specimen. I have to applaud you on your evolutionary instincts. If there ever was an alpha male to choose to have offspring with, he's the one. But, no matter what he's capable of, he still won't be able to find us. You know he'll go to war with Earth if you don't release me. Don't you care about that? Sin Corp always does well in wartime, she shrugs. War means business, contracts, increased demand. Not if there's no fucking planet left to do business on, I snap. Lorelei ignores me, walking over to a small metal table. She picks up a syringe loaded with some sort of clear fluid. 
This is a sedative, she says. I can't afford for you to be agitated and restless right now, especially where we're going. Just calm down, and this will go a lot easier for you. Don't worry, it's not harmful to the fetus. We won't do anything to harm the baby. Calm down my ass, I growl, straining against my bonds, even though I know it's useless. You are such a dead woman, Lorelei. I don't think so, she says calmly, as the needle slides into my thigh. He doesn't even know who took you. He's probably about to go to war with the Ifkin. No, he will come for me, I say, with utter conviction in my voice. It's the truth, and I believe it beyond a shadow of a doubt. The sedative starts to take hold, and once again, my world fades to black. Tarak The signal from the Harmony Star has disappeared, but Ziara has been able to map out its general direction. We're flying over the desert in dark shadow, following its last known location. Their path tracks toward the ocean, she informs me, pointing to her hollow screen. The signal was lost, right about here. I curse. The captors I saw in the footage were human. It enrages me that out of all our enemies, it's the pathetic humans who have dared to steal Abby right from under my nose. I underestimated them, thinking the real threat would come from outside Earth. And now I'm paying the price. I slide into a seat behind the control panel and bring up a hollow link to silence. Get me the tech division. Moments later, a thin Cordolian with long, disheveled hair and multiple piercings in his ears appears on my hollow screen. He sits bolt upright in his chair in surprise. G General Acadian! He offers me an awkward salute. How may I help you, sir? I rarely talk to the tech specialists directly. Most of the requisitioning is done by my commanders, so it must come as a surprise that I'm directly patching through. What is your name, Tech? Tech Engineer Eurus, sir. Did you receive my message capsule? He straightens. We did, sir. The drone inside was fairly easy to dismantle and reassemble. It's simple human technology. A recording device, nothing more. There was footage of yourself and Lady Abby stored on it, but nothing else. We've backed up the footage and deleted the original. I can discard it all if you'd like. That's not important right now, Tech. Were you able to trace its origins? Unfortunately, its Earth signal doesn't reach us in high orbit. It effectively has no connectivity up here. I need to know where that device came from, Eurus. It's small enough to eject back into Earth's atmosphere in a high-speed re-entry device. Put a Cordolian trace on it. Once it's inside Earth's atmosphere, it should be within transmitting range again. Once it picks up a signal, you can track it. Th that makes sense, sir. I'll get onto it right away. Eurus bows. Report back to me once you find the origin. I expect this to be done within the next half phase. Understood, sir. I don't know if that surveillance device is linked to Abby's capture, but it's all we have right now. I have to chase every lead possible, and I have to do it fast before they can wipe the trail clean. I look down at her link band, which is strapped around my wrist. This human communication device has long been a source of irritation to me, with its incessant beeping and announcements and seemingly useless, mindless functions. But it seems sophisticated enough to respond to voice commands. I press a button on the side, as I've seen Abby do many times. Who has been in contact with this device? Could not process command, it says in a drone-like voice. Please rephrase. Tell me of the outside calls that have been received by this device in the past two Earth weeks. I'm sorry. Your request does not compute. 
Would you like to access directory assistance? I growl in irritation, resisting the urge to smash the irritating device against the window. Replay last known communication. You seem to be wanting to listen to the last call made to this device. Is that correct? Yes. The call will be replayed after the beep. Do you wish to proceed? Yes. Useless, primitive thing. Okay. The last call was fifteen days ago at 6.31 a.m. It will be replayed now. I listen as a conversation between Abby and the human doctor from Nova Terra is replayed. They are speaking in a human language called English, so I don't understand much. But the conversation quickly becomes heated, with Abby sounding angry. Could this doctor possibly have had something to do with Abby's abduction? Perhaps the call was traced. My anger grows, both at the humans and at myself. I curse myself for not eliminating the link band when we first arrived at the property. As we speed towards the coastline, the familiar signal of Infinity 2, the stealth craft used by the First Division, appears on our tracking screen. I open the comm link. It's about time you showed up, I say dryly. Hello to you too, sir. Rykel's the one to answer. What's up? For once... I don't berate him for his casual speech. Only the First Division can get away with such things. Are you fully armed? Naturally. Good. Some foolish humans seem to think they can take my mate away from me. On the other end, I hear a sharp intake of breath. Ignoring it, I continue. We are in the process of tracking her location. Once that is verified... We will do a retrieval operation. The objective is to take her back alive and unharmed at all costs. I don't care about the collateral. Do what you have to do. Understood, sir. Good. Follow our path. I see you have activated cloaking. But if anyone, human or otherwise, gets in your way, you have my full permission to do whatever is necessary to clear your path. My only concern right now is for the survival of my mate. I clear the frequency, and we wait. After a while, I receive another calm from silence. G General Acadian? Yes, Eurus. We've shot the human surveillance device back to Earth inside a re-entry vehicle at near light speed. It should be clearing the atmosphere shortly. Once it's in, we'll uncouple it from the re-entry vehicle and switch it on. Hopefully we'll get a trace on it. Do you want to stay on the channel in case we get a clear location? Naturally. Stand by, then. It's entering the atmosphere now. I wait. Everyone on board Dark Shadow is silent. Below us, the arid landscape rushes past, giving way to the outskirts of some kind of human settlement. Infinity, too, is matching us in speed. She won't be able to catch us, but she isn't far behind. Entry has been successful. Eurus's thin voice echoes through the cabin. I'm going to ditch the re-entry vehicle now and switch it on. Go ahead, Tech. Tracing the signal now. There's a pause. Uh, sir? What is it, Eurus? We got a brief receiving signal before the thing was quickly switched off, but... Spit it out, Tech. It doesn't make sense, sir. The signal came from over the ocean, but based on our topographical surveillance, there's nothing out there but water. Hmm. I stare at our course, which is mapped out on the hollow screen. Do you have the coordinates of the signal? Yes, sir. Eurus taps away on his data pad, and a location appears on our map. It's in the center of a large ocean, at a point between this large landmass called the Oceanic Republic and an icy territory at the lower pole of the Earth. Send surveillance units to the area. 
look for anything that might indicate human activity. I peer at the screen, trying to understand why these insane humans might possibly want to take my pregnant mate to the middle of an ocean. I pray to the goddess that she is safe. Hold on, my Amina. I will be there soon. Humans, Ifkin, Cordolians. It appears they were all working together to steal my mate from me. I clench my jaw in anger as we pass over land and out onto the dark waters of the ocean. Lodan, are you at maximum velocity? I am, boss. Fly faster, I urge, staring at the hollow screen, wishing it could give me some kind of clue or signal. But there's nothing out there. It's just a vast, empty ocean. General! I spin at the sound of Ziara's voice. She's looking at me with her usual analytical gaze. You've been injured, she says disapprovingly. Look at you. The nanites are starting to look for an energy source. I look down and see that my hands have become slightly gaunt. My muscles and ribs and bones have all become more prominent. I've been too worried about Abby to even care that I'm still completely naked, my exo-armor having retreated to repair my internal wounds. And every single part of me aches. Let me give you an infusion, Ziara says. You need to be in peak physical condition for what's about to happen next. Chapter 14 Abby When I wake again, I'm relieved to find that I can actually sit up. There's nothing strapping me down this time. I squint under the harsh lights, trying to clear my foggy thoughts. I lift up my gown and check the blue star on my belly. It's still glowing blue, but it seems a little darker than before. Is that just my imagination? But the main thing is that it's still blue. Blue is good. Anything else is bad. I rest my hands on my belly. Are you okay, little one? I say softly. Don't worry. Mommy's not going to let anything happen to you. I will fight like a fucking she-wolf to keep these idiots from doing anything to my baby. And if I'm a she-wolf, that makes Tarak the goddamn Papa Wolf, and he's a hundred times more scary than me. My little monster flutters reassuringly. She seems to be a very active kind of child. That's good, because it means she's going to keep Daddy on his toes. Don't worry, baby, I coo. Daddy's coming for us. I don't know where the hell we are right now, or how he's supposed to find us, but I know he will. He's got an entire freaking high-tech Cordolian army at his disposal. They think they can get away with anything, but these Syncorp idiots don't stand a chance. My idle thought catches me off guard, and a soft, ironic laugh escapes me. It's almost as if I'm starting to think like a Cordolian. I will have to be very mindful about teaching our child proper earth manners. I glance around the room, taking in my surroundings. I'm sitting on a bed covered in white linens, and there's a small sofa against the opposite wall. Beside the bed is a trolley with a whole bunch of medical monitoring equipment on it, and on the cold floor is a dull gray rug. There's no color in here, no personality. It's sterile and stale, and it feels a bit like a jail cell. There aren't any windows, either, and even though I can't see any monitoring devices, I'm sure they're watching me. There are two doors opposite me. I slide off the bed and try the first door. It slides open. Great, a bathroom. I try the second door, which is obviously the exit. Predictably, it's locked. Punching the panel beside it doesn't do anything, and attempting to pry it open with my fingertips doesn't help. I'm effectively a prisoner in here. I can suspect what they want to do, 
They want me to carry the baby to term and then take her from me, to fulfill some sort of dark Syncorp agenda. Cold anger rushes through me. Who do these people think they are? Sighing, I lie back on the bed and close my eyes. My stomach rumbles, reminding me I haven't even had breakfast yet. All I can do is wait. Someone's going to come along sooner or later, and until then, I need to rest. At thirty-four weeks pregnant, even if I did manage to escape, what am I going to do then? Duck waddle out of a highly guarded corporate facility? It's too risky. I'm going to have to sit this one out and wait for Tarak and his cavalry to come. I put my hands behind my head and try to relax. I fall in and out of sleep as my little one moves about. Then I hear it. It's so faint, I'm not even sure it's real. Music. It sounds like ancient music from an old-fashioned piano. My eyes flutter open. As I look around, searching for the source, the sound disappears. Maybe I was just imagining it. I close my eyes, and there's the sound again. I only catch snippets of it, and it's nothing I recognize. But it's amazingly soothing. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's helping me to relax. I'm about to fall asleep when the main doors slide open and Lorelei appears, with a man in a dark suit. I sit up, fixing my gown. The man looks at me with cold gray eyes that remind me of a dead fish. This is the mother of the hybrid? he asks, looking at some information on a data pad. That's right. Based on scan data, she's thirty-four plus two. Apart from the fetus being a bit large for gestational age— the pregnancy is progressing no differently to a normal human pregnancy, and there are no complications so far. We're expecting a normal delivery. Very good. The man glances at me as if I'm an animal in a zoo. Although his face appears young and unlined, his hair is streaked through with gray. His suit is charcoal gray and expensive-looking, trimmed with cufflinks that look like rare gentian blue metal. I resent the fact that they're talking about me right in front of me, as if I'm just another statistic. I think of something snarky to say, but instead settle for a venomous glare as Lorelai finally acknowledges me. Do you understand, Miss Kendricks? You're to stay here until the birth of the child. If you cooperate, you won't be harmed. I say nothing. The man looks me up and down with detached curiosity, but remains silent. Lorelei tries to interpret my silence. Look, she says, attempting to inject some warmth into her voice. I know this whole situation seems harsh, but we don't have any ill intentions towards you. We just want what's best for you and your child. But at the same time... The work we're doing here might potentially save the human race. I raise my eyebrows, unimpressed. The last time I checked, the human race didn't exactly need saving. A snippet of piano music filters through my mind. I look back at Lorelei and the creepy man, wondering if they can hear the music too. They don't seem to be responding in any way. Little Monster goes still. I've noticed she does that whenever it plays. Is it possible she can hear it? Is that all, then? My voice is cold. Do me a favor and spare me the bullshit. We all know I'm here because you had your eyes on my child's genetic material from the start. I'm surprised you would go to this extent but for your own sake, you should really give up and let me go now. Lorelei presses her lips together in a grim smile. I'm sorry, but your alien lover won't be coming for you. This facility is impossible to locate. You call yourself an alien specialist, but you don't know the first thing about Cordolians, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. I caress my belly as the music continues to play. 
a strange sense of calmness has come over me. In my experience, Cordolians display a few interesting traits. One, they never give up until they get what they want. Two, they have a vicious mean streak when provoked. Three, they're insanely protective, and they really, really hate it when you take what belongs to them. Lorelei and the creepy man stare at me, not seeming to comprehend anything I've just said. I roll my eyes. Whatever. Don't say I didn't warn you. Tarak A storm has blanketed the ocean, whipping the water below into giant waves. Dark shadow hovers just below the cloud line, giving me a good view of the water as I stare through a lower hatch at the sea below. The temperature has dropped, but I find this biting cold most welcome after having to endure the blazing desert sun. The thick cloud cover above filters the sunlight, casting the world below in tones of dark blue and gray. We have entered a fierce, unrelenting environment. It feels like Kithia. I watch the waves as they form impressive crests, showcasing the power of nature on this planet. There's not a single human structure or vessel in sight, even though the last known trace from the drone camera I caught on Nova Terra has led us here, to this patch of wild ocean. The signal from Abby's Harmony Star also showed she was heading in this direction before it went out of range. She has to be here. I just can't understand how or why they would take her to a place like this. Ziara appears behind me. The signal's back, she says as I turn. The Harmony Star? The baby's fine. Ziara stares down through the hatch, the wind whipping at her lilac hair. That means Abby's fine. Relief surges through me, tempering the rage that has been with me ever since we left the desert. But if the trace is being picked up, why can't I see anything but rough seas below? I turn towards the medic, my eyes narrowing. What is the exact location of your trace, Ziara? Straight down. Down there? There's nothing down there. Our surveillance units haven't picked up anything except for the swell of the waves and the biting wind. There's been no sign of human activity at all. I stare at the ocean for a while, watching the angry, white-tipped swells of the giant waves. Perhaps this was what the endless, frozen seas of Kithia were like before the dark planet star died. I can't pinpoint it any further. My monitor tells me she's right here below us, but beyond that, I can't give you specifics. The wind howls, rushing through the lower deck. In the distance, electrical discharge falls from the sky, followed by a loud bang. I clench my fist. My mate and my unborn child are nearby, and yet I have no idea where to look. Where are you, my love? The solution seems terribly obvious, but anger is blinding me to it. I close my eyes, listening to the roar of the ocean. This place is wild and brutal and beautiful. It's the first environment on Earth that's made me feel truly at home. She's below us, I say, opening my eyes again, meeting Ziara's orange stare. Beneath the waves. How is that possible? It's not done on Kithia, but on many aquatic planets there are colonies beneath the oceans. Do you remember Sorquath? The ocean planet? It was an aborted mission. Do you know why it was called off? Something about too much water? Ziara frowns. I was too busy at the time to take much notice of it. 
it was deemed to be of too little value to conquer. Sorquath is an aqua planet. There isn't any land there. It's been this way ever since their nearest star expanded and melted all the oceanic ice, forcing the Sorquath people to build contained underwater civilizations. Perhaps the humans have done the same. That seems like a bit of a stretch. Humans don't appear to be that technologically advanced. There's another species that used to build underwater colonies, before we took over their home planet. Ziara's eyes widen. Ifkin? I nod. But since our invasion forced them to flee to Kelador, we thought the tradition had been lost. I pull the hatch closed, rising to my full height. I need to know what's down there. I'm going in. Isn't there a better way to do it? Not with the equipment we have. Trust me, it's easier this way. You don't know what kinds of creatures might be down there. I laugh grimly. <laughs> I doubt anything down there would be more dangerous than a lamb perk. I don't fear the stormy waters of this earth ocean. On Kithia, I used to freedive in the dark waters beneath the ice sheets of the Val. It was part of my training, when I was the sole member of the First Division. That was a long time ago. Since then, everything has changed. Ziara looks at me dubiously, but holds her tongue. I gesture for her to follow me up the ramp, heading towards the upper decks. I'm not going to waste any time fucking about, Ziara. If my mate is down there somewhere, I need to find her. I try to roll the stiffness out of my neck as I pass into the weapons hold. The plasma protein infusion Ziara has given me has restored the nanites to their resting state and replenished my energy. I select a few weapons from the rack, including my favored twin Calidum blades, the simple weapons are old-fashioned, but they have a few advantages. There's no risk of malfunction after water exposure, and they're good for close-quarters fighting. I take one into my hand, testing its weight and balance. It feels good. I feel ready to fight. It's time to take back what is mine. Chapter 15 Abby. I fall asleep to snippets of strange piano music and wake to the sound of the door swooshing open. A large server bot greets me, completely blocking the doorway. It's a square metallic thing designed to store and process food. I briefly wonder whether I could somehow push the thing out of the way and escape, but against a robot of that size and power, I don't think I have much of a chance, especially in my current state, and I'm not about to do anything that might put my baby at risk. Patient C-3105, lunch is served. Please take your food. Great. So I'm reduced to being referred to as a number now? A metal tray pops out on an extending shelf. There are various covered containers on it, and an unappetizing, meaty smell fills the room. The bot is a workhorse. It's clearly designed for mass service, making me wonder how many other patients are holed up in this facility. As I take the tray, the server bot rolls backwards, the doors to my room sliding closed at the same time, leaving no window for escape. Even though the food smells like hyper-processed crap, my stomach growls. I'm starving. Gingerly, I peel off the lids of the containers and find recombinant everything. There's some kind of brownish meat substance, a mix that could pass for mashed carrots if one was really being imaginative, and a perfectly round, recombinant egg. None of this stuff came from the earth itself. It's all been grown in a lab somewhere. It's not my favorite, but I can deal with recombinant food. 
I spent twelve months on a floating asteroid mining station, after all. And I need to eat. The baby needs nutrition. So I force myself to eat, washing everything down with a thick, milky drink that tastes a bit like soy yogurt. That last one wasn't so bad, actually. Having finished my lunch, I lie back on the bed with a full stomach. It's become a little chilly in here, so I draw the blanket over myself. There's no hollow screen in here, no data pad, no connectivity to the network, nothing. If not for the faint snippets of music filtering through to me, I might be at risk of death from boredom. With nothing else to do, I close my eyes and try to visualize my child. Although we've seen her on the scans, I have no idea what she's really going to look like when she's finally out. Will she have red eyes, or green, or a mixture of both? Will she eventually have horns or fangs? Will her skin be human-colored, or cordolian-colored, or a combination of both? I can't wait to find out. After some time, the doors slide open again, revealing Lorelei and an assistant, a kid who looks to be in his early twenties, pushing a trolley laden with medical equipment. They're both wearing white lab coats with a Syncorp logo embroidered on the pocket. Time for a checkup, she announces. The kid pulls out a tray and starts assembling a blood-collecting device. Lorelai switches on a bedside scanning device. Let's have a look. Lift up your gown. I give her a dark look before lifting the gown to expose my belly, leaving my lower half covered by the blanket. The Harmony Star is glowing gently, but again, it seems to be a darker shade of blue than before. Lorelai stares at it, her expression full of barely disgusted contempt. What is that? None of your business, I reply. She shrugs. Move your hand. She sticks a bunch of electrodes on my stomach. They're cold and sticky. In her hands is a monitoring device with a hollow screen. It flares to life, showing me the outline of a healthy baby. The detail it picks up is astounding. The hybrid is doing well, she comments, as the kid starts to enter information into a data pad. Development is as expected for this stage of gestation. Normal fetal heart rate. Size within normal parameters. If I didn't know about her history, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between this fetus and a human one. Her eyes flick to the Harmony Star. That's an interesting tattoo, she comments, trying again. Or is it one of those new cosmetic implants? None of your business, I growl. I'm not in the mood to discuss Cordolian medical technology with her. They might try to steal that, too. The kid pulls on some gloves and moves to my side. Miss Kendricks, I'm just going to take a blood sample now. Please relax. What's this for? I ask suspiciously. Blood typing, Lorelai says. And some extra tests they weren't able to do at the hospital. What kind of tests? You've been intimate with an alien, Abby. Her nose twists slightly, as if the notion is somehow distasteful. You could have caught a transmissible disease, or be harboring antibodies we're not familiar with on Earth. The kid pulls a tourniquet around my upper arm. A little sting now. His hands are surprisingly gentle, but when I look up into his dark eyes, I see only the cold look of a professional. Whatever they're doing here, he's totally into it. He's blindly indoctrinated, just like Lorelai. The blood taker guides its needle towards my veins. There's a sharp prick as it slides underneath my skin, withdrawing a thin red stream of blood. The kid withdraws a cartridge and inserts it into his machine for instant analysis. I can't hold back my curiosity any longer. Why are you people doing this? What you're doing here goes far beyond the boundaries of medical ethics. Lorelai nods. 
I can understand where you're coming from, Abby. She frowns. I had a look at your background. You're quite impressive, graduating near the top of your class with a Bachelor of Biotechnical Science from Telluria University. She raises her eyebrows. First class honors, too. Add to that one year's experience as a biological scientist in a highly sought-after mining station posting. Of course, that was before Fortuna Tau was destroyed. But with that education, you should at least be able to understand basic evolutionary theory. I keep quiet, not entirely sure where she's going with this. Survival of the fittest, Lorelai continues. Since the universe was opened to us, we've quickly come to realize that in the grand scheme of things, we humans aren't the strongest or the fittest species out there. Look at your Cordolians, for instance. They have superior strength, speed, hearing, and night vision. Some alien species have telepathy at their disposal. Some, dare I say it, have superior intelligence. Others, because of their unique physiology, are able to fly. The kid nods in agreement, transfixed by her little speech. If I didn't know better, I might think he has a bit of a thing for the good doctor. Now, imagine if we were able to integrate some of these evolutionary advantages into the human genome. Our species would have a much better chance of survival in this new age. That is why your child is so critical to our research. This is the first known example of successful human-alien DNA integration, and it's occurred naturally, outside of a lab. There's no way we were going to let this slip through our grasp. I'm sorry, but you just happened to pick the wrong partner, in the wrong place, at the wrong time, and now your child has the most valuable DNA on Earth. When it comes to the survival of the human race, the ethics become skewed. We're talking about our entire species here, Abby. We must choose the greater good over the life of one individual. I stare at her, trying to process what she's just told me. You're just stirring up a big old hornet's nest, you know. Please let me go. As I've told you before, this is a really, really bad idea. I watch the hollow screen, looking at my child watching the pulse of her beating heart, admiring the delicate features of her beautiful face. She brings a thumb to her mouth and starts to suck on it, oblivious to our bizarre conversation. How can they reduce such a beautiful life down to the value of its DNA? With time, you will come to accept that what we're doing is right. After the baby is born, we will help with the psychological rehabilitation. Lorelei pulls the electrodes off my stomach, and the image of my baby disappears. You know, I say slowly, you're a bit of a hypocrite, aren't you? Excuse me? Advocating war one minute and the survival of the human race the next? I shake my head sadly. I'll ask you one last time. Please let me go. They both look at me with pity in their eyes, as if I'm the one who's deluded. As if on cue, the music starts up again. This time, it strings. I close my eyes and let it surround me. It really does help keep me calm in this terrible situation. I need to stay calm until he arrives. Acting rashly now might put my baby at risk. I incline my head. Do you guys hear that? What? The music. Lorelei raises her eyebrows in surprise. You can hear it? That's interesting. She waves her hand dismissively. That's Noah, your next-door neighbor. From time to time, she transmits. I stare at her blankly. She's a telepath. Not everyone can pick up her projections. I'm actually surprised that you can. Just ignore them. If they're annoying you, I can have her move to another room. No, I blurt, a little too quickly, masking my surprise. A telepath? I'd always thought telepathy was mystical bullshit, 
made up by certain folks who were content to cash in on their supposed mind-reading abilities. I shake my head. Leave her where she is. It's not bothering me. I pull down my gown and lie back, closing my eyes. I descend into a state of tranquil calm. It's weird. Usually I'd be freaking out in such a situation. But what can I do right now? I don't want to get sedated again. I lay my hand on my belly, feeling at one with my child. Don't worry, little one. Daddy's coming. Tarak I plunge into the depths of the ocean, each powerful kick sending me deeper. Beneath the wild surface, everything is serene. The water is cold, and down here, everything is silent. Small silver creatures swim past me in a giant cloud, parting as I move through them. As I swim deeper, I see a huge black and gray creature with a fan-like tail. It dwarfs me, propelling itself forward with powerful strokes of its broad tail. For once in my life I feel slightly insignificant. I pause for a moment, wondering if it is going to attack, but it simply cruises past, oblivious to my presence. Through my visor I can see a plateau of land that rises up sharply from the dark depths. I kick my legs, fighting the powerful undersea currents that would otherwise sweep me away. Jural and Nitian catch up to me, a plume of bubbles rising from their breathing apparatuses. I point towards a flat grey structure rising out of the plateau. It's an unnatural structure, all straight angles and lines, built in the utilitarian human fashion. So the humans are trying to hide underwater. Did they think a little bit of water could keep me from finding them? We swim towards the structure, moving against the current, our movements enhanced by our nanosuits. Strapped to my back are my twin swords and a small oxygen concentrator that's connected to a respirator. My soldiers are similarly armed and equipped, along with a cache of small explosives and several small daggers. Even though it's just the three of us, I am not worried. Once we find a way into the facility... The odds will be stacked against the humans. I study the collection of buildings, surprised that such an extensive facility exists beneath the waves. It was obviously built with one purpose in mind. To hide. A terrible anger rips through me. If they have done anything to harm my mate or my child, I do not know what I will do. I really don't. I stop and hold up my hand, observing the facility from afar. Jeral and Nithian come to a halt beside me. I make a signal with my hand. Wait. We hang there for some time, until a small submersible vessel appears from an opening at the end of one of the structures. The tubular craft rises slowly at an angle propelled by a spinning blade at the back. I signal for them to swim towards it as it rises. As we reach it, we latch onto the side. Wait. Once again, I signal to them. The craft moves upwards, drifting towards the surface. I look down the length of its long gray hull, searching for an opening. There's a hatch at the top. I point to it and start to swim towards it, my two soldiers flanking me. The craft is drifting slowly, so we have no problem reaching the hatch. I don't know what material this vessel is constructed from, but it's not calidum. Therefore, it should be easy to break into. As we reach the hatch, I signal Gerald to attach an explosive to it. He removes one of the small fission detonators from his belt and slaps it on the hatch. He holds up three fingers. We drop off to the side, sheltering behind the metal body of the submersible. 
A dull thud is all we hear as the roof of the vessel blows out. Once it's clear, we rise back up to the hatch. It is partially imploded, leaving a breach large enough to enter through. Water is being sucked in. I enter first, dropping into the craft through a hole surrounded by twisted metal. Water is streaming in through the hole, flooding the chamber. A red light flashes somewhere above me, and a screeching alarm goes off. My two soldiers slip in behind me. Mindful of the flooding cabin, we keep our respirators on. Two humans appear on our path, shock and fear twisting their features. When they see us, they yell at each other in some incomprehensible human language. One of them has a gun. He raises it at us, but Jeral is already behind him, twisting his arms behind his back. The man gasps and drops the gun. He screams in his language, but none of us can understand what he's saying. Silence! I snap in universal, my voice slightly distorted by the respirator. Take us to your captain. He starts to struggle. I pull out a short dagger, letting it rest in my palm. Go now, if you want to live. His companion, an older, heavy-set man, looks at the flooding water with trepidation. I need to try and fix that, he shouts above the roar of the water. Otherwise, we're all going to drown. I ignore him, dismissing him. He is unarmed, and therefore not a threat. The water is up to our ankles now. I nod towards the other human. Show us the way. The human hesitates. A loud, low-pitched groaning sound echoes through the vessel as it begins to turn. Now, human! I stalk towards him as Gerald twists his arm, making him grunt in pain. I'm losing patience! The color is drained from this man's face. Reluctantly, he turns having to lift his feet as we wade through water that's now up to our mid-calves. He leads us down a narrow corridor. At the end is a door that appears to be sealed. Water laps against it, but doesn't seep through. The human glares at us defiantly. You can't open it, he snarls. It's locked from the inside. Nithian, I nod towards my man. Blow it. He pulls another detonator off his belt and sticks it to the door. We stride back down the corridor, counting to three as we duck for cover. The sound of the explosion in these close quarters is deafening. Human screams echo from inside the room. We return the way we came. Gerald drops the human, as we no longer have need for him. The water has almost reached our knees now. And as we pass into the control room, the water follows us, swirling across the floor. The incessant alarm is still going off, each blast of sound an assault on my sensitive hearing. We've entered some kind of navigation chamber, which is full of panicking humans. Several of them are frantically manipulating various controls. There is a large window at the front, revealing the serene, mysterious ocean. Silver swimming creatures dart by, oblivious to the chaos inside this small human vessel. My attention is drawn to one man, who is standing beside a large domed front screen. His arm is outstretched, pointing towards the underwater facility. He's shouting at another man in his human language. It looks like he's ordering him to take the craft back to base. The man giving the commands is dressed differently to the others. Whereas the workers wear standard-looking utility uniforms, the shouting man wears a civilian suit, setting him apart from the others. I'm guessing he's the one who holds the authority around here. As we enter the chamber, all the humans turn and stare at us in shock. Two males pull out guns and point them at us. You won't harm us with those, I say loudly, over the infernal alarms and the rushing water. Jeral and Nithian approach them with the intent to disarm. One of the men shoots Jeral in the chest, but the shot deflects off Jeral's exo-armor. Jeral stops, grunts, and shakes off the impact. 
Who the hell are you? The man in the suit glares at me, his eyes bulging in outrage. Water is pooling around his legs, but he doesn't seem to realize it. I loom over him, staring down into his gray eyes. Your people have taken something that belongs to me. His eyes widen in fearful recognition, but he wisely says nothing. Tell your people to take this vessel back to the facility, I order. He shoots me a dark look, yells something to his subordinates, then turns back to me. You have no idea who you're messing with, alien. Your precious little treaty with the Federation won't stand when news of this gets out. The water is up to mid-thigh now. It doesn't bother me, but the humans are starting to become increasingly panicked. This little human's arrogant tone infuriates me. He dares to speak this way when his people have taken my mate? Unable to contain myself, my hand shoots out, encircling his neck. Where is she? I snarl as he grabs my arm with both hands, trying to claw at me. Get your fucking hand off me, he splutters. You have no idea who I am. I can make life very miserable for your people on Earth. I squeeze harder. Where is she? He wheezes and gasps. She's inside. We haven't done anything to her. We just need the child. That was the wrong thing to say to me. I squeeze even harder, and the expression in his eyes finally turns to naked fear. His eyes begin to roll upwards. Stop it! He splutters and chokes, frantically trying to grab my arm. You can't do this to me! I'm the fucking president of this corporation! I hold him there for a moment, savoring his suffering. I want to kill him now, but I haven't found Abby yet, and I need these humans to guide this vessel back to the facility. If I kill their leader, they will panic. So I drop him. He falls into the rising water. His suit is drenched, and he's shaking. He glares at me with pure hatred in his eyes as we come to the edge of the underwater facility. A large door slides open, revealing a water-filled chamber inside. It's a pressure lock. The vessel floats into the chamber, and the external doors close slowly, sealing off the space. Once they're shut, the water outside soon starts to drain away, leaving the vessel dry and mounted in its dock. However, the water inside the craft remains. It's up to about chest high now, but it's stopped rising. The humans all look visibly relieved. I grab the leader of the humans, bringing my dagger to his throat. President, you say? Fuck you, non-human! I laugh coldly. Is that supposed to intimidate me? Come. I drag him through the cold water as we return to the exit. You will show us the way. And when my mate is safe and secure, I will make him pay. Chapter 16 Abby After Lorelei leaves, I settle back into bed, closing my eyes and thinking of Tarak, wishing he was here beside me. I drift off to sleep for a little while, but I'm woken by a strange feeling. Little Monster has become unusually still, and the music has dropped off. Everything is eerily silent. Ever since I've arrived in this strange place, I've been calm because I know he's going to come for me. My belief in him is unshakable. But as time goes on and I'm left alone with my thoughts, a terrible sliver of doubt enters my mind. 
What if he's not coming? What if Lorelai's right, and this place is impossible for him to find? I shake my head, curling my arms around myself. No way. Annoyed with myself, I push the stupid thoughts from my mind. This sucks, doesn't it, little monster? This isn't like her. She's not moving at all. Something doesn't feel right. Slowly, I pull up my gown, fighting a rising sense of dread. I look down at my belly. What's happening, girl? The Harmony Star is glowing, but it's no longer blue. It's turned a dusky shade of purple. No! I gasp. Don't do this. Not now. She was just fine before. How could this have happened so quickly? Its soft light pulses, and as I stare at it in horror, it slowly turns from purple to pink. Dread fills me. This can't be happening. I look around the room for an emergency call panel, but I don't see anything useful. Frantically, I bang on the door. Hey! I bang the door so hard, pain shoots through my fists. I look up to the ceiling in desperation, hoping there's a surveillance device up there. Lorelai, if you're there, you need to fucking come down here right now. I feel my little one shift around, and crazy, intense relief courses through me at the thought that at the very least she's still alive. But something's definitely wrong. Her movements are reduced, and they feel much weaker. Hang on, darling, I whisper as I pound my fist into the door, trying to attract attention. Hey! I scream, my voice cracking. Get your ass in here now, Lorelai! I scan the room, looking for something I can use to make noise. I'm going to cause chaos in here until someone pays attention to me. I pick up my used lunch tray, cutlery, and containers clattering to the floor as I bang it against the metal door. Metal clashes loudly against metal making an almighty racket. That was the effect I was after, to make some noise. Hey! I swing the tray again, preparing to smash it against the door. The door slides open, revealing Lorelai and her assistant. Lorelai ducks under the arc of my swing as the tray flies out of my hands and hits her assistant in the chest. He doubles back, yelping in pain and surprise. Seeing them, with their blank faces and pristine lab coats, has just rekindled my anger. You stupid idiots! Stick a pregnant woman in a box with no emergency call panel? I rage. Her assistant is gasping, and Lorelai is staring at me in shock. What's this all about, Abby? You need to calm down. Something's wrong. She's not moving as much, and the Harmony Star's turning red. Harmony Star? I shake my head. There's something wrong with my baby, Doctor. You need to do something about it. Your pregnancy is extremely low risk. I'm sure that... At that point, I double over, clutching my belly as a terrible, cramping pain rips through me. The Doctor's demeanor changes, and all of a sudden, she's rushing to my side, helping me into bed. Nick, get the monitor, she snaps. Yes, ma'am. Clutching his chest and wincing in pain, the assistant dashes out of the room. Lorelai lifts my gown and places her cold hands on my belly, examining me. Are you tender? I nod, wincing as she applies slight pressure. What's happening, Lorelai? Until we scan you, I can't tell for sure. She frowns, her red lips pressing together in a thin line. Moments later, Nick returns, the monitor in his hands. They hook me up without any explanation. I hear the words, Abrupt day placentio, as my vision swims, clouded by blackness that fades in and out. The pain is coming in constant waves now, and my palms have become clammy. I'm starting to feel lightheaded. The most beautiful music I've ever heard starts to play in my mind. It's ancient and serene, and for a moment, I close my eyes. I can't believe this is happening. My baby flutters about, 
her movements weak. Some deep, innate instinct tells me we need to get her out. I know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. Otherwise, all will be lost. You need to deliver her, I tell them, as I open my eyes to stare at Lorelei. Her face has gone pale. I don't know what's wrong, but she needs to come out now. I agree. She's looking at the data pad of her monitor. Whatever it's showing, she's chosen not to bring it up on the hollow screen. Your placenta has detached from the wall of the uterus. The baby will die if we don't do an emergency cesarean right now. Then fucking do it, I grit through clenched teeth as another wave of pain crashes through me. I have to inform you that there's a chance you might not survive. I grip Lorelei's wrist, anger giving me strength. Even if I see her as an enemy, I need her to be my child's ally right now. Save my baby first, I implore her. Worry about me later. My child must survive at all costs. Call through to the OR and tell them to prepare for an emergency C-section, Lorelei instructs Nick. He activates his calm and calls through. No one's answering, he says, looking bemused. Run ahead and check, the doctor orders. Make the necessary preparations. We need to get her in there now. As Nick rushes out the door, an ear-splitting alarm goes off. What now? I groan, as Lorelai starts to stick leads and wires all over me. She places something around my arm. This bot is going to put an IV in you. The pain is becoming excruciating. My vision goes dark then light, then dark. The music is the only thing grounding me right now. I wonder if it's even real, or if I'm going crazy. Code Black, a detached female voice calls out over some hidden speaker. This is a Code Black. All personnel find the nearest evacuation point and prepare to enter your pod. What's a Code Black? I ask weakly, as another spasm of pain grips me. Fuck! Lorelai swears, her composure finally cracking in a big way. It's a major security breach! A terrorist attack! She looks at me, then at the exit, then back at me. Through the haze of pain, I manage a grin. It's crazy to smile right now but I'm feeling triumphant. Because I know there's only one reason the secret medical facility would be on a code black alert. One big, bad, silver and fanged reason. What are you going to do, Dr. Asher? I grip her wrist more tightly, forcing her to look at me. You see, I think, no, I know my mate is here and I can tell you right now that he will be beyond furious. The only way you will survive is if you save the lives of both me and my child. Lorelai shakes her head in disbelief. There's no way that... Nick appears in the doorway, panic distorting his features. He clutches his chest and coughs. The OR is off limits, he cries, his voice high-pitched and breathless. They've smoked the place out. There's fighting going on. I don't know what the hell's happening out there, but it's a bloodbath. All the staff are gone. We have to get out of here. Uh huh. I cry out as savage pain rips through me. I fight it, never once releasing the doctor from my grip. What's it going to be, doctor? Because if you leave now, you're a dead woman. If anything happens to me, he's going to hunt you down and kill you. She looks me over, clearly torn. I need to operate, but without access to an operating room and the right equipment, your chances of survival are extremely low. And there will be no anesthetic. She shakes her head. I can give you painkillers, but I can't do the... You can, I say. You most definitely can because I am not going to let my baby die, so stop wasting time and do it. 
You know what this potentially means for you, right? Are you sure you want to do this, Abby? Do it! The doctor gives me a long, hard stare, then nods. Nick, she says, go to the supply room next door and get me a pair of sterile gloves, a laser scalpel, all the synthetic O-negative you can find, every vial of neuronal in there, a sterilizer node, a bio-barrier, coagulant gel, tissue glue, and an infant recess kit. Then get your ass back here as quickly as you can and lock the doors. We're going to get this baby out. It's been decided. From here on in, I can only trust our lives to fate. I pray that Tarek gets here soon. Now, more than ever, I need him. Tarak. I look behind me as we walk down the empty corridor, my hand on the back of the president's neck. He moves stiffly, resenting my control. In front of me, Jeral and Nithian walk slowly, their swords drawn. We have explosive devices, but no plasma-based weapons, as the exposure to water would have put them at risk of malfunctioning. Our respirators hang around our necks, replaced by standard protective visors. On the surface, the facility looks relatively normal, but we pass many closed doors. The rooms are all windowless. There is a strange smell in the air. It is the smell of blood and fear and suffering. It's a smell I know all too well, as it reminds me of the secret Cordolian medical facility where I spent the better part of my adolescence. Ah! The human in front of me cries out, and I realize I'm squeezing his neck too hard. Anger has gotten the better of me. How dare they take my mate to a despicable place like this? And how could I have allowed this to happen? What exactly is the purpose of this facility, human? That's classified. I squeeze his neck again, making him scream. Then unclassify it, President. It's a research facility, he says, thinking he can get away with not offering any more information. He is testing my patience. It stinks of death. I say quietly. And here I thought humans were such a benign, clueless species. If Abby has been harmed in any way, I will paint the walls with their blood. We come to a junction. From here, the corridor branches off in two directions. In front is a large, empty room lined with beds and monitoring equipment. Attached to the beds... Are restraints. Which way, human? Left, the man answers in a monotonous voice. The human women stay in the southern wing. As we move down the corridor, a squad of armed human guards appears in front of us. By my count, there are about ten of them. I look behind and see a similar number coming up the back of the corridor, effectively trapping us from both ends. Accompanying them are a group of six Ifkin. The pale-skinned, blue-eyed Ifkin hiss at us, chattering in their strange tongue. They hold plasma guns in their dominant arms, and in their lower arms they clutch small, round devices. More of their noxious smoke bombs, perhaps. All of the humans are wearing respirators, and they raise their guns at us as we approach. In their hands are Cordolian-made plasma guns. How, in Cain's name, did they get their hands on those? In the background, a shrill alarm goes off, a sure sign the humans are panicking. You are a fool to deal with the Ifkin, I snarl at the humans. They will betray you in a heartbeat. The president raises his head his eyes full of anger and disbelief as he stares back at his own people. What the hell do you think you're doing, guards? 
A note of panic enters his voice. Can't you see that they've taken me hostage? Lower your weapons right now! One of the humans steps forward. I'm sorry, President Tremaine, but the board has voted for us to take extraordinary measures to secure the facility. Tremaine's eyes bulge. This is my company, Mercer! You will not fire until my safety has been assured. You and your men will stand down, and that's an order. Under his mask, the human soldier's dark eyes are cold. I'm sorry, President, but the board's decision overrides yours. We must consider the future of the company over the welfare of one individual. Fuck the board, Tremaine shouts, becoming increasingly desperate. Stand down right now, Mercer! I have had enough of this time-wasting. I need to reach Abby. I push Tremaine aside. He falls to the floor. You... you can't do this! He splutters, terrified. He knows he'll be caught in the crossfire. As the humans prepare to fire, I make small signals to Jeral and Nithian with my hand. They both extend two fingers... "'acknowledging that they understand. "'I will take the front. "'Jeral and Nithian will deal with the humans at the back, "'along with the Ifkin. "'We have to move fast. "'Our Kalidim exo-armor can take full plasma hits, "'but not too many. "'But humans aren't very physically strong. "'They will get one shot off, "'and then the recoil will throw them to the floor. "'The three of us tense, "'and then we charge, swords drawn.' The humans fire, and then the Ifkin release their smoke bombs, blanketing the area in a thick white haze. A plasma bolt hits me straight in the chest. It knocks me to the ground. I feel as if I've been punched in the sternum. Ignoring the pain, I jump to my feet and push forward. Around me, blue bolts streak past, turning the walls into rubble. Each shot fired has a massive recoil, sending the humans crashing backwards. The humans are all shouting amongst themselves in their own language. I use the smoke and the chaos to my advantage, moving by sound more than sight. Humans are clumsy and slow, and my calidum blades slice through flesh and bone and sinew with barely any resistance. They will not stand between me and my mate. They fall, one by one, and my armor becomes slick with their crimson blood. The nanites will slowly absorb it, using it to restore themselves to their resting state. As I deal with the rest of the humans, I start to run, passing down a long, brightly lit corridor. Visibility improves as the smoke begins to clear. There are signs all over the place, but they're written in human script, and I can't understand any of it. I come to another junction, deciding to turn right. I pass into another corridor, growling in frustration. Everything around me looks the same. All around me are closed doors. Abby could be in any one of them. I curse. I choose the one closest to me and try to open it by pressing my palm on the entry panel. No response. Using the old tried and tested trick, I stab my blade through the panel, and it explodes in a shower of sparks. The door slides open. I peer inside and see an ordinary room. A holding cell of sorts. Inside, a winged, avian female stares up at me fearfully, backing into a corner. Dressings cover her arms and legs, and one portion of her wings has been stripped of all its plumage. She cowers and whimpers in fear. I turn on my heel and stride out. I try the next room and find a human male lying on the bed, attached to all kinds of medical lines and monitors. He stares at me in shock, but he appears unable to move. I move on. In the next room, there is a Soldar male. He cries out as I appear. His gray scales are dull, lacking their usual shine. There are patches all over his body where his scales have fallen out, "'revealing raw skin underneath. "'An angry growl escapes me. "'These deranged humans have been keeping these aliens for research. 
they are no different to the Cordolians whose ways I rejected when I left Kithia. The Soldar misinterprets my anger, crawling into a corner, his green eyes wide with fear. Go, Soldar, I tell him, gesturing towards the open door. I am not one of them. I move on, looking in every room, finding more and more terrified aliens. Abby is nowhere to be found. A terrible rage is building inside me. The longer I am without her, the more desperate I become. And now that I've seen what they do in this facility, I am full of fear. If they have harmed her, I will lose my sanity. I come to the last door in this wing. I destroy the entry panel, and the door opens to reveal an empty room. There's nothing and no one inside. Cursing loudly and Cordolian, I run back to the junction and take the other route. That's when I hear it. Her scream. The sound tears into me, touching the very essence of my being. It reaches into the depths of my soul and rips out a fury so dark and savage that I am no longer capable of rational thought. I run towards the sound, forgetting all reason. My mate is hurt. Someone is harming her, and I must protect her. Unacceptable. The situation is unacceptable. Whoever is responsible for this is going to die. Chapter 17 Abby I'm floating in and out of consciousness, doped up on something called Neuronol, which Nick has injected into an intravenous drip. It's not an anesthesia, but it's the next best thing. Lorelei has set up makeshift drapes all around me, and I'm hooked up to various monitors. One of them shows my baby. She's gone completely still. Hurry up, I slur, as Lorelei prepares her equipment. Get her out of there. Please be alive, my precious little darling. The doctor meets my gaze, her face hidden behind a surgical mask. I'm going to go ahead and make the incision now. There will be pain. You need to hold on. I clench my teeth and nod, bracing for it. This is about to get messy. Here we go. Lorelei fires up the laser scalpel. The next thing I know, searing pain is cutting through the neuronal fog. I scream. The pain is worse than anything I've experienced before. Even worse than when I was lying mangled on the floor in Fortuna Tau, with my legs smashed to bits. I close my eyes, as Nick gives me a thick wad of gauze to bite on. That's when the music comes back, filling my mind with sweet relief. It's that same piano music, ancient and ethereal. It takes me into its comforting embrace. A tear slips down my cheek. Tarek, I need you. There's pressure now, along with the pain. A tearing sensation rips through my lower belly. I clamp my teeth around the wad of fabric. That's when all hell breaks loose. The pressure becomes worse and worse, the pain almost unbearable. I scream into the gauze, and just when I think I'm about to pass out, there's a popping sensation, and something breaks free. She's out, Lorelai cries. Nick, get over here. Bring the recess kit. The medical people rush about, taking my baby away from me. I look around wildly, but I can't see what they're doing. I haven't heard a cry yet. Please, sweet baby girl, please survive. That's when the doors slide open, and death walks into the room. I turn my head, my consciousness fading. I can't move. I open my mouth to speak, and everything slows down. Tarak is here. I don't know how this is possible, but I can feel his presence. 
His anger seethes like a malevolent vortex, a black hole of rage and despair. He's covered in glistening blood. He's a dark, terrifying nightmare, his obsidian exo-armor concealing his features. He raises his twin blades, turning towards Lorelei and Nick, going for the killing stroke. I cry out, but nothing comes out of my mouth. I try again, summoning all of my willpower to produce two simple words. Tarek, no! He moves forward. Death is inevitable. Time slows to a halt. Then, something pure and sweet and miraculous breaks the terrible spell. The baby cries and cries again. Tears are sliding down my cheeks. And as quickly as it came, that terrible, oppressive feeling is gone, sucked back into the depths of hell, and once again I can breathe. But I'm fading. The baby cries again, the sound lusty and strong, and a wonderful sense of relief washes over me. She's alive. Slowly, Tarek turns his helm peeling back from his face. He takes one look at me, then turns to his child, his expression a tortured mixture of grief and anger and wonder and fury. But that terrible, pervading, killing aura is gone. He lowers his swords. Lorelei is holding my baby, her gloved hands covered in blood. Most of the blood is mine. My head begins to swim. Slowly, wordlessly, she walks over to me and lowers the child onto my chest. Tarak appears at my side, his warm, ungloved hands touching my face, threading through my hair as he reaches over and cradles our child. His dark red eyes are a complex swirl of emotions— but one thing surfaces above all others. Love. I return it with all my heart, basking in its warmth as I see my child for the first time. She's the most incredible thing I've ever seen. She's alive. And I'm dying. I close my eyes, and everything turns to black. Distant shouting is all I hear. The music is gone. I don't question it anymore. I just accept it and embrace it. My baby is soft and warm against my skin, and oh so tiny. Tarek's hands are warm as they stroke my hair. Stay with me, he whispers as I slip away. Please, Stay with me, my love. Tarek She's dying. There is blood all around, and her eyes have closed. Her skin is pale, and her lips are turning blue. Do something! I roar, turning to the humans, who are staring at us in shock. I will not allow her to die! They spring into action, grabbing equipment, hooking her up to a bag of blood. My child, our child, is curling up to her mother, searching for a response. But Abby is cold and still, and for the first time in my life, I am helpless and terrified. I grasp her small, pale hand. She is so cold. She is slipping away from me as we speak. With one arm, I take my baby daughter against my chest, cradling her there as I hold her mother's hand. A sudden sound makes me turn. Ziara stands in the doorway, dressed in a waterproof skin suit, an oxygen concentrator strapped to her back. There's a bloody dagger in her hand, and her lavender hair is wet and disheveled. Her chest is heaving from exertion. She doesn't waste time, rushing to Abby's side, placing her hand on her forehead, checking the pulse at her neck, looking across at the humans and the blood-soaked mess below. They are applying something to her lower abdomen, 
trying to stem the bleeding. That's not going to work, Ziara whispers in Cordolian. She needs a miracle. What needs to be done? I ask, as the little one nestles into me, making soft, mewling, infant sounds. Ziara's expression is grim. She needs a nanograft, right now. The look she gives me is loaded with meaning. You're not suggesting— My heart grows heavy. The virus will kill her. She's on the precipice of death. Those humans can't save her. It is the only possible chance she has of survival. You must take the risk, or lose her forever. I look down at my child. She stares back at me with a pure, violet gaze. Her skin is a light silver, a perfect blend of mine and Abby's. Her hair is pale like mine, but in everything else she resembles her mother. She is a true child of the stars. With one tiny hand she reaches for Abby. A strangled cry of desperation escapes me as I hand the child to Ziara. Hold her, I say. The medic takes my child in her hands, holding her reverently as I stride over to Abby's side. The human called Asher is yelling at her assistant in their language, and they are pressing something into Abby's wounded flesh. Blood is everywhere. Move, I snarl, pushing them out of the way. The humans look up at me in disbelief. We need to resuscitate her, the medic protests. I'm not getting a heartbeat. Let us do our job or she will die. I trust my combat field medic over these humans. Ziara has pulled countless lives from the brink of death. If she says my mate needs a nanograft to survive, then she needs a nanograft. Get your hands off her, I growl my glare promising swift death to any who gets in my way. I stand over my mate, bearing my forearm. I pull my dagger from its sheath and slash across my inner arm. The nanites react, starting to draw the flesh together as soon as it has been cut. I slice my flesh again, deeper this time, going for the thick artery in the crook of my arm. Finally, I start to bleed. The black liquid runs down my arm, dripping from my fingers. I press my hand against her wounded belly. There's so much blood surrounding her. I didn't think it was possible for my tiny mate to hold so much blood in her body. The fact that she's lost this much sends a chill through me. The nanites swarm into her torn flesh, drawn to the wound. They are programmed to recognize tissue injury and inflammation, and instantly repair it. I watch them knit together muscle and blood vessels and skin. So far, it's working. I pray to the goddess that the virus that makes these particles semi-sentient will not turn on her and kill her. I reach out and place a hand on her cold forehead, trying to will some of my strength into her. Ziara appears at my side, with my child now swaddled in white cloth. She places the child at Abby's breast, and I curl my other arm around my daughter, breathing in her pure scent, surrounding her with my warmth. I kneel, placing my ear against Abby's chest, listening for any trace of life. She walks the precipice between life and the cold void of death. I turn my head and look into my child's eyes. Her luminous gaze captures me, throwing out tiny hooks that enter my heart. This tiny creature owns me, just as her mother owns me, in mind, body, and soul. I can't afford to lose Abby now. Please live, Amina. My universe is falling away. Nothing else matters. 
I need these two precious females as much as I need the air that I breathe. The little one, Ami, is watching me quietly, as if she knows some profound truth. With my head on Abby's chest, I stare at my baby. She is exquisite. I am full of joy. Yet at the same time, despair grips me. My child must know the love of her mother. For once in its wretched existence, the symbiotic black curse that dwells in my veins must do some good. I place my hand on my daughter's tiny head and close my eyes. For a while, there's nothing but silence. Then, I hear it. At first, it's so faint that I think I'm imagining things. I hear it again. Thud, thud. It's the beat of my mate's fragile human heart. It's rapid and fluttering at first. But then it steadies, becoming strong and regular. I stand, picking up on me and holding her to my chest as I put my hand on Abby's cheek, caressing her soft, delicate skin with my thumb, hoping against hope. Then she takes a huge, gasping breath, and it's the sweetest sound I have ever heard. Her eyes flutter open, and I find myself staring into depthless swirls of green and brown. My universe shifts, and everything becomes right again. Chapter 18 Abby At first, everything's blurry. I feel as if I'm floating on a cloud. My memory is hazy. There's a dull ache in my lower belly. I can barely move. Where am I? What am I doing here? Then, the face of my mate snaps into focus. The color has drained from its face, turning his skin a pale shade of gray. His eyes are wide and dark, more black than red, even though the lights all around us are bright. Worry is etched into his hard features, but as our eyes meet... His expression softens. He's kneeling beside me, holding something in the crook of his arm. It's a tiny bundle, and as he leans in, it moves. She is yours, he whispers, gently unwrapping the cloth that bind her and placing her on my chest. She's warm, and she wriggles against me. I motion to Tarak to bring me some pillows so I can prop myself up. A pleasant shiver courses through me. My arms feel like lead, but that doesn't stop me from tugging down the top half of my gown. The reaction is instinctive and automatic. I need to feel her bare skin against mine. I haven't seen her properly yet, but that doesn't matter. Touch is enough. She is small and soft, and she feels perfect. She sounds perfect, emitting soft little baby sounds. She moves around, exploring me, getting to know my feel and my smell. As Tara covers us with the swaddling cloths, her mouth finds my nipple. She latches on and begins to suckle. Holy moly, is she breastfeeding? Am I even ready for this? I'd noticed a small amount of what I'd assumed was colostrum leaking from my nipples over the past week, but I hadn't planned for all of this to happen so soon. You're early, little monster, I whisper, as I gently press my hand against her tiny back. I look up to see Tarak watching us. He wears an expression of fierce pride. I open my mouth to say something, but he leans in and captures my mouth with his, running his hands through my hair, kissing me again and again, moving up to kiss my forehead, my cheeks, 
whispering sweet, unintelligible Cordolian things in my ear. I thought I had lost you, he says softly. I shake my head slowly, wordlessly, bringing my other hand up to his cheek. I knew you would come. Always. His voice is tinged with regret and anger. I am sorry, my love. This is all my fault. I was careless. Don't be silly. His mouth opens to protest, but I put a finger to his lips, silencing him. Now is not the time for you to go on a broody male guilt trip over things that are totally not your fault. But, no buts, I growl, as my baby's suckling grows weaker, then stops. She lets out a happy little gurgling newborn sound before promptly falling asleep. You're not responsible for everything that goes wrong in the universe, General. Hmm. His gaze keeps drifting towards our little one. I will reap vengeance on any who have dared to lay a finger on you. No more killing, I say hastily, as the shadow of death crosses his face. The sound of soft voices draws my attention, and I look beyond Tarak to see Ziara squaring off with Lorelai and her assistant. Ziara is blocking the doorway, looking every inch the fierce Cordolian as she brandishes a mean-looking Calidum dagger. Her damp hair is plastered against her skull, and she's wearing a black wetsuit-type outfit. It's as if she's a different person. The calm, unflappable medic has turned into a warrior. Tarek turns and pins the humans under his gaze, singling out Lorelai. You are responsible for this human? His voice is soft and full of menace. I curl my fingers around his wrist. Tarak, no. They harmed you, he says, his tone low and dangerous. They saved our child. Their actions were stupid and misguided, but they saved our child. I don't want her first moments to be clouded by death and suffering. Please. He's silent for a moment, his face hard like stone. But as he looks back at me and the little one, his features soften. He remains like that for what seems like ages, contemplating us with incredible tenderness before rising to his feet. As he leaves my side, he brushes his fingers against mine. Lorelai and Nick are standing warily in the corner. Tarak nods at Ziara. Go and check on my females, he orders. The good doctor nods, sheathing her dagger. He moves across the room, looming over the two humans like a dark, towering thundercloud. Tarak, I warn. My voice comes out, sounding weak and croaky, as exhaustion finally overtakes me. Ziara appears at my side, a pair of sterile gloves on her hands. She starts to check me and the baby in turn, making soft cooing sounds as the little one yawns, her delicate face a picture of contentment. You're both remarkably fine, Ziara whispers. She's a little bit premature, so she has some growing to do, but she's healthy. And for some reason, the nanovirus hasn't attacked your system. I have no idea what that last bit means, but it sounds like good news, so I'm happy. With Bub snuggled up against me, I'm very happy. You are fortunate that my mate is merciful and kind, because I am none of those things. Tarak's deep voice interrupts us. Understand that she has saved your lives today, even though you imprisoned her. Now get out of my sight before I lose patience and change my mind. Lorelai awkwardly moves across to the exit, catching my eye. Her scrubs are stained with drying blood. My blood. We exchange a look. She's obviously shaken. Her eyes are slightly wide, and her too-perfect hair and makeup have been messed up. 
I don't really understand what the hell these Syncorp people are trying to achieve through their experiments, and the look on Lorelai's face tells me she's not exactly 100% repentant. But to her credit, she did save my baby. I return her stare with a little shrug, as if to say, I told you so. I did warn her about what she was getting into. She's really lucky to be getting out of here alive. Being in daddy mode has just softened Tarak's anger. I shudder to think of what might have happened if his precious little girl hadn't arrived. He hovers back to my side, wary and watchful and protective, fussing with the blanket, brushing hair out of my eyes, stroking the white, downy hair of our baby, stroking me all over, murmuring soft Cordolian nothings to us. She is Ami, he tells me. In Ikun language, it means little loved one. That's a beautiful name, I reply, my fingers twining with his as we both stroke her head gently. It's not her name. It's just a term of endearment, similar to how I call you Amina. It's her name, I insist. It fits her. Ah, me, he says slowly, the name rolling off his tongue, his eyes widening in realization. Ah, me, I agree. It's funny how these things sometimes fall into place so naturally. That's when I look down at the floor and see water. Tarak, I say, trepidation creeping into my voice. Why is it flooding in here? The Cordolian swear words that pour out of him sound so vicious that I instinctively cover Ami's ears. Tarak. Geral, Nithian, I need a status report now. I open up the neurocom, speaking in Cordolian as a thin film of water covers the floor. Even though the water is an ominous sign that the facility is starting to flood, I can't help but stare at my mate and child. Once again, that strange, tight feeling closes around my heart. It's an oddly serene, pleasurable sensation. I can't take my eyes off them. Nitian gets back to me first. There's been a breach in the structure, and we've got serious water inflow. One of the Ifkin blew himself up against an external wall, and now there are cracks everywhere. Have you identified any escape vessels? We've found what looks like a few emergency escape pods, but that submersible we blew a hole in seems to be their main underwater vessel. Hmm. Any hostels left? Negative. There are unarmed patients in this facility, I say slowly, as Abby's fingers entwine with mine. We've come across a few of them, Nithian says grimly, his voice tinged with anger. They're easy enough to pick. Most of them are weak and fucking terrified. How many escape pods are there? Not enough for everyone. I curse under my breath. It would not be right to leave those abused, battered souls down here to perish in a watery grave. Since when have I developed such a fucking conscience? There would have been a time when I wouldn't have cared. I contact Dark Shadow. Lodan, has Infinity 2 arrived? ETA 2 sieves, he replies. You okay down there, boss? Prepare aqua kits and tell them to get ready for an underwater retrieval. They will see the human facility on the plateau once they're submerged. Two of you stay behind to give us air support and drop rescue lines. On it, sir. Nithian, Geral, round up the patients and take them to the escape area. I will decide who goes first once they are all assembled. Yes, sir. The water is above my ankles now. I give Ziara a sidelong glance. She's gathering up blankets and helping Abby to sit up. She looks at the blood infusion the humans have connected to Abby's veins. I'm just going to run the rest of this through, then add another bag. She's lost a lot of blood, and I don't want the nanites to go hungry. 
Abby is swaddling Ami. There are dark circles beneath her eyes, but her expression is serene and motherly. She is beautiful. My love, I say gently, moving to her side and placing my hand on her shoulder. We need to leave this place. You may not be aware, but we are beneath the ocean. The ocean, she says weakly, shaking her head. She looks at me, looks down at the rising waters and sighs. Why? No, never mind. Since I met you, nothing surprises me anymore. Let us finish giving you this blood. Then we're going to get out of here. I wait as Ziara lets the remaining red fluid run through, before hooking up another bag. The water is starting to rise. But first, I need to ensure Abby is strong enough to move. I look down at her feet. She has no footwear, and after what she's been through, I don't trust her to stand. She clutches Ami close to her chest, the babe blinking slowly as she snuggles against her mother. Throughout all of this chaos, our little one has been remarkably quiet. After the blood runs through, Ziara disconnects the lines from Abby's arms. My mate starts to stand, but I stop her. For once, female, allow me to carry you. This time she doesn't argue. I carefully scoop her into my arms as she cradles Ami. The two beings that are most precious to me in the entire universe are in my arms, alive and safe. I am indeed blessed by the goddess. Tarek, Abby says, as she nestles her head against my shoulder. There's someone in the room next to me. Her name's Noah, I think. Can you make sure she gets out? Jeral and Nithian are rescuing all the patients. She will be safe. Is this Noah known to you? No, I've never met her. Abby murmurs. But she helped me somehow, when I was waiting for you to come. Hmm. Unsure what she's babbling on about now, I make for the exit, water splashing around my feet. Do not worry, my love. We will get all of them out. Abby Despite my protests, Tarak absolutely insists that Ami and I are the first to leave. I look around wildly at the odd crowd gathered in the escape bay. There are aliens of all kinds amongst the humans. They're all wearing white gowns similar to mine, and several of them stare off into the distance with blank, dead eyes. It's as if they don't care whether they live or die. Some are looking at the Cordolians with naked fear on their faces, unable to believe that Tarak and his boys are actually going to get them out of here. The beautiful music is gone. I look up and see a woman with a shaved head and a healing surgical wound running the length of her temple. She's thin and waif-like, with dark circles under her large eyes, which are the color of mahogany. I shudder, wondering what these Syncorp people have done to her. That's one nasty scar on her head. As she turns to look at us, I see small audio buds nestling in her ears. She looks me up and down, her eyes drifting to little Ami, who's asleep in my arms. She smiles, and somehow I know she's the one who gave me the music, the one Lorelei referred to as a telepath. I smile back briefly, mouthing a, thank you, before Tarak begins to move. We must go now, he says softly. The water is up to his knees now. I'm still in his arms, and Ami is in mine. He's been staring at her in fascination ever since we left our room. As he carried me towards the escape area, I even caught him making baby noises at her. Wonders will never cease. Tarak walks over to the first escape pod, ducking his head as he steps inside. It's a long, tubular craft designed to seat eight. 
even though his place could be given to someone else, he has insisted on accompanying me, telling me he's not letting me out of his sight. We're joined by the most vulnerable patients, those who can't walk on their own, those who are too weak to move, and, to my horror, two children, green-eyed human twins. What the hell have they been doing in this horrible underwater facility? It's like something out of a freaking horror movie. The telepath lady is the last to join us, along with Ziara, before Tarek's soldiers slam the hatch closed, sealing us in with an airtight thud. Ami begins to stir, grunting and turning her head, putting her fingers into her mouth. Hungry, my girl? I ignore the jarring movement of the escape pod as it's ejected out into the cold, dark ocean waters. Nothing else matters right now but my baby getting fed. Tarak hovers protectively around as I pull down my gown and guide her to my nipple. Ami has a few tries before she finally gets it, latching on and sucking hungrily. My milk hasn't come in yet, it's just colostrum, but from what I've read... It's all she needs right now. While Tarek was up in space, I had plenty of time to read all about this stuff. I'm ready and I'm prepared. Our fellow passengers are staring at us curiously. They mustn't know what to make of us. The baby with the luminous skin and violet eyes, her human mother and her Cordolian father, riding an escape pod up to the surface. Beside me, Tarak bristles not liking the attention directed at us. But before he can do anything growly, I put a hand on his arm. They've been through enough, I say softly, smiling. I'm filled with a warm, fuzzy euphoria. Maybe it's just the rest of the neuronal wearing off, but I think it's more than that. It's the feeling of being safe with the two creatures I love most in the universe by my side. Chapter 19 Tarek Is that the last of them? I watch as a Soldar male is winched to safety from the floating escape pod below. Jeral is behind him, stabilizing him as the large drop cord pulls them up into dark shadow through the lower hatch. That's the last of them, boss. Two sieves later and they all would have drowned. Rykal stands at my side using a small towel to dry his hair. What in Cain's name have those crazy humans been doing down there? The humans have been acting like Cordolians, apparently, I say dryly, as Rykel steps forward to help haul Jeral and the Soldar inside. They're all on board now, the rest of my first division having joined us to help with the rescue effort. When the underwater escape pods had all been ejected, the remaining patients, the stronger ones, were given respirators and slowly brought to the surface by my soldiers. The underwater facility is completely flooded now, and we're left with a stealth cruiser full of injured and traumatized aliens and humans. Fucking humans. I am going to get to the bottom of this and track down the organization that is responsible for such suffering because nothing good has ever come from this sort of medical experimentation. Syncorp. I'll remember that name. Somehow, their human guards had been equipped with Cordolian plasma weapons, and they were working alongside the Ifkin. I suspect the Empire has somehow had a role to play in all this. The Soldar tries to stand but his scaly black legs give way under him. Ziara rushes to his side, wrapping a blanket around him and helping him to a nearby seat. What a very uncordolian scene. Things have definitely changed around here. I make my way to the upper deck, where Abby is curled in a chair, asleep, wrapped in a Veronian blanket with Ami in her arms. After everything that's happened to her, she is exhausted. My daughter is also asleep, and I take a moment to watch them, marveling at how Ami, 
is a miniature version of her mother. She has the same high cheeks and delicate nose, and slightly stubborn set to her mouth. They are glorious, and they are mine. Tenderness wells in my chest as I approach, careful not to wake them. I place myself on the floor in front of them, resting my cheek on Abby's thigh, curling my arms around her, surrounded by the soft scent of mother and baby. I close my eyes, listening to the peaceful, rhythmic sounds of their breathing. Mine. I do not care if my soldiers see me this way, sitting on the floor of my own stealth cruiser at the feet of my mate. I am unable to keep myself away from them, even as they sleep. I came so close to losing them. As if sensing my presence, Ami stirs, opening her shimmering eyes to give me a look that squeezes my heart. She extends one tiny hand, and I reach for it. She grabs my finger, her tiny fingers curling around mine. How can such a small, perfect creature have come from a monster like me? She is most delicate and precious. I murmur sweet, nonsense things, and for the entire trip back, she never once lets go of me, and I never let go of Abby. My soldiers steer well clear of us, knowing not to disturb me as we fly over the barren landmass called the Oceanic Republic, leaving the wild, frigid seas behind. We are returning to a distant place in the middle of nowhere, it is a place where the sun-drenched day and the cold, shrouded night can exist together, and neither would be possible without the other. It is the place where we are going to make our home. Abby I wake to the sound of a low, rumbling voice. My eyes flutter open, and as I stretch out, I realize I'm in a warm, comfortable bed. Everything is bathed in soft light. It's the gentle light of dawn, filtering through the opaque windows of my home. Our home. At first, I wonder if I'm in a dream, and I'm actually still stuck inside that horrible medical facility. Then, the memories flood back, and I realize I'm actually safe. He came for me. I knew he would come. I look across the bed and see Tarak lying on his back, bare-chested. Ami is on top of him, resting on her belly, asleep. His large hand rests protectively on her back, and he's whispering to her in Cordolian, his lips almost touching her head. He reaches up to stroke the soft, downy tufts of hair on her head. Slowly, he turns to look at me, his wine-dark eyes slightly unfocused, as the dawn light washes over him. He's glorious. His silver skin is burnished orange by the rising sun, and his expression is soft. It's the look he reserves only for us. Now there are two females for him to take care of. Morning, I say, my voice slightly hoarse. With his spare arm, he reaches across, and I snuggle into him, curling up alongside him. Hmm, he rumbles, in a contented manner. He's half-drowsy and relaxed, a state I never see him in. How's she doing? I ask, marveling at her perfect face and tiny hands. Her skin color is a blend of Tarax and mine, light silver mixed with human cream. There is no one else like her in the universe. She is content, Tarek says, a note of pride in his voice, and perfect. He twines his fingers in my hair, placing a kiss on my forehead. As are you. 
I close my eyes for a moment, basking in his nearness, enjoying his scent and his warmth. Part of me is still in disbelief that I'm here with my baby, alive and well. I open my eyes again and meet his red gaze, trying to figure out what deep, mysterious thoughts are hidden in those crimson depths. What did you do to me, Tarak? How is it that I don't even have a scratch on me? I gave you my blood, he murmurs. He strokes my hair, his touch gentle almost reverent. Your freaky, dangerous, nanite-infected blood? How is it that I'm not being eaten alive? I don't know, but you are fine now. That's all that matters. Thanks to you. It was my fault you were taken in the first place. I should have been more vigilant. I should have done more. I am sorry, Abby. I roll on my side hooking my leg over him, bringing one arm across his hard stomach. He's totally naked, his modesty preserved only by a thin scrap of bedsheet, as if he's a sculpture of some ancient Greek god. Ami rests peacefully on his chest, making soft little sleeping sounds. And what could you have done differently, General? Were you planning on bringing your entire army to Earth to protect us? You know that would have gone against the terms of the Cordolian Federation Alliance, and I don't think anyone could have predicted that there were humans crazy enough to attack us on Earth soil. Hmm. He gives me an enigmatic look, but doesn't say anything else. I know that no matter what I say— He'll dissect and analyze everything in his mind and beat himself up a little bit before making sure things are handled to his satisfaction. My Cordolian general is a bit of a control freak, after all. His roving hand slips under my nighty, caressing my butt and thigh. He clutches me possessively as Ami stirs, tiny grunts and sighs escaping her. Behave, general, I caution, Becoming aroused. There are three of us now. You can't have me to yourself anymore. Ami is well awake now, and she's becoming restless. As she turns her lavender gaze on me, I melt a little bit inside, all over again. I reach out to take her, and Tarek deposits her gently on my chest. I slip my nightie down past my shoulder, and she fumbles towards my breast, searching for my nipple. She's warm and cuddly and curious, her little hands pawing all over me. As she latches on with her tiny mouth, suckling hungrily, I become aware of Tarak staring at us with an odd look on his face. She's hungry, I say. She must feed and grow strong. Ziara tells me she is a few quants early, but she has survived the ordeal well. Apparently, she has what is referred to as the hybrid vigor. Again, he strokes her hair, whispering something that sounds like, Amananama. In the presence of his baby daughter, this fierce, dark general has become a big old softy, blurting out nonsensical baby sounds and treating us both with the greatest of care. You are safe now, he says, almost too quietly for me to hear. I will not allow you to go through such an ordeal ever again. The sun must have just broken over the horizon, because the room is suddenly awash with brilliant golden light. Tarak closes his eyes and brings us both into his powerful, warm embrace. I love you, you crazy human. I love you too, big bad Cordolian. Delicious warmth floods through me, spreading through every inch of my body as Tarak pulls me closer, his arms surrounding us. It's good to be home. Chapter 20 Tarak I leave Abby and Ami in bed giving mother and daughter time to bond, although I am reluctant to do so. But there are things I must attend to, 
and I do not wish to worry Abby with such unnecessary details. The lingering shock at having her snatched from my grasp is still with me, and every time I think about what happened, the anger I've buried deep within rises to the surface. I know the Cordolian Empire has somehow been involved in this, and now, more than ever, I desire to crush Beyond's crumbling realm. Most of the human guards and the so-called president of this Syncorp entity were killed as they tried to fend off our assault. But I have managed to retrieve the foolish human doctor and her assistant, along with two Ifkin, who are proving most difficult to interrogate. There is much for me to do yet. As I exit the glass-walled house, Raikal and Kalan stand to attention. I greet them with a sharp nod. I have stationed the First Division around our quarters, which has become the inner citadel of my growing base. I am taking no chances. Ziara will be by to check on her shortly, and Kenna is already downstairs preparing food. To her credit, the old woman admirably held her own against the Ifkin hordes, armed only with a primitive human weapon called a shotgun. Who would have thought metal bullets could be so effective? I walk across the garden, passing the old house, which has become a temporary infirmary for the experimental subjects we rescued from the facility. Ziara and the human doctor have been attending to them. I have had the Asher woman shadowed by one of my soldiers at every step. The silent presence of a fully armed Cordolian warrior does wonders for ensuring cooperation. I cross the dry, barren outskirts, entering one of the dark, calidum containers. There is no light inside, but of course, that is not a problem for me. Restrained against the black wall is the silent one, the wraith. Thick calidum bands wrap around his neck, ankles, and his remaining arm. His left arm is gone, the stump sealed with a crude hemostatic patch. Another hemostatic patch seals the wound I made in his chest. Left alone in this metal box, he would have had time to draw on his kakui to aid the healing of his body. As I enter, he strains against his bonds, the killing intent radiating from him in waves. It is dark and malevolent, and I am secretly impressed that he has lasted this long. He is a formidable warrior who would have killed me with ease if I weren't also a monster. He is perfect for what I intend. Now... If only I can sort out one minor issue. It is unfortunate that you are under this compulsion, I say quietly, moving close to him. His black eyes are sightless and blank, but I know he can see me with his kakui. He flails helplessly against the restraints, compelled by the overwhelming urge to kill me. I have use for one such as you. I take his chin into my hand, tilting his face upwards, trying to find any trace of life in his seamless black eyes. You see, assassin, I am going to find a way to break your mind bond. I will give you your freedom, and you will repay me with a life. He closes his eyes, falling still. His jaw clenches. Perhaps, with great effort, he is resisting the urge to kill me. So when you are able to speak, and once you have regained control of yourself, I will have a new arm made for you, and you will serve me. <coughs> A sound issues from deep within his throat. In that sound, I read frustration and anger. 
But most importantly, there is hope. Good. If this killer has enough fire in his belly, we will break the grip on his mind. It seems like an impossible task. But if there is one thing I have learnt since leaving Kithia, it is that nothing is impossible. The child resting at my mate's breast, my very own daughter, who is of my flesh and blood, tells me that much. Do not worry, silent one, I say quietly as I turn, leaving him hanging in the darkness. You will be freed. And then you will bring me the head of the Empress of Kithia. And once the Empress is dead, the Empire will surely fall. I would kill Vion myself, but I am not going back to Kithia in this lifetime, because there is no way that I am leaving Abby's side. Not even Cain, the god of the underworld himself, could drag me away from her now. Abby I traipse downstairs in my bathrobe and slippers, clutching Ami against my chest, and find Kenna and Ziara sitting in the kitchen. The medic is eating a bowl of eggs, and my aunt seems to be grilling her about something. The dogs rush to greet me, their tails wagging as I walk across the living room. Hi, Nixie, Zeus boy, I gush. They swirl around my feet excitedly as Kenna rises to greet me. Ziara smiles. Oh, this is the precious thing, my aunt coos, her usual gruff demeanor replaced with a look of pure adoration. Give her here. Let's dyke a look at her, the sweet little thing. I pass Ami into Kenna's willing hands as Ami regards my aunt with that wise, contemplative stare of hers. She's beautiful, Kenna beams. Yes, she is, I reply proudly. Kenna gestures towards a mouth-watering spread laid out on the kitchen bench. Thought you might be hungry, kiddo. There's scrambled eggs, real bacon, butter-fried mushrooms, hash browns, and oregano and garlic fried tomatoes. I think several orgasmic sounds just dropped from my lips. My mouth starts to water and my stomach growls. I think I've just died and gone to a second heaven. Right now, I'm absolutely starving. Of course, I found myself in the first heaven this morning, lying in bed with my sweet Cordolian general. How are you feeling, Abby? Ziara looks me over her orange eyes taking in every little detail. Fine, amazingly fine. Tarek told me what he did to me back there. I'm surprised my insides aren't being eaten away by those freaky nanites right now. Ciara nods. I have a theory about that. Remember when you got the nanograft the first time, back on the fleet station? Yeah, vaguely. I was unconscious for most of it, but Tarak explained it to me. Well, they used irradiated blood from Tarak because medical nanites were in short supply. That means you would have received killed or inactivated virus particles. Ah! A dim light goes on inside my biologist's brain. You think the first nanograft acted as some kind of vaccination? Exactly. It's possible you've built up antibodies to the virus. Ziara shrugs. We've been trying to come up with a vaccine to that particular virus for years, but it's never worked on Cordolians. But, then again, human physiology is different. Whatever the reason, it seems you're okay. Absolutely fine, I reply. So, does that mean these freaky little black things are going to stay in my bloodstream now? They seem to have become attuned to you, but don't worry. What Tarak gave you was a tiny fraction of what he has. If you've tolerated them so far, I don't think they'll harm you. You'll just heal faster if you ever get injured. Cool. Well, that's a bonus. 
although it doesn't explain everything. I incline my head, still curious. What happened to the Harmony Star? I noticed that it's not there anymore. What the hell was that thing, anyway? Oh, that. Ziara waves a hand, dismissively. It's a semi-sembient symbiote that sends data to a medical monitor. All Cordolian women get one during pregnancy. They usually dissolve soon after childbirth. Oh. Ziara's nonchalance is somehow amusing. I know scientists who would kill to get their hands on such a thing. As with most Cordolian technology, its functions are a bit beyond my understanding. But in the end, it saved our lives. By the way, Ziara, I just wanted to say thanks. Whatever for? You busted into a secret underwater experimentation facility to come and check on us. That's going above and beyond. She straightens a little, looking every inch the proud Cordolian. When I saw the Harmony Star turn purple and then red on my monitor, there was no way I was leaving you and Ami to those humans. I would not have been able to live with myself if something had happened to General Acadian's mate and daughter under my watch. He would never say so, but I owe him a great debt. You're a badass lady, Ziara. I'm Cordolian and the combat medic for the First Division, she says haughtily. I can hold my own. You certainly can, I agree. There's a reason Tarak places so much trust in her. I decide to pick her brains while I have a chance. You know, something strange happened when I was down there, locked up in that awful little room. I kept hearing music inside my head. Apparently, the woman in the room next to me was a telepath of some sort. I wonder if she was transmitting it. But how is that even possible? As usual, Ziara doesn't look at all surprised. It is possible. Perhaps telepathy is common to both humans and Cordolians, then. Cordolians have it, too? Before birth, and as infants, we all possess it to an extent. But as we age, something happens to the developing brain, and the ability becomes closed off. No one really understands why. Perhaps you were able to pick up the music because of your connection with Ami when she was inside you. Huh. If that's the case, then they both kept me sane during our ordeal. Ciara smiles. Some things are better left unquestioned. You are here, and you are remarkably well, and that is all that matters. She downs another mouthful of eggs. But I think I know the human you're referring to. There is one in the infirmary who needs the music. Otherwise, she fears she will go mad. I will go and do a proper examination on her when she has recovered. Tell her thanks when you see her. I make a mental note to pay a visit to infirmary later on as I return Ziara's smile. A little bit of euphoria coursing through me. I'm still on cloud nine. I glance at my aunt, who's playing with Ami, speaking to her in a very uncharacteristic baby voice. She gives me a small, curious look before quickly turning her attention to the baby. She's pretended to be oblivious to our entire conversation, but I know she's come to her own conclusions. Not much gets past old Kenna. As I start to heap a plate with food, the dogs start to whimper, and that's how I know Tarak is here. They sneak under the table, cowering as my maid appears in that soundless way of his. He surveys the scene before him a hint of a smile tugging at his lips as he sets eyes on me. As always, he looks a little bit sexy and mysterious, with his gaze hidden behind his dark lenses. You must feed, he says approvingly, to restore your strength and have enough energy to care for our child. You don't need to tell me that, I say between mouthfuls, as I nibble on delicious crispy bacon. I have no problem with this so-called feeding when there's bacon and hash browns. As he reaches my side, putting his arms around my waist, the dogs whimper again. 
But at least this time, they don't run away. Oh, he's not so bad, I tell them. Am I not? No, actually you are, and you know it, I tease. I'm about to goad him further. But instead, I freeze, as the most awful smell starts to fill the air. I put down my plate and share a knowing look with Kenna. It started, I say grimly. It started, she agrees. I warned you about this, Daddy. There's an evil note in my voice as I look up at him. But he isn't giving anything away. His face could be carved from stone. He looks at me silently for a moment. Then he snorts. Who do you think took care of business while you were asleep, female? He reaches out for Ami, and my aunt gently hands her over. Ami lets out a happy little coo as Tarak takes her. His face doesn't display even the slightest trace of disgust as the foul smell becomes worse. I am not one to be intimidated by such things. He whisks our daughter away, disappearing upstairs to do what has to be done and change her nappy. Once he's gone, the dogs come out, and Kenna gives me a sly look. I knew he was a keeper, she says. I most definitely agree. Chapter 21 Tarak The sun is high in the sky by the time the Federation team arrives. Their noisy, ungainly silver flyers circling a few times before coming into land, stirring up a great cloud of red dust as they touch down. I watch them impassively from the ground, surrounded by two full squadrons of armed Cordolian warriors. After what happened with Abby, I finally lost patience and ordered a properly sized deployment of Cordolian soldiers to Earth. The humans, to their credit, knew better than to attack our warships as they entered Earth's atmosphere. It would be sheer idiocy to shoot down a Cordolian cruiser protected by powerful artillery neutralizing devices, especially when that cruiser can unleash mega destructive fission missiles in retaliation. As a hot wind whips across the desert, stirring up dust, humans spill from the small flyers in an orderly fashion, moving into formation as their representative disembarks. I recognize him as the one called Aquinas, the father of Zalikian's mate. He has recently been elevated to the post of Galactic Affairs Minister, whatever that means. He is a tall, thin man with graying hair and weary blue eyes. As he approaches, I signal to my soldiers to hold back. They part, clearing a passage for me as I walk forward to meet him. Senator Aquinas, I say dryly, as we come face to face. General Acadian... Dark circles of fatigue underline his eyes, but his gaze is cold and clear. He looks around, no doubt taking in the large number of Cordolian soldiers that surround him. Along the perimeter, construction has started on basic military infrastructure. Watchtowers, missile stations, residential barracks, and so on. I assume Zalikian has briefed you on what has happened. Oh, yes. In fact, the Prince and Sarah are on their way, although they've elected to come through Toluria for some reason. He sounds somewhat displeased. It is unfortunate that it has come to this. Syncorp's actions are indeed regrettable. Regrettable? I take a step forward looking down at him, my anger rising again. Although he is tall for a human, I still have the height advantage. What your people did was unforgivable! Please understand, General Acadia, that the Federation has no control over the actions of a galactic conglomerate like Syncorp. In fact, we did some background checks and discovered that the board of Syncorp has recently been taken over by new majority shareholders. 
Although we weren't able to identify them, we were able to trace acquisition brokerage back to two places. The first was the Ifkin subplanet of Kelethor. The second was an unidentified source in Sector 1. From Kithia, I growl under my breath. It confirms what I had suspected, that the recent attack had been engineered by Cordolian. But instead of involving themselves directly, they had contracted humans and Ifkin to do their dirty work. A war on Earth would suit them very well, and the weapons-dealing Ifkin would stand to profit from chaos, as they always do. My voice becomes icy. That doesn't matter to me, Senator. Whether Syncorp is owned by humans or others, the fact remains that they stole what is mine and almost caused the unthinkable to happen. If something had happened to my mate, I can assure you we wouldn't be standing here chatting amicably right now. Aquinas sighs. I appreciate that this incident has left all of us shaken but I would hate for this to compromise the Alliance agreement we have worked so hard to put together. Already some of the Federation's member states are expressing their concerns. They can't see how we can accommodate such a large, non-human military presence on Earth. You already are. The Senator's eyes narrow. Without the proper authorization, this is technically an invasion, General. I would ask that you demonstrate your respect for Earth's sovereignty by withdrawing your troops. I glare at him. I don't care about your human technicalities, Aquinas. This is not an invasion. You humans are the ones who choose to see it this way. I am only protecting what is mine, and I will continue to do so without exception. That is final. I am tired of playing along with your human political games. If any of your humans continue to object, they can come and express their concerns to me in person. But I will not withdraw. Is that clear, Senator Aquinas? The human's face has become shiny with moisture. He removes his outer jacket, revealing a white shirt underneath that is stained with sweat. His right eye twitches slightly. This is exactly what Zalikian told me you would say. The prince knows me well. And there's nothing we could do to try and make you change your mind? You could try. I bear my fangs. The senator runs a hand through his hair. I'm supposed to be making a show of taking a hard line with you, Cordorians. It's a political thing. Frustration creeps into his voice. Fear of invasion is still fresh in the human psyche. I stare beyond the senator, my attention drawn by something on the horizon. Thick clouds of dust have risen, whipped up by the rising wind. The dust storm is heading our way. I laugh grimly. <laughs> Human, this planet has never known the threat of a true invasion. And I intend to keep it that way. That includes protecting your planet from any external threats. Do you understand? Aquinas nods slowly. I believe I do. He clenches his jaw tightly, his unhappiness with the situation reflected in his expression. But he knows there is nothing he can do. Good. Then you will leave us be, or face the consequences. The senator stiffens, but says nothing. I stare at the incoming storm. You had better leave before the storm hits, Aquinas. Otherwise, you will be detained for a long time, until the dust clears. The senator glances behind him, taking in the rising dust. 
He hesitates. At the very least, General Acadian, the Federation would appreciate some sort of notification the next time you decide to bring an entire fleet of Cordolian warships down to Earth at short notice. At least then we can make an official announcement before the media blows things out of proportion. I will consider it, I say tersely. And for the last time, we are not planning to invade Earth. At least not by force, anyway. If your people still can't get your head around that, go and ask my mate, because she's the one who asked me not to invade Earth in the first place. I gave her my word, and I intend to stand by it. But at the same time, I will protect her at all costs. I walk away, effectively dismissing the human. I am tired of these endless political games. I am beginning to suspect that humans enjoy engaging in politics just for the sake of politics. Perhaps it's a cultural thing. But now that the senator knows where I stand, there should be no more confusion. We are here to stay whether the humans like it or not. Chapter 22 Abby I fiddle with the delicate wreath of blush-colored peonies that's been woven into my hair, nervously making final adjustments. My hair is arranged in a simple updo, and I'm wearing a simple white strapless dress that falls just below my knees. The dress is vintage. It's delicate and finely made. It's pure silk, real silk, which is impossibly rare and expensive in this day and age. It feels divine. Aunt Kenna retrieved it for me from some hidden place in her house. It belonged to my mother, a woman I never met but heard so much about. My mother had caught a rare infection— passing away before I was born, but Dad had always spoken of her fondly. I was conceived after she died. They were able to engineer her stem cells into viable eggs and combine them with Dad's sperm to make life, growing me in an artificial womb. That's what she had wanted. That's why she'd allowed her cells to be harvested before she died. I am a classic test tube baby. I allow myself a moment of sadness, reminding myself that both Mom and Dad would be happy for me if they knew I was getting married today. Are you ready, Abby? Sarah pokes her head in the door, her eyes lighting up as she looks me over. You look amazing! Come on, let's go. Your general is waiting. We walk out of the house, across the orchard, and out onto the dusty plains, where a shimmering silver path has been laid, made from some Cordolian material I can't fathom. I set foot on it, and it sinks slightly beneath my feet, like carpet. It's cool out here, but I'm rather comfortable in my ivory silk dress. Ever since I've received Tarax nanites, I've become less sensitive to the cold. Beyond is a pavilion draped in diaphanous white fabric. Above us, the Milky Way is impossibly bright and clear in the night sky, a glittering backdrop more stunning than anything money can hire. And standing in the pavilion, looking imposing and dark and austere and utterly beautiful, is my Tarak. My breath catches a little as I walk along the silver path, passing smiling guests Familiar faces greet me from the crowd. Sira is there, beside Zal, along with Ziara, my friend Gia and her mate Kaelin, and the rest of Tarak's first division. I steal a look at my sweetheart, Ami, who is blissfully asleep in a bassinet, under the watchful eye of Aunt Kenna. Ami Luna, we called her in the end, naming her after the brilliant glow of the full moon. I smile at her, before my attention is quickly drawn back to Tarak. Once I lay eyes on him again, I can't look away. 
he wears a long black jacket with tails and a high collar, similar to his imperial military dress uniform. But this outfit is a little different, because it's trimmed with intricate silver embroidery around the collar and sleeves. Underneath is a black tailored suit, made from a fine, dark, shimmering material that seems to capture the starlight. Knee-high black boots and a jeweled ceremonial sword complete the outfit. He's absolutely breathtaking, and as he lays eyes on me, a genuine smile breaks across his face, revealing the twin points of his fangs. I walk slowly towards him, entranced. As I climb the steps to the pavilion, he extends his hands. I place my hands into his, an electric sensation coursing through me as my skin meets his. My hands are so tiny compared to his, but as always, he is incredibly gentle. You are stunning, he says softly. Absolutely stunning. So are you, General. Before I have time to react, he leans in and plants a soft kiss on my lips. Unable to help myself, I kiss him back. I laugh. You're supposed to save it until after we say our vows, idiot. But how can I resist when you are looking so beautiful? He's impossible, this male of mine. We turn towards our celebrant, a kindly-looking woman from Teluria, who seems to have no problem at all with officiating a wedding between a Cordolian general and his human mate. When the time comes to say our vows, the script goes out the window, because neither of us are ordinary, and this is no ordinary marriage. Abby, Tarek says, offering me a graceful bow in the Cordolian fashion, before he kneels down in front of me. You are my mate, and our bond has been sealed with the sacred exchange of our blood. We are already mated under Cordolian law, and now we consummate our bond in the human tradition. Let it be known that I will use all of my power to protect you, to bring you happiness, and to give you anything in this universe that you desire. You are mine, Abigail Kendricks, but above all, I, General Tarak al-Alkadian, son of the Ikun tribe of Kithia, am your humble servant, who will love and cherish you until the very last breath leaves my body. I look down into his deep red eyes and see warmth and love mixed with burning desire. The sincerity in his words floors me, even though I've known his true feelings for a while now. Tarak. I gently pull him to his feet, a warm, tight, delicious feeling welling in my chest. I, Abby Kendricks of Earth, take you as my mate, husband, protector, friend, and lover. You are all of those things to me, and much, much more, and I will do everything in my power to be the same for you, and make you as happy as you make me. I am yours, Tarak al Alcadian, from now until infinity. There is no need for long, fancy speeches. We speak our hearts. The celebrant smiles. You may now kiss the... But Tarak, true to form, is ignoring human tradition and sweeping me off my feet, indulging in a long, searing kiss, before he strides down the steps of the pavilion with me in his arms. He whisks me past the cheering guests, taking a moment to pick up Ami and kiss her on the forehead, before we leave her in Kenna's watchful care. Then, we're heading for our glass-walled enclave, moving swiftly and silently through the night, as Tarak eyes me hungrily. I could not wait any longer, he growls. He takes me upstairs, about to give me the perfect ending. I wouldn't want it any other way. Abby He places me gently on my feet, taking a moment to step back and admire me. Someone has worked their magic in this room, 
setting up old-fashioned scented wax candles that give off a soft, flickering light. The bed is sprinkled with something glittery and fragrant. The stuff shimmers in the golden candlelight like millions of tiny stars. Tarak's burning crimson gaze roams across my face before traveling downwards to take in my body. It's been a few weeks since we've welcomed Ami into our lives. My body has slowly started to change. My stomach is beginning to flatten out, although my breasts are still large and ripe. It has been a while since I've had you all to myself. His voice is hoarse with desire. No way in Cain's hells was I going to miss this opportunity. Look at you, so perfect. So tempting. Speak for yourself, you big silver menace, I say, eyeing him in equal measure. Tarak walks over to my side, inhaling deeply, his fingers brushing against the flowers in my hair. He starts to undo my hair, pulling out the tiny pins and letting the flowers drop to the floor as my hair cascades down around my shoulders. He trails soft kisses down my face, down my neck, resting his lips in the hollow of my neck as he begins to unfasten my dress. I'm already aroused as hell. My nipples are taut, and heat spreads through my pussy, making my lace panties wet. He deftly unclasps the hidden hooks at the back of my dress, and the whole thing drops to the floor, leaving me standing before him in only my panties and a light strapless bra. My undergarments are made from fine white lace, and he growls in appreciation as he looks me up and down. His hands are all over me, stroking my skin, caressing my curves, trailing warmth over every inch of me. He tears my bra away, and my breasts spring free. They are heavy and sensitive, and a little sore, but his touch is feather light as he strokes my nipples, making them stand erect. He drops to his knees, still fully clothed, his hands sliding over my ass. He hooks his thumbs under my panties and whips them down in a single motion. They drop to my feet, and he presses his lips against the entrance of my sex, inhaling deeply. His long tongue darts out, tasting me, making me shudder with delight. I thread my fingers through his hair, which he has started to let grow. It's soft and sleek, and it shimmers in the soft candlelight. My fingers go to the bases of his horns, which he has also started to let grow. The twin points protrude just slightly through his skin, appearing as two dark points. A low rumble issues from his throat as I touch them. His tongue slips inside me, between the lips of my pussy. I whimper with pleasure as it glides over my sensitive flesh, stroking the inner walls of my sex. Withdrawing slightly, he finds my tender, throbbing clit and sucks on it. I start to tremble, my legs going weak like jelly. He pleasures me gently, slowly, taking his time to elicit various moans and whimpers and gasps from me as he draws out my enjoyment. My body is fine-tuned to respond to his touch, and the wonderful tightness that is built in my pussy and my core is increasing bit by bit as he sucks me slowly. The sensation builds as he repeatedly flicks that tender little nub of mine with his tongue. A series of high-pitched cries escapes my lips as he continues. That delicious tightness is building, becoming more and more intense, until I can stand it no longer and my body craves release. He holds me there for a moment, suspending me on the edge of bliss, before one final caress with his tongue sends me spiraling into a wild orgasm. I close my eyes and scream my release as he holds me tightly. He rises to his feet, 
and picks me up. As the aftershocks of the climax ripple through me, I am a boneless, legless, quivering mess as he gently lays me on the bed. The glittery stuff sprinkled across the bed floats upward as I land on the covers, dissipating into the air in tiny, fragrant puffs as he steps back to admire his handiwork. The look he gives me is 100% Tarak. He stares at me with dark red eyes that say, You are mine. He's arrogant and possessive and totally Cordolian, but at the same time, there is a tenderness in his gaze. I'm helpless before him. He starts to undress, casting aside the ceremonial sword which clatters to the floor. He quickly sheds his outer jacket and discards his suit and boots, leaving him standing naked before me. I've seen him naked many times, but the sight of him never fails to make my breath catch. He's larger than life, a tall, lethal male with the body of a prime warrior. How can such a powerful body be capable of such gentleness when it comes to me? I make a show of checking him out, studying his broad shoulders and rippling chest and torso, which taper down to a narrow waist and powerful legs. I admire the sheer length of him, his cock massive and ridged, slick with wetness at its tip. He looks at me with hunger in his eyes, obviously pleased by my show of admiration. Then he's all over me, moving in to claim me as he parts my thighs and finds my wet entrance, his hard length sliding into me, spreading me, stretching me, huge and unstoppable. His lips are all over me, planting kisses on my mouth, my jaw, my neck. He slams his hips against me, fucking me hard and deep, driven by frantic desire. He groans with pleasure, setting a fierce, driving rhythm as I curl my arms around his neck, completely overwhelmed by this hard, dominant male of mine. The sounds issuing from his throat are deep and primal, and he pumps his hips faster, harder. The ridges of his cock brushing against my tender clit, making me clench as the feeling grows more and more pleasurable. His lips are beside my ear now, and he whispers my name as he fucks me, his large hands cupping my ass, drawing our bodies closer together as he plunges into me again and again. Time disappears, replaced by the rhythm and beauty of our lovemaking, and I'm suspended in a moment I never want to end. This is heaven. He's filling me, surrounding me, dragging me back to the precipice of a climax. His hands move to my breasts, He's cupping them tightly, almost roughly, but his thumbs are gentle as they find my enlarged, sensitive nipples. He fondles them, and it's an amazingly erotic sensation, driving me closer to orgasm. He slams into me, his love-making raw and savage. He stares down at me, his expression one of deep, burning hunger. It's too much. The sensation of being completely owned by this male is just too much. His unmistakable scent surrounds me, complex and masculine and irresistible. His heat radiates through me. His touch, the feel of his hard body pressed against mine, the force of his insistent thrusts, it's all too much. My body begs for release, and it comes, in the form of an earth-shattering orgasm. I scream my release. He cries out as he comes, his warm seed spilling forth. 
I'm covered in sweat, squirming and writhing in pleasure underneath him as he thrusts into me, milking every last drop of his pleasure from my body. He holds me tight, and it's as if his crimson eyes can see into my very soul as he leans in and brings his face so close to mine that our lips are almost touching. You are mine, he whispers gently, fiercely. Abby al Alcadian, my Amina, you are mine. Do you understand? I do, I say, falling into the depths of his gaze, returning it with a tender look of my own. And you, my big bad, are all mine. Chapter 23 Abby We stand on the roof in the crisp dawn, Tarek and I and baby Ami, who is wrapped snugly and asleep in my arms. There's a little deck up here, which can be accessed from a drop-down set of stairs on the upper floor. Ami stirs and makes a cute little grunting sound before promptly falling back into a deep sleep. She's such a good, peaceful baby. Kenna came to return her to us in the middle of the night, after Tarek and I made love again and again. It had been our first alone time in weeks, and we'd made the most of every precious minute. Tarek looks out across the desert, the sunrise glinting off his dark glasses. We are going to terraform it, he declares looking very much like an emperor surveying his kingdom. There is water below, and areas of thick rock that can be hollowed out to make dwellings for my people. I stare out across the dry, barren plains. In the dim light of the early morning, the scenery below is still indistinct, but I know the Cordolians have started to construct fortifications and other structures in that dark, organic style of theirs. After that little incident with Syncorp, Tarak has been pulling out all the stops, bringing a large number of his soldiers to Earth, despite protests from the various member states of the Federation Senate. Last week, the first Cordolian refugees from the old empire appeared, exhausted and slightly starving after such a long space trip. There were three families in total, and Tarek explained that these were ordinary Cordolians, who had suffered under the oppression of the corrupt, exploitative nobles for generations. We're expecting more of them. He's given them temporary housing, but they're struggling to adapt to Earth, with its harsh sunlight and soaring daytime temperatures. Still, from what I've been told— They'd rather be here than on Kithia any day of the week. So, the three hundred odd square kilometers of land that has been in my family for generations has been turned into a Cordolian military settlement of sorts. No matter what the Federation says, this is our land, and we can use it any way we want, even if it means Cordolians are going to live here. There have to be over a thousand soldiers out here now. They have constructed their living quarters out there in the desert, the dark structures rising incredibly fast from almost nothing. It's just another example of their insane and mysterious Cordolian technology. Tarak, who is standing behind me, places his hands on my shoulders. I am stepping back, he informs me, his tone oddly reserved. Stepping back? What do you mean? I have decided to relinquish my role as the supreme commander of the Cordolian military forces, although I will still act in an advisory role and hold absolute authority. My attachment to you compromises my ability to make decisions. Compromises? He gives me a funny look, raising one ironic eyebrow. I have a tendency to act rashly when you are involved. So, from now on, for the good of my people, I will take a step back. My five commanders will share the balance of power and divide the work between them, while Zalikian will continue to act as the figurehead for our people. 
the humans seemed to respond well to him. So you're going into semi-retirement? A little bit of happiness creeps into my voice. It will be good to have him around, and not having to fly off into space to deal with every little incident. I am merely making time for my other considerable responsibilities. He traces his fingers over Ami's hair. And what about Syncorp, and the Ifkin, and the Empire, and all of those scary, threatening things? Do not worry about any of that, he replies, his voice turning a little dark. I have plans to deal with them. Why am I not surprised? I could spend hundreds of sleepless nights worrying about the potential baddies out there in the universe who are thinking up evil plans as we speak. But, with Tarek by my side, the threat seems distant. I need to focus on what is right in front of me, my precious daughter and my mate. So, does this mean you'll finally start growing your horns? I ask cheekily as he buries his nose in my hair. So far, he hasn't filed off the twin obsidian points that have started to emerge from his temples. Perhaps, he murmurs. I still don't see what evolutionary purpose they serve. But you have discovered that already, my love. They exist purely to attract the female and give pleasure to the male. Oh, then you must grow them back at once, General. He brings his arms around my waist, pulling me into him as I stare out across the desert. The sky is glowing a fiery orange now, as dawn gives way to the pure, cloudless skies of the day. All around us, a Cordolian civilization is growing, defiantly putting roots in this red earth, despite protests from humans and threats from dark, distant empires. I haven't told Tarak this, but when I suggested this place, the idea was in the back of my mind all along. Otherwise, what else is this great, barren expanse of land going to be good for? Humans certainly don't want it. Cordolians, on the other hand, will use their advanced technologies to mold it, shape it, and bend it to their will. The Kendricks family property is about to become the Earth-based stronghold of the new Cordolian state. And presiding over it all is this stubborn, imperious male, the father of my child, and the one that I love. I wouldn't have it any other way. As I stand in the cold, clear dawn, with my baby sleeping in my arms, surrounded by Tarak's warm embrace, a calmness settles over me. A faint breeze whips around us, bringing with it the scent of the desert, carrying faint hints of dust and sand and the ancient earth. And right now, there's no other place in the universe I'd rather be than here, in the arms of my fierce Cordolian general. I am home. This concludes Into the Light by Anna Carvin. Narrated by Todd McLaren and Jillian Macy. Copyright 2017 by Anna Carvin. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Anna Carvin and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.